So, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. This is story about what if Naruto gets rare summoning contract. Part 2. I hope you watched part 1. If you guys enjoy this, what if? And want next part? Let me know before starting the video, comment down below. Please support for more awesome what if content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. And also share this video with your friends. And check out the description. And check out my playlist. So without wasting time. Let's start the video. Chapter 5. The Seer Rank Mission or not, I swear to the creator above, if I have to catch that fucking cat one more goddamn time, I'm going to skin it and turn its pelt into a fucking handbag. An enraged and exasperated shout from one Naruto Uzumaki pierced through the late afternoon air. Calm down Naruto, Kakashi Haddock told his blonde student, not looking up from his beloved orange novel. Don't tell me to calm down. Naruto told his sensei, this is the fifth time we've had to chase down this furry motherfucker, and I've had it. No more. He vowed. We're covered in the same scratch as you are, Dobe Sasuke Chiha pointed out, you're not exactly alone in this. Yeah, Naruto Sakura Haruno told her blonde teammate, the mission's over, you can relax now. I'll relax when that little bastard is dead, Naruto told her, pointing to the cage she was carrying, the cat desperately trying to claw its way out, or, at least, when we don't have to do this mission anymore. Three weeks have passed since Team 7 had passed their test and officially became a team. Needless to say, the life of a ninja had been less exciting than what Sasuke and Sakura had hoped for Naruto had known it would be this way, so he wasn't surprised, but not exactly thrilled. For the past 21 days, Team 7 had spent their time completing D-ranked missions, painting fences, weeding gardens, walking dogs, and, more commonly, capturing and returning the runaway pet cat of the fire daimyo's wife, a task the three teens hated more than any other. The time since the bell test hadn't been all bad, however. Naruto had gotten closer to many of his peers during that time, Ino Yamanaka being one of the most notable. The two blondes had become friends these past few weeks, with Ino being less nervous and acting more like her usual self. She had even started flirting with him, and he, to her surprise and joy, had flirted right back. He had also gotten to know her teammates, playing shogi with Shikamaru the Nara being the only person, other than Kurama, to regularly beat him at the game and having Raymond eating contests with Joji. He had also grown closer to Kiba and his canine companion, Akimaru. He smiled inwardly when he remembered introducing the two of them, along with Hinata, to Beatrice. Flashback. Uzumaki clan manor, two weeks ago. Man, your house is awesome. Kiba pointed out, it's so much bigger than mine. Naruto chuckled, glad you like it he said, then became sad, it's a little empty, though. Hinata placed her hand on Naruto's arm in a reassuring way, it won't stay that way forever she told him. Maybe I can help with it she thought, before blushing, realizing what she had just thought. Naruto looked at his closest friend and smiled, thanks, Hinata-chan. She blushed and smiled back. The two had done much to make up for the time they lost together and had grown much closer. Hinata's love for him was increasing something she didn't think was possible, and Naruto was beginning to develop similar feelings for her. He was certain she wouldn't return those feelings, despite the overwhelming amount of evidence to the contrary. Ahem. The two blushed and saw Kiba looking at them, smirking. Do you guys want to be alone? He asked, cheekily. The two blushed. Let's go see Beatrice, Naruto mumbled, as he led his friends into the backyard. Kiba snickered, but stopped when Hinata sent him a glare. The four entered the vast forest, walked for a few more minutes, and then stopped after entering a large open clearing. This is big enough, he noted, before turning to face his friends, before I call her, I'd like to go over a couple of ground rules. The three were confused, but listened carefully. Firstly the blonde vegan, don't scream when you see her and don't run away, she doesn't like screaming or yelling, and, if you run, you'll hurt her feelings. Second, she will smell you to identify you. When she starts to smell you, keep absolutely still and let her. If she shows she likes you, you can go ahead and pet her. But if, for any reason, she starts growling, don't make eye contact, keep your head down, and back away slowly. I'll make sure she doesn't hurt you. This worried them greatly. What the hell were they about to meet? Finally, Naruto continued, be nice to her. Don't freak out, don't insult her, and compliment her when she does something good. Kiba raised an eyebrow, is she that smart? He asked. Naruto nodded, yes, and I'll be very unhappy if you hurt her feelings he vaguely threatened. She's very important to you Hinata realized, somewhat touched by his devotion to his pet. It was very similar to the way he treated his friends. She is he told her, and I hope you like her, too he then stepped forward, are you guys ready? The two humans and one dog nodded. Naruto then turned back to the forest and let out a loud whistle Beatrice, he called out, loudly, here girl. For a few seconds, things were silent. Then the ground began to shake, the sound of large feet stomping their way towards them. Here she comes, he told his friends, come on girl. Come to daddy. Come on. The stomping became louder, faster, and was getting closer, Naruto still calling and cooing. 
Finally, with a loud roar, something massive burst through the trees and stopped right in front of Naruto. Inada, Kiba, and Akamaru had no idea what the hell they were looking at, but it was huge. Standing on two powerful legs at over 20 feet tall was an enormous monstrosity. It was covered in thick leathery skin with fur emerging from its back. It had a long snout with rows of razor-sharp teeth that looked as though they could pierce the skin of anyone who even looked at them. It had beady red eyes, bony protrusions emerging from its arms in places, and had four strong fingers on each hand. In short, this creature was terrifying. The beast lowered itself onto all fours and placed its snout within inches of Naruto's face. The blonde wasn't worried in the slightest. Then, unbelievably, inexplicably. The creature stuck its tongue out before lolling it to the side, making it look like a goofy smile, while panting. Good girl Beatrice. Naruto said, grinning, and began scratching the side of her neck, good girl. Beatrice let out a strange sound, like a roar and a bark mixed together, backed up and began leaping from side to side, shaking the earth, never taking her eyes off of her beloved master, and continuing to let out a strange bark, imagine what the dog from Dragon Age Origins does sometimes when you talk to him. Naruto's friends were amazed, this massive demonic creature was acting like a giant dog around their friend, while they had come so close to breaking one of the rules he had set up by screaming and running away. Do you want to meet my friends, girl? He asked, still with an enthusiastic tone, do you? Beatrice let out a confirmatory bark roar. Naruto turned towards his bewildered friends and started with Hinata. This is Hinata Hayuga he told her, you remember me telling you about her, girl. Beatrice moved forward, still on all fours, and began sniffing the dark-haired beauty. Said beauty stayed completely still. She was terrified, but was also intent on not showing it. After several ten seconds, Beatrice moved her head back. And used her tongue to give Hinata a long, wet lick. Hiya. She cried out, surprised. She looked herself over, she was soaking wet from Beatrice's saliva. She was silent. And then she started laughing and began to pet the massive creature. She's so adorable. Hinata squealed, giving her loving scratches. Beatrice let out a happy bark and began nuzzling the lavender-eyed girl, almost knocking her over. After a few more minutes of this, Beatrice moved towards Kiba. This is Kiba and Yazuka Naruto introduced them. It took a little longer, but Beatrice soon gave Kiba the exact same treatment she gave Hinata. The girl Kiba told her, good. Whatever you are. Beatrice let out another happy bark. And this is Kiba's partner, Akamaru Naruto told his pet, introducing her to his friend's canine companion. The two animals began sniffing each other. Before Akamaru surprised Beatrice by licking her nose. Beatrice jumped back in surprise, and the group froze, worried that Akamaru had done something wrong. They sighed in relief when Beatrice let out yet another happy bark roar and licked Akamaru back. The two then began barking at each other. Are they communicating? Hinata asked, amazed. I think so, Kiba said, equally amazed. After a few minutes of talking, Akamaru turned to his partner and barked something at him. Kiba laughed, Akamaru likes her. He told them, he wants to know if they can play. Naruto smiled, sure he then turned to Beatrice, but be careful, he's a lot smaller than you. Beatrice barked, telling him that she understood, before the two pets began to chase each other through the woods. They're so cute together. Hinata said, watching them play. Beatrice was being surprisingly careful, considering her size, as the two began to play what looked like tag. They are, Naruto agreed, it always makes me smile to see her happy. What is she, if you don't mind me asking? Kiba asked, extremely curious to find out what his partner's new friend was. Naruto sighed and turned to face them. I shouldn't tell you. He said, but I will. If you promise to never tell anyone what I'm about to tell you, okay. The two nodded. She's an Asterian beast he told them, a species used as a war mount and beast of burden in hell by demons. This caused their eyes to widen. Hell is real Hinata asked, shocked, demons too. Naruto nodded. Holy shit Kiba said, are you serious? Naruto nodded again. Am. The blonde was somewhat surprised by their acceptance of what he was saying, which went a long way to show how much they trusted him. He was touched. How did you end up with her? Hinata asked, after a few moments of silence. Naruto looked sad, I found her when she was a pup he told them, she was the runt of her litter and had been abandoned by her mother. Hinata and Kiba were horrified, Kiba especially. Because family was so important to the Inuzuka, they looked down on anyone or anything that hurt or abandoned family, even animals. As an example, Kiba's father had run out on them when he was a child and his mother had been devastated by that. When the deadbeat had been dumb enough to return to the village years later, he assumed the laws of the village would keep him safe. He was proven wrong when Tsum brutally murdered him. Because Kiba's father had committed an offense against the Inuzuka clan by violating one of their most revered laws, the execution was considered a clan matter and Tsum was not punished for it. That's horrible. Hinata gasped. 
Naruto nodded, she was alone and terrified he continued, I found her hiding in a cave under a cliffside, near the shores of the river Acheron at their confused looks, he elaborated, it's a river in hell, where the damned first arrive. You've been to hell Kiba asked, shocked. Naruto nodded. Death occasionally had to do business in the inferno and brought at least two or three reapers with him when he did. Not for protection as he could atomize anything with a single thought, but to intimidate the hordes of hell, as well as taunt them. Naruto had been with him on some of these trips and had found Beatrice on one of them. What's it like? More horrifying than anything any book or poem could ever even hope to describe. The two shivered. Naruto continued. She was so small. She came up to about here he used his hand to show how big she was, up to his hip, when I first met her. Anada and Kiba were surprised by how small Beatrice had been. He took a deep breath and continued, she was scared. I had to use my lunch to get her to come out he told them. He then smiled, it took me a few hours, but I was able to get her to follow me. We've been together ever since. You really care about her, Hinata noted. She's family he replied, simply. The group continued to watch the dog and Asterian Beast continued to play. Naruto got an idea, watch this he told them hey Beatrice, he called after turning to face her. She stopped playing and looked to her master. Flames? He ordered. Beatrice took a deep breath and looked up. Before exhaling a massive stream of fire into the air. The girl. Naruto complimented, happy that she knew to look up and shoot fire into the air so as not to set the forest aflame with hellfire. Hiba and Hinata were awed by this, as was Akamaru. Awesome, Kiba whispered. Naruto grinned as he watched her return to playing, she is, isn't she? The three continued to watch as the two animals began playing again. Flashback end. Since then, Beatrice and Akamaru had been almost inseparable, despite the size difference, with Kiba bringing Akamaru over often so that they could play. Once, they stayed late and fell asleep, snuggling up together. Hinata had said awe when she saw that. Speaking of odd friendships, while his relationship with Sasuke had stayed the same, Naruto had become closer to Sakura, following a conversation after they were dismissed by Kakashi after training, a few days after passing their team test. Flashback. Third training ground, three days after the bell test. Naruto, can I talk to you for a moment? Sakura had approached her blonde teammate after Kakashi and Sasuke had left. Naruto was surprised by this. Sakura usually followed after Sasuke immediately when Kakashi dismissed them, pestering him for dates. She also seemed quite nervous. Sure, Naruto replied. It took a deep breath before she spoke, I've been thinking about you, lately she then blushed when she realized how her words might be perceived, not like that. She said, quickly, I mean, I've been thinking about how I treated you before you disappeared she told him. Naruto was listening intently, though he was amused by her brief stumbling over her words. I was a real bitch Sakura admitted, you had a crush on me and. And I punished you for it, for no reason. I had no right hitting you and calling you names, and I'm really sorry. Naruto was surprised by this. So she continued, I just wanted to tell you how sorry I am, and I I wanted to make amends. I was hoping, maybe, we could start over. She asked, maybe even be friends. What do you say? She held out her hand to him. The blonde stared at the offered hand for a moment before looking up at its owner. No, he told her. Sakura was deeply hurt by this and dropped her hand. Though she said, in a depressed tone, I I understand she said and began to walk away. At least, not yet. Sakura spun around when she heard these words. Naruto continued, you hurt me, Sakura, he told her, I gave you my heart and you stomped on it. She flinched. But I realize it took great courage for you to admit that you were mean to me. That you were wrong Naruto told her, so I'm going to give you a chance. What? Sakura asked, confused but hopeful. I'm going to give you a chance to prove that you are not who you once were, that you've truly changed, he explained. How? By becoming stronger the blonde told her, by becoming something more than just another fangirl. By becoming the strong, intelligent, and brave Kanoichi I know you can be. Sakura was surprised by this, you. You think I can become like that? She asked, quietly, blushing from the praise. Naruto nodded, I do, he told her honestly. But. But why? She asked, what makes you think I'm different from the other girls? You and Eno both have something they don't, he explained, potential. Then how come you aren't making Eno Pig prove herself? They asked. She never hit me, Naruto answered simply. Sakura flinched again. But I have faith in you Naruto assured her, and I think you're up for the challenge. Sakura perked up, really. Yes Naruto told her, train and become stronger, prove to me you are more than just another pretty face. And I'd be proud to call you my friend. Sakura blushed at being called pretty, before standing up straight, I will. I won't let you down, Naruto. She vowed before turning and leaving, a sense of purpose in her steps. Yes. Inner Sakura shouted, soon we'll be friends she then grinned lecherously, then we can work on graduating to friends with benefits. Don't ruin this for me Sakura told herself. Meanwhile, Naruto smiled as he watched her leave. I know you won't, he said. He then turned and left. 
Flash back end. Since then, Sakura had been working herself to the bone to become stronger, to prove Naruto's faith in her and become an asset to her team, rather than a liability. Her personality had changed, she was no longer a fangirl at heart. She took her training seriously and stopped asking Sasuke out all the time. While she still held on to her feelings for the Ichiha, she was more tame about it now. She had also taken Naruto's advice from near the end of the bell test to learn to compliment and aid her teammates. To aid in this, she decided to focus on learning to aid her team in combat and medical jutsu to help heal their wounds. She was progressing extremely well in both fields. Returning to the present, Team 7 had entered the building where the Hokage and those he chose to help him would give out missions. Inside, the Hokage, Iruka, and others were handing out missions while the Fire Daimyo's wife was waiting nearby. The Sandane noticed them enter, ah, Team 7, welcome back he greeted, I trust you were successful in your mission. He asked. Akashi nodded, one runaway cat, found and captured, he told his leader. Sakura walked up to the fire lady and presented her with the cage. Here's Tora, my lady, Sakura told her, bowing with respect. The large woman quickly opened the cage and grabbed the feline before it could escape. Oh, Tora. She cooed, mommy was so worried. Don't you ever run away like that again. As she said this, she was smothering her pet, who was desperately trying to breathe and escape, simultaneously. As we know why he tries to escape so often, Naruto whispered to Sakura. They struggled not to giggle. The woman then looked up at Team 7 and bowed. Thank you so much for this she thanked them, Tora means so much to me. The Kashi waved her off, think nothing of it, my lady, he told the noblewoman, just doing our job. Oh, you're far too modest the woman said, now, I simply must return home she told them, thank you once again. And, with that, she left. Okay, old man Naruto began, turning to face the Hokage, I'm normally a patient man, but if that cat ever gets out again, don't send me after it he said, or I will kill it. Hiruzen was surprised, but nodded, I understand. I'll send another team next time he promised. Tora. Come back. Sandame sighed, which will be right now. He muttered. My team is ready for another mission, Hokage-sama, Kakashi told his leader. Hiruzen nodded, very well. Iruka, what other missions do we have available? He asked. Iruka began looking through the missions on his desk, let's see. He said, looking at each paper, the Inuzuka dogs need to be walked, the Takahashi family need their garden weeded, and, no. The shout from Sasuke interrupted Iruka and turned everyone's attention towards him. Excuse me. I'm not doing any more deer rank Sasuke told him, I'm sick of them. They're beneath me, I want a higher ranked mission. I've spent weeks doing these missions without complaining, I deserve a higher ranking mission. Naruto raised an eyebrow, without complaining. He thought, he complained about it on day one. Sasuke Chiha, you do not get to make demands of your superiors. Iruka told him, especially not to the Hokage. Ignoring Sasuke's childish tantrum, he does have a point Naruto intervened, ignoring the Ichiha's glare, I realize all ninja must start out with D-ranks as a hazing process, but I believe we are ready for a simple C-ranked mission. He's right, Hokage-sama, Sakura said, we've worked hard these last few weeks. It couldn't hurt to give us something more challenging. She implored. On the contrary, it could hurt a lot Aruka told her, the fact is, you three aren't ready for a C-rank, and I'm sure the Hokage agrees with me, right Hokage-sama? The Sandame Hokage thought for a moment before turning his gaze to Kakashi. Do you believe your team is ready for a C-rank mission, Kakashi? He asked. Hokage-sama? Aruka asked, hoping he wasn't thinking of doing what he thought he was doing. Kakashi looked at his team, their hope-filled eyes seemed to be piercing his soul. He looked to his leader and nodded, I do. Very well, here is in conceited. Okajama, you can't be serious. Iruka protested, they aren't ready for this. The decision isn't yours to make, Iruka the old Hokage told him, if Kakashi thinks they are ready, then I will trust his judgment. Now, do we have any available C-ranks? He asked. Iruka looked as though he wanted to argue, but thought better of it. He sighed and looked through the missions, well, we do have one available he said, an escort mission to wave country. Ah, yes Hiruzen said, remembering, the client for that mission has been getting anxious, waiting for a team to be assigned to the mission he pondered this for a moment, before nodding, yes, that will suffice, he then looked to one of the shinobi guarding a nearby door, please retrieve Tazuna and tell him we are ready. The shinobi bowed and walked through the door, going to retrieve the client. Who are we escorting? Sakura asked, eager to start the mission. At that moment, the door opened and a civilian man walked through. He was old, with gray hair, wrinkled features, and a large beard that was also gray. He wore glasses that covered his dark eyes. He wore a sleeveless v-neck shirt with an obi, pants, and a pair of sandals. He also carried a towel around his neck, wore a pointed hat on his head, and had a hip flask on his left side. About damn time you finally got me someone he grumbled, taking a swig from his flask. He then saw Team 7. This my escort? He asked. The Hokage nodded, it is, Tazuna-san. Tazuna looked them over. 
and then scoffed, so I pay good money for this, and I get a pink-haired princess, a silver cyclops, a broody punk, and a... He stopped when he saw the massive scythe on the blonde's back. Him? He finished, not wanting to provoke someone with a weapon like that. Sasuke and Sakura looked enraged and ready to attack when Kakashi stopped them. You get what you pay for he told the old man, giving him an eye smile. The Hokage decided to intervene, Team 7, this is Tazuna, an architect from Wave Country he informed them, he came to our village to conduct business and now wishes to return home. Your mission is simple. Escort Tazuna to his home in Wave Country, guard him while he finishes his latest project and then return. Do you accept this mission? They all nodded. Excellent, you can leave whenever you wish to start the mission he told them, you are dismissed. The team bowed and left, their client right behind them. So, when do we leave? Tazuna demanded to know. Tomorrow morning Kakashi answered, meet us by the main gate at 7 a.m. sharp. Azuna scoffed, whatever he said as he took another swig from his flask and left. Could he be any more rude? Sakura grumbled. I wouldn't worry about it, Kakashi told her, clients like him are a dime a dozen. It's best not to let him get to you, he then addressed the whole team, now, Wave Country is relatively close by, but we likely be there for a few weeks until the client finishes his project, so pack enough supplies to last you about a month. Pack only the essentials, understood. He asked. The team nodded. Good. I'll see you three by the gate tomorrow at 7 a.m., dismissed. And, with that, the team separated, none realizing that their lives were about to irrevocably change. The next morning, the main gate, 9 a.m., having grown accustomed to their sensei's lateness, the genin of Team 7 arrived two hours after the time they were told to do so. Only to find, to their everlasting surprise, that Kakashi was there waiting for them, Tazuna standing nearby. Well, well, glad you three could finally join us, Kakashi said, sarcastically, a bit of smugness in his tone. What? Wait, you. You showed up on time, Sakura asked, bewildered. Yep. You never show up on time, Sasuke pointed out. Naruto quickly understood what was going on, you're mixing things up he accused, you showed up on time to screw with us so that we won't be able to predict your actions so easily, ensuring we never know when to show up early or late. That or the world is ending, Sakura muttered. I resent any such accusations. Kakashi told them, handing over his heart, his face showing mock hurt, I would never manipulate my students in such a despicable manner. Yeah, great, right, good for you Tazuna said, interrupting him, can we go now? Kakashi ignored his tone and nodded, sure, let's go he turned to his team, Sasuke, you stay next to Tazuna, Sakura and Naruto, you two take up the front, I'll stay in the rear, where an attack is most likely to come from he ordered. The three genin nodded and did as they were told. And so, Team 7 left on its first mission outside the walls of Konoha. After a few minutes of walking, Naruto noticed Sakura seemed distracted. Is something wrong? He asked. Sakura shook her head, no. No everything is fine she told him, clearly lying. Sakura. Naruto said, giving her a look. She sighed, it's my mom, she told him, I told her we were leaving the village for a mission, and she freaked out. Why would she freak out? Naruto asked. Sakura was silent. Sakura, we may not be friends yet, but we are teammates Naruto told her, you can tell me anything, and it will stay between us. They sighed again and answered him, after a moment, my dad was a shinobi she told him, he died on a mission when I was a child. Mom never really recovered she confessed. Naruto was now listening very intently. It took me months to convince her to let me join the academy and become a Kanoichi she continued, she was worried that I would die and she'd be all alone. I kept telling her I'd be fine but she wouldn't listen. She nearly shouted. She sighed and continued, she finally gave in and let me join up and was so proud of me when I graduated. I thought she was done being so overprotective, but the minute I tell her we're leaving, she starts crying and saying that she's going to lose me too. She has no faith in me at all. She nearly cried out. Naruto thought for a moment and then spoke, I wish I could empathize with you he told her, I never got to meet my parents. Sakura remembered that and felt guilty about complaining about her mother when he didn't have any parents at all. I'm sorry she mumbled, ashamed. It's alright Naruto told her, it's not your fault, he then moved on, I don't think your mother lacks faith in you, she's just worried about losing you. You're her daughter, but you're also a reminder of the love she had for your father. It's understandable that she would be afraid to lose you the same way you lost your father. Sakura was surprised by this. For an orphan, he was surprisingly smart when it came to relationships between parent and child. What do you think I should do? She asked. Naruto thought for a moment before answering, tell her the truth, he told her, simply, tell her you're a grown woman that can make her own decisions and decide her own future. As a Kanoichi, you will likely be in danger most of your career. It's regrettable, but it's also your choice, not hers. Show her that you love her and live your life with no regrets, so that, should the worst come to happen, your mother can know you lived a full life. I don't want to hurt her, she's my mom, Sakura told him. 
you don't have to Naruto told his female teammate, just help her to understand. Sakura smiled at him, thank you. Naruto smiled back, you're welcome. After a few more hours of walking, they came across a strange sight. The puddle in the middle of the road. Normally, this wasn't too unusual, except that it was summer and it hadn't rained in weeks. Sasuke, Sakura and Tazuna didn't notice it, but Naruto and Kakashi did. The blonde turned his head to look at his sensei, who was still walking behind them. The silver-haired nodded to his student, who nodded back. The group walked past the puddle. After a few moments, the puddle began to shift and change, becoming a pair of strangely dressed men. Both had shoulder-length dark brown hair and dark eyes, and both wore rebreathers that covered the lower halves of their faces. Both wore camouflage suits with bandages around their waists and knee-length sandals. Things differed for each one from there. One wore a ragged black cape and had a headband with a single horn emerging from it, while the other wore several pouches around his waist and a headband with two horns emerging from it. Both headbands had the Karigakur symbol on it, with a slash mark through it. Their most distinguishing feature, however, were the large metal gauntlets each one was wearing. The one with the single horned headband wore one on his right arm, and the one with two horns wore one on his left arm. The two looked each other in the eyes and nodded. They then began moving forward, silently stalking their prey. Back with the group, Kakashi was reading his book but dropped it when he felt something ensnare his body. His eyes widened when he saw the spike chain that was wrapped around his body. The rest of the group turned around and saw their sensei ensnared, helpless. Before any of them could react, the two assailants yanked hard on the chain connecting them to their victim, slicing the two pieces. Kakashi sensei. Sakura cried out in horror. Sasuke and Tazuna were also horrified by this, while Naruto merely glared at the attackers. One down. One attacker began. Four to go. The other finished. Naruto quickly took charge, Sakura, stay back and protect Azuna. Sasuke, take the one on the left, I've got the one on the right. Keep them separated, they look like they rely on coordinated attacks. Sasuke didn't like being ordered around, but nodded and, together, they charged their foes. Said foes were surprised by this. Du Genin were about to take them on. They were expecting them to freeze up after killing their sensei. They activated the release mechanisms inside their gauntlets and separated themselves from the chain that connected them, allowing them to engage their attackers. Naruto ducked underneath a clawed swipe and grabbed his foe's right arm before the second could connect. The blonde saw something dripping off the claws. He threw the man into a nearby tree and called out to Sasuke. Heads up. Their gauntlets are coated in poison, don't let them scratch you. He told his male teammate. Sasuke ducked under a swipe from his foe and kicked him in the chest, sending him sliding back a few feet and nodded to his teammate before re-engaging. Naruto's opponent, meanwhile, stood up and charged him. Naruto dodged several swipes and then socked him right in the jaw, sending him to the ground. Naruto scoffed, that's all you got. He taunted. The masked man growled and charged again. After Naruto dodged the claw a few more times, he was able to connect a kick to the man's gut, causing him to slide back. Naruto took advantage of the space between them and took a deep breath. He exhaled, unleashing a stream of fire at his foe. Grey fire. Reaper art. Soul fire stream the blonde muttered. The masked shinobi recovered in time to see the attack coming and leapt out of the way. The attack clipped him and a patch of grey flames latched onto his upper arm. The masked man screamed in agony. He had been burned before, but this fire was a thousand times worse, like it was burning his insides. Before he could try to put out the flames, Naruto closed the gap between them, sending an uppercut to his chin that launched him into the air. Before he got too high, however, he grabbed the man by his leg and slammed him into the ground, rendering him unconscious, before willing the flame to extinguish. The other masked shinobi saw his partner's defeat and his eyes widened. Gozu. He cried out, but was silenced when he was kicked in the back of the head by Sasuke, also rendering him unconscious. The job you three a voice called out. The group turned and saw Kakashi Haddock, alive and completely unharmed. Sensei. You're alive. Sakura cried out with joy and relief. The group noted that the pieces of Kakashi had transformed into wooden splinters, indicating a substitution. You certainly took your time, Kakashi-sensei, Naruto noted. The man I smiled, I wanted to see how you all would do without me he told them. Wait, you knew he was alive, Sakura yelled. Naruto nodded. Why didn't you tell us? Because we were in the middle of a fight, remember? Naruto deadpanned. Sakura closed her mouth and blushed in embarrassment. If you both are done Kakashi interrupted, come help me tie these two up he ordered them. The genin nodded and, a few moments later, the two masked shinobi were tied to a nearby tree. Sasuke noticed that the fire that Naruto had used against his foe didn't leave any marks. What kind of fire was that? He asked. Soul fire Naruto answered, it doesn't leave any physical wounds, but it burns the victim's soul. It's much more painful than regular fire. Sasuke was a little envious of this ability. Gozu and Maizu Kakashi said, breaking the dark-haired teens out of his thoughts, the demon brothers. You know them? Sasuke asked. 
I know of them, Kakashi told him, twin brothers and rank missing men from Kurigakur, wanted in connection to the attempted assassination of the current Mizukage. Why are missing men from Kiri setting up an ambush in Fire Country? Naruto asked, and so close to Konoha. If I had to guess, they were waiting for someone specific he then looked at his students, probably us. Naruto nodded in agreement, are you going to interrogate them? He asked. Akashi nodded, yes, once they wake up. I can do it, the blonde offered. They were surprised by this, are you sure? Naruto nodded again, I've done this kind of thing before. After considering this for a moment, Kakashi nodded, alright then, you're up. Naruto then moved over to the prisoners, pulled out a water bottle, and sprinkled a bit of water on them, causing them to groan and awaken. Whoa. What? What happened? The single horned brother, Gozu, groaned out. You got your asses handed to you. The twins looked up and saw the blonde genin staring down at them. They attempted to move and found that they were bound and saw their gauntlets laying on the ground nearby. They also noticed, to their shock, that the they killed was still alive. We have nothing to say to you the two-horned brother, Maizu, told him. By saying that, you've proven to me that you do have something worth saying to me, Naruto pointed out. He means we won't talk, Gozu corrected. Oh, but I think you will, Naruto told him, and then pulled out his scythe, morphed it into an arm blade and held it to Gozu's throat. You're going to tell me why you set up that extremely poorly thought out ambush against us, or I'll, you'll torture me? Gozu finished, before scoffing, go ahead, I can take it. Oh no, 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 Naruto told him, it's not you I'm going to torture, he said, before moving to blade to Maizu, it's your brother that will feel harvest sting. Gozu's eyes widened in fear. Don't tell him anything, Gozu. Maizu told his brother, glaring up defiantly at Naruto. The blonde looked at Gozu, it's your choice he told him, tell me why you attacked us. Or I'll start by carving out your brother's eyes he vowed, holding the tip of his blade uncomfortably close to Maizu's right eye. Maizu, to his credit, only continued to stare up at the blonde defiantly. Gozu was conflicted. He wanted to remain loyal. But he also loved his brother. He had enough experience to know when someone was bluffing, and this genin wasn't. After a few moments, he sighed. We were after the bridge builder, Gozu confessed. Gozu? Maizu hissed. It doesn't matter, brother, Gozu assured his twin, they can't keep him safe, you know that. Naruto lowered his blade, bridge builder. He asked, you mean Tazuna? Gozu nodded, yeah, our master wants him dead. Why? He was hired to kill him, Gozu told him, and he entrusted us with the task. Who hired him? The missing nin shrugged, no idea he said, we were just given a target and told to kill him. Why does someone want Tazuna dead? Naruto asked. Gozu shrugged again, again, no idea he answered. Naruto pondered this for a moment before asking another question. Who is your master? Gozu then surprised him by glaring up at him. Never. He hissed. He saved our lives Maizu snarled, we owe him our loyalty. It doesn't matter what you do to me or my brother, we'll never betray him. Gozu vowed. Naruto stared at the twins, surprised by their loyalty. I believe you he told them, after a few moments of silence. He then holstered his blade, grabbed both their heads, and smashed them together, knocking them out once more. Well done, Naruto Kakashi complimented his student. The bond between brothers is strong and noble, Naruto told him, but it can also be used against them. Kakashi nodded, wise words he complimented, before turning to Tazuna, who was now extremely nervous, now then he began, I think you owe us an explanation, Mr. Bridge Builder. Tazuna loudly swallowed, I I don't know what, if you insult our intelligence by saying I don't know what you're talking about, I'll finish what the demon brothers started Naruto growled out. Tazuna looked down, hiding his shame. Who wants you dead? Kakashi asked. After several moments of silence, Tazuna answered. Beto, he muttered. Kakashi asked, surprised, the CEO of Gato Shipping Industries. One of the richest men in the world. That. Tazuna nodded. Naruto whistled, damn he exclaimed, what did you do to piss off someone that powerful? He asked. I gave my people hope. This response surprised the rest of the group. What do you mean? Sakura asked. Azuna, realizing that lying would only make things worse, sighed and continued. A few years ago he began, Wave was a thriving place. Our ports and easy to get to location made us the provider of a large amount of trade goods for the rest of the continent he then frowned, but all that changed when Gato showed up, he snarled out the name with absolute hate. The members of Team 7 were now listening very intently. We thought he was just another businessman he let out a dry, humorless laugh, he started buying out his rivals and local business owners. Then he went further by blocking off all trade that didn't come from his company. Anyone who didn't sell to him was murdered in their homes, along with their families he then continued, we tried to go to our daimyo for help, but Gato had bought him off and made him make it seem to the outside world that everything was normal in Wave. Ensuring that no one would try to break his control over the trade monopoly, allowing him to charge as much as he wants for trade goods, Naruto said, disgusted by what he was hearing. 
Azuna nodded, he controls everything, food, clothing, you name it, and you can't look at it without having to pay that fat midget fuck. He sighed and continued, if that wasn't enough, he has his army of thugs shake down citizens and force them to pay for protection and kidnap local girls to sell into slavery he told them, his voice dripping with absolute hate, after he tests them for himself, of course. The team was horrified by this. Akashi decided to change the topic, you said Gato was trying to have you killed for giving your people hope. He asked. Azuna nodded, I came up with an idea to free our country from Gato's control he told them, I designed and am building a great bridge to the outside, larger and tougher than any ever built he said with pride, explaining why the demon brothers had called him the bridge builder, once it's finished, nothing will be able to take it down he vowed, we can use it to resume trade with the rest of the world. And break Gato's trade embargo Kakashi finished. Azuna nodded, and that's why Gato wants me dead he explained, because if I die, the bridge will never be completed, and Gato will remain in control. We needed to hire a squad of ninja to protect me while me and my men finished the bridge, but we couldn't afford anything higher than a C rank fee. He then narrowed his eyes, I won't let that little shit take anything else from me and my family. He vowed. What has he taken from your family? Sakura asked, confused. Azuna's face showed great sadness, my. My son-in-law he told them, he led a resistance movement against Gato his look became pained, Gato. Had him executed, made an example of him he sighed, my daughter has put on a brave face, but. But my grandson never recovered he finished, with great sadness in his tone. The team let this soak in, pondering what they should do. What do we do now? Sasu asked, after a few minutes of silence. Akashi sighed, this mission just changed from a C rank to an A rank he told them, you three aren't ready for this he sighed again, I hate to say this. But we need to return to the village. I'm calling off the mission. Azuna's eyes widened in fear. You can't. He yelled, if you leave, my people are doomed. You have to help us. We don't have a choice Kakashi told him, I'm sorry, but I wouldn't risk my team on, the hell with that. Naruto growled out, interrupting him. The group was shocked by this. Excuse me? Kakashi asked. You heard me, Naruto answered him, I'm not going back. I'm going to finish this mission. Naruto, I understand you're upset, but, do you? Naruto asked interrupted, do you understand? He shook his head, no, I don't think you do. He paused for a moment before continuing, we have the power to help these people he told them, to make a difference. If we ignore them, how does it make us any different from Gato? He paused then spoke again, all evil needs to succeed, is for good men and women to do nothing he quoted, a friend of mine once told me that, and I thought I understood what he meant. But I was wrong. He didn't mean we can be heroes by aiding others, he meant that we have the power, the choice, to stop evil, to stand up and say no more. We can be the light that shines against the darkness, and, if we shrink our responsibility, we allow the darkness to swallow us. The group was stunned by this. Naruto had never spoken with such conviction before. Naruto Kakashi spoke up, I know you want to help, but you aren't ready for this yet. I wasn't ready to die either he told him darkly, but I did, and I became stronger for it. Sakura and Sasuke gasped in surprise. Naruto died four years ago. Not just disappeared. But. He was standing before them, alive and breathing right now. Naruto. Kakashi muttered, shocked. If you want to go back, go ahead the blonde told them, but I'm not going with you, I'm going to continue the mission, and if you have to brand me a missing nin for that, go right ahead he told them, because the only thing that will stop me from completing my task. is death he vowed. The group was absolutely floored by this declaration. Kakashi was surprised and proud. Sasuke was simply surprised. Sakura felt inspired. Azuna was touched and hopeful. After several moments of silence, Sasuke stepped forward. If the dobe's going, then so am I he told the group, not wanting to seem weak. Sakura also stepped forward, I'm going too she told her sensei. The Kashi stared at his students, a sense of pride filling him. Then, he I smiled. Okay he conceded, alright. But if we're going to do this, we need to send a message back to the Hokage to let him know that the mission parameters have changed. Thank you Tazuna said, thank you so much. I promise, as soon as Wave is back on his feet, I'll pay you for an air rank mission. He vowed. We'll hold you to that, Kakashi told him, seriously. And so, after Kakashi sent a message to the Hokage about the change in plan and to notify him to send a team to bring the Demon Brothers in, the group carried on, unaware that the danger was only going to increase. Two days later, past the wave border. Damn, this fog is unending, Naruto said as the team continued walking. This part of the world and water country are always like this Kakashi told him, it makes it easier to hide, but also easier to be ambushed, so stay alert he advised. The team did as instructed keeping a careful eye and ear out for any sign of an ambush. Some nearby bushes rustled and Sasuke responded by throwing a kunai at the disturbance. Ish Naruto said, a little jumpy there, Sasuke. Shut up, Dobe the Achiha grumbled as he went to check the bushes. He peeled back the foliage and found. 
A white rabbit, scared out of its mind, the kunai having nearly hit it. Bawu Sakura cooed, it's just a little bunny. She said as she picked it up and began petting and consoling it. Bakashi and Naruto, meanwhile, noticed something strange. It has white fur Naruto thought, that species of rabbit only has white fur during the winter. It's summer, its fur should have turned brown months ago. That means it was kept inside, he pondered for a moment, a pet, maybe. His eyes widened, or a decoy. Bakashi was thinking along the same lines. Both then heard something cutting through the air. That down hit the deck. Kakashi and Naruto shouted. Sasuke threw himself onto the ground while Kakashi tackled Tizuna, and Naruto tackled Sakura, the rabbit escaping her and fleeing. They barely avoided the massive blade that soared over them and embedded itself in a nearby tree. Bank Sakura told her blonde teammate. You're welcome he said, but try to pay more attention next time. Sakura nodded, and then both blushed when they realized how close they were to each other. Clearing his throat, Naruto pulled his teammate to her feet, and the two moved apart. The others had gotten to their feet when they noticed a man standing on the hilt of the large blade. Well, well, well the man said, his back to them, Kakashi Haddock, the copycat ninja he said, calling Kakashi by his name and title, of all the shinobi I was expecting to encounter, you were at the bottom of the list. He then turned to face them, giving them a clearer look at him. He was tall and noticeably muscular with pale skin, short spiky black hair, brown eyes, and incredibly small eyebrows. He was shirtless, showing off his muscular torso, with his chest only covered by a belt, likely where he attached his blade to, behind his back, once he sheathed it. He was wearing baggy pants with a striped pattern typical of Kurigakur and wrist warmers extending up to his elbows, with matching leg warmers. He wore a Kurigakur headband on his head with a slash through it and bandages covering the lower half of his face. The man grinned behind his bandages, guess I can't blame the Demon Brothers for failing now, can I? Zabuza Mamachi Kakashi said, identifying the name of their attacker, the Demon of the Hidden Mist. Former member of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist, a rank missing nin from Kuridakur, wanted for the attempted assassination of the Yandane Mizukage. Zabuza's grin widened, so you know of me? I'm honored he said, bowing. I know what you've done, Kakashi told him, how you butchered your graduating class. How you single-handedly ended the practice of mortal combat for graduating the Kurigakur Academy by single-handedly slaughtering over 100 other kids. Tabuza chuckled darkly, you make that sound like a bad thing. He then looked up and saw the rest of the team, aw, look at little Gaki's playing ninja he taunted though he did like the blonde one side, it's cute that you encourage them to play pretend, Kakashi. Naruto and Sasuke narrowed their eyes at the missing nin, while Sakura was nervous and Tizuna was terrified. Speaking of Tizuna, Zabuza then turned his attention to the old architect, ah, there he is, the man of the hour. The old man who managed to make his way to the top of Gato's shitlist, he then looked back at Kakashi, out of respect for you, copycat nin, I'll give you one chance to turn around and go back home he said, leave the old man. And I'll let the rest of you live. Kakashi's eyes narrowed, do you really think I'll agree to that? He asked. Zabuza grinned, no he told him, just giving you a chance to save yourself and your brats. Akashi turned to his team, triangle formation. He commanded them, no matter what happens, protect the client, I'll deal with Zabuza. You really expect me to Sasuke started, insulted that his sensei wouldn't let him fight. I'm not asking, Sasuke Akashi told him sternly, stay with Tizuna, that's an order. Do what he says Naruto told his male teammate, pulling out Harvest, he knows what he's doing. Reluctantly, the last loyal Ichiha got into formation. Each team was on a different side of Tizuna, who was right in the middle, terrified. Zabuza, meanwhile, smirked and made a hand sign. Hiding in mist technique. He said. Suddenly, the fog became much thicker, so thick that you could cut through it with a knife, hiding Zabuza from view. Be careful. Kakashi called out to his team, Zabuza is a master of silent killing. He warned, he'll use the fog to get close enough to strike. It was at that moment that an aura of killing intent enshrouded them. Kakashi and Naruto were unaffected, but Sakura, Sasuke and Tazuna were trembling in fear. Eight vital points of Yuza's menacing voice seemed to come from all directions, larynx, lungs, liver, spine, jugular, subclavian artery, kidneys, heart they could hear the excitement in his voice, so many choices. You forgot the brain, no brows. Naruto told him. Tabuza chuckled darkly, of course, excellent idea. Suddenly, the swordsman appeared in front of Tizuna, in between the formation, his massive blade raised to cleave the old man in two from head to toe. He brought the blade down. Clang. Not only to find his weapon stopped by harvest. That wasn't an invitation, Naruto told the swordsman. Tabuza was surprised that a genin was fast enough to block his strike. His surprise increased further when he tried overpowering the blonde, only to find that the teen was strong enough to shove him back a few feet. Naruto's teammates and client were also surprised. Tabuza quickly overcame his surprise, not bad kitty commented, maybe you're not playing ninja after all. Naruto smirked, you have no idea, he told the missing nin. 
Before the swordsman could respond, he turned to block a kunai strike from Kakashi. Pay attention to me, demon of the hidden mist he told his foe. Tabuza grinned in a wicked way behind his bandages, if you insist. And, with that, the two began to clash, disappearing into the mist. After several minutes of the sounds of metal hitting metal, Sakura spoke. I hate this she hissed, I hate not being able to see. I can't tell where they are. He could be sneaking up on us right now. Not a whole lot we can do about it, Sakura, Sasu told her. Actually, Naruto said, I think I can fix that, he told them. He took a few steps forward and started foaming hand signs. Wind release. Great breakthrough. He shouted. Normally, this technique sent a blast of wind in a certain direction, but Naruto altered it so that it spread in all directions, powerful enough to push the fog away, but not powerful enough to knock anyone over. Not bad kid Tazuna complimented. The blonde shrugged, I try. The Kashi and Zabuza, meanwhile, barely noticed this and had just pushed each other back a few feet. He's good Kakashi noted, better than I thought. It looks like I'll have to bring out my trump card. Kakashi surprised his team by grabbing his headband and began to pull it back. Oh god Sakura thought, please don't be gross. She pleaded. The group's eyes widened, none more than Sasuke's, when they saw what was beneath their sensei's headband. An intact eye with a scar around it. A fully matured Sharingan eye. What the fuck? Naruto thought, how does he have the Sharingan? Okurama's voice came from within his mind, right. I forgot to mention that. She told him, embarrassment apparent in her angelic voice. You forgot Naruto asked in disbelief, you forgot that my dad's only surviving student has a fucking Sharingan eye. I'm sorry, okay. Sasuke, meanwhile, was silently fuming. He has the Sharingan. He thought, how does he have my clan's bloodline? The thought of Ananichiha wielding the bloodline of his clan a bloodline he, himself, had yet to unlock made him equal parts angry and sick. Tabuza saw his opponent's secret weapon and grinned, so the rumors are true he noted, you do have a Sharingan eye. Enjoy it while you can, Kakashi told him, it will be the last thing you ever see. The two then continued their fight, with everyone noting how Kakashi's speed and reflexes were vastly improved by his Sharingan. After over 15 minutes of combat, where Kakashi was beginning to gain the upper hand, Zabuza used a water clone to distract his opponent long enough to gain an advantage. Water release. Wild water wave. The swordsman shouted after forming hand signs. The wave of water slammed into Kakashi and knocked him down and back several feet. The silver-haired landed on his stomach and attempted to stand up, but noticed something was wrong. This water he thought, it's heavy. His eyes widened when he realized what was happening. Before he could react, Zabuza was beside him, his arm outstretched. Gotcha he smirked, water release. Water prison technique. The nearby water quickly formed into a large sphere, trapping the copycat ninja within it, completely helpless. Damn it. He mentally swore, I can't move. And now, the rest of your team and the old man's abuser said, smirking triumphantly, are as good as dead. Because he had to keep his arm in the water sphere to keep it active, Zabuza then made a hand sign, creating two water clones that began to move menacingly towards the others. Run. Kakashi ordered his team, somewhat surprised that he could still breathe and talk in his prison, grab Tazuna and get out of here. Zabuza smirked in a predatory way, it's no use he told them, it doesn't matter where they go, how far or fast they run, or where they hide, they won't escape me he promised. The swordsman's killing intent was now saturating the air. Sasuke, Sakura and Tazuna were now visibly shaking in fear, close to passing out from sheer terror. Naruto, meanwhile, was unaffected and stepped forward, a look of determination on his face. Tabuza raised a tiny eyebrow before he started laughing. Seriously? He asked, you're gonna try and fight me? After I just beat your sensei. Don't try, the blonde told him, succeed. Akashi was afraid for his student, Naruto, what are you doing? He demanded, take the others and run. He's too strong for you. He pleaded. So you would think, Naruto told his mentor. Bakashi tried a different approach, Naruto, I'm ordering you to. Those who break the rules are trash, but those who abandon their comrades are worse than trash he quoted, you told us that the day we became a team, sensei he looked towards the trapped, it's a good motto. And one I will not break. I will never leave a comrade to die, and I will never abandon a member of my team. He vowed. Team 7 was shocked by this declaration, none more so than Sakura. Naruto she thought in awe, he's. He's so brave. And hot. Inner Sakura chimed in. Shut up. Tabuza was also surprised by this, but laughed. And here I thought you might be smarter than the others he taunted, don't you get it? The copycat was the only one of you that posed a threat to me. He told the blonde, I've slaughtered hundreds. Butchered entire squads of shinobi from every hidden village. He bragged, what makes you think you, a genin, can possibly take me down? Because I'm done holding back. Naruto then unleashed his own killing intent, laced with his reaper powers. The air became very cold, colder than the longest and darkest winters in any country, except for snow country. Cold enough that everyone present could see their own breath. 
The cold seeped into the bones of everyone present. The water began to freeze, the ice creeping towards the tiny eyebrowed swordsman. The cold was only overpowered by the sense of terror that now choked the air. Terror. And death. The water clones stopped in their tracks. What? What the hell is this? Zabuza thought, a hint of fear in his mental voice, it feels like the Shinigami himself is standing in front of me. Although the killing intent was aimed mostly at Zabuza, the others could feel it as well. It's SOCC cold Sakura thought, wanting to try and warm herself, but was frozen in fear. Sasuke was shaking. Not from the cold. But from fear. This power he thought, even Itachi never came close to this kind of killing intent. He thought in terror. Bakashi was stunned, such potent killing intent he thought in awe, Naruto, what happened to you? How are you doing this? He wondered. Azuna, meanwhile, was too terrified to move, speak, or even think. You think you can scare me? Naruto asked his foe, scoffing. He then grinned wickedly, I should thank you. What we have here is a rare opportunity to cut loose on a human foe he told Zabuza, confusing him, to show you just how powerful I really am. He then vanished. And appeared in front of one of the clones, slicing it in half before it could even twitch. Zabuza's eyes widened in shock. So fast. He thought in amazement, with the others thinking the same thing. The blonde then continued by moving towards the other clone. The chakra construct swung its blade horizontally, trying to behead its attacker, only for Naruto to duck and punch a hole right through its chest. The clone froze in shock before dissolving, three seconds later. Now that we're alone Naruto began, allow me to show you the true meaning of terror. He then disappeared and reappeared right in front of Zabuza, his scythe held high, ready to bring it down on the arm the swordsman was using to hold his sensei captive. Shit. Zabuza thought, yanking his arm free to avoid losing it. He leapt out of the way as the scythe pierced the ground and the prison fell apart. The Kashi coughed up water before looking up at his student, surprise in his eyes. Naruto grinned at him, take a break, sensei. I've got this he told his sensei. He then turned to face Zabuza. Said swordsman was surprised, but controlled himself. Not bad, he complimented, but you're still out of your league. Funny Naruto said, I was about to tell you the same thing. Zabuza growled and charged, his blade eager to kill. Naruto blocked the overhead swing, then aimed a swipe at his foe's legs. Zabuza jumped over it and aimed a kick at the blonde's head, who leaned back to avoid it. The two then locked blades, each trying to overpower each other. Nice side, Zabuza told him. Thanks, it's called Harvest, Naruto told his foe. My sword's called Kubikaramj, the missing nin told him, and I'll carve that name on your tombstone. Naruto scoffed and shoved his foe back several feet. Harvest is better, he told the tiny eyebrowed man, it's a multi-purpose tool. He then shifted the scythe into its spear form and charged his foe. He thrust the spear forward. Zabuza responded by holding out his blade in front of him, flatways, to block the attack. The spear glanced off, but Naruto thrust it forward again, the blade glanced off again, but then began to keep rapidly jabbing at the defense on its own, clanging against it like a razor-sharp jackhammer. After several more hits, Zabuza was knocked back not noticing the crack that had developed in his blade. As Abusa attempted to recover, Naruto charged forward, connecting a swing that knocked Kubikaramj out of the missing nin's hands, sending it clattering across the field. Zabuza ended up on his back. Naruto stood over him and attempted to bring the glaive end of his weapon down on him. Zabuza caught the weapon and struggled to hold it back, the tip nearly touching his face. He used all the strength he had to attempt to stop the blade, but the blonde reaper's enhanced strength was too much, and the blade was getting closer and closer to impaling him through the head. Suddenly, Harvest sent a wave of energy through itself to where its master's foe was grabbing it, not wanting this man to touch it. The wave hit the swordsman's hands with an energy that was so cold, it burned. This pain broke Zabuza's focus. And allowed Naruto to bring the glaive end down on him, impaling him through the skull. Zabuza twitched for a second before his hands dropped, and he was still. Naruto ripped his weapon free. And then watched as the body dissolved into water. The water clone. Naruto thought, realizing that Zabuza had used it as a substitution. What a release. Gunshot. He heard Zabuza cry out. He turned and barely had time to raise his blade to protect himself from the liquid projectile. The ball of water splashed against the hilt, but the force of the blow knocked the weapon out of his hands and away from him. Seeing his opponent disarmed, Zabuza launched three more projectiles at the blonde. Knowing he couldn't dodge them, Naruto held out both his hands. Dark release. Inhaling maw. The projectiles were absorbed into the blonde's palms, vanishing. Zabuza's eyes widened again. What the f? Naruto then held out one hand and aimed it at Zabuza, dark release. Judgment. He shouted. Zabuza barely dodged the ball of blue flame that was launched at him. Naruto held out his other palm and fired off another, this one hitting the ground near Zabuza's feet when he tried to dodge, exploding and sending him into the air. Naruto then fired a third fireball at the helpless missing nin from the same palm he fired the first one from. 
The blue ball of flame hits Abusa, exploding and sending him skipping across the ground, like a stone on water, into a nearby tree. The rest of Team 7 were in awe. So powerful. Sakura gaped. So powerful and hot you mean. Both literally and figuratively. Her inner self said. Not now. Sasuke, meanwhile, was fuming. How is this possible? The heir to the Achiha clan thought with anger, jealousy, and incredulity, he's the dead last he thought, the dead fucking last. An orphan loser. How is he so powerful? He's stronger than me. It's not fair. I'm an Achiha. That power should be mine. I need it more than he does. The Kashi's mask hit his dropped jaw. Naruto he thought, how have you become so strong? Meanwhile, Zabuza groaned as he stood up, wobbling slightly, before shaking it off. A large burn mark was now visible on his torso. Had enough, no brows. Naruto asked taunted. Zabuza growled. This is impossible he thought, he's just a genin, and he's making me look like a novice. A fool. He started forming hand signs. Water release. Snake's mouth. The large serpent made of water formed and opened its mouth, showing its fangs, before rushing towards the blonde. Naruto formed hand signs of his own, wind release. Drilling air bullet. Naruto spat out a massive ball of compressed air that slammed into the water snake, destroying it and sending water flying everywhere. Tabuza growled again and tried something else, creating more hand signs, water release. Water dragon bullet technique. A massive serpentine dragon made of water formed and surged towards the blonde. Naruto made more hand signs, fire release. Hellfire vulpine strike. Naruto spewed out a massive torrent of flame, which transformed into an equally massive fox with nine tails. Oh, I love that one. Kurama squealed out. The fox-shaped construct roared and charged forward, slamming into the dragon, dispersing both and creating a massive cloud of steam. Zabuza took a breath, winded from using two high-powered jutsus in such quick succession. Luckily for him, the steam hit him from his opponent, giving him an advantage. Odd or so he thought. He turned to move to flank the blonde. Only to find his foreride in front of him. Boo. Zabuza threw a punch, only for Naruto to catch it. He then reached out with his free hand and grabbed the swordsman by the throat. The missing nin tried to force his foe off of him, but couldn't get him to budge. Naruto then lifted his opponent into the air, the steam dispersing. Zabuza felt himself growing weaker, like his strength was being drained from him. He's absorbing my chakra. He realized. This was true, Naruto was channeling his dark release to siphon off Zabuza's chakra to replenish his own. Feel that? The blonde asked, breathe it in he then remembered he had his hand wrapped around his victim's throat, well, figuratively he told him, before continuing, that's fear. Real fear. Not the simple feeling of dread you inflict on your foes with your taunts, sword, and killing intent, he then dropped him and kicked him away, true fear is experienced when you fight someone. Only to realize their power vastly eclipses your own. Zabuza snarled and charged at the blonde. Naruto proceeded to dodge punches and kicks for the next several seconds, until the right hook caught him right in the face. Naruto stumbled back. He wiped the blood from his lip and looked at it. Before looking up and glaring. He punched Zabuza in the face, then kneed him in the gut, knocking the breath out of him. He then lifted the swordsman up into the air before slamming him into the ground. Zabuza groaned in pain and tried to lift himself up, only for Naruto to grab him by the back of his head and slam his face into the ground. The blonde reaper then slammed his face into the earth five more times. Naruto once more grabbed Zabuza by the throat and held him into the air, before punching him so hard that he flew into a nearby tree. He slumped against it, groaning out in pain. He noticed that Kubikaram was near where he landed. He tried to reach for it, but was too weak and disoriented to do so. The demon of the hidden miss Naruto said, before scoffing, you're no demon, he then held out his arm and summoned Harvest back to him. He caught it and turned it back into its scythe form. You're just another man he finished. What? Are. You. Zabuza moaned out. I am death he said, before raising his scythe above his head, ready to deliver the final blow, destroyer of worlds. Before he could bring his blade down, something unexpected happened. Several pierced through the former member of the Seven Swordsman's neck. Zabuza stiffened before falling over, completely still and unresponsive. Everyone was surprised by this. Thank you for your assistance, Kanoha Shinobi, a soft boy said. A figure appeared from the forest and landed next to Zabuza's body. It was a female, clearly, who had black hair that was gathered in a bun and pale skin. She wore a Karigakur pinstriped outfit which stopped at her knees and wore a green Hayori with white trimmings over it, with a brown sash around her waist, with a fringe trail wrapped around her waist twice. She also wore light brown platoon sandals with straps and nail polish on her fingernails and toenails that were blue-green color. Her most identifying feature, however, was the Hunter Nin mask with the Karigakur symbol on the forehead. She was a Hunter Nin, the group realized. And you are. Naruto asked. Apologies the female Hunter Nin responded, but I am disinclined to reveal my name to you she told him, given my line of work, it's best I keep my identity hidden. 
Needless to say, I am a hunter nin from Kurigakur, and I have been tracking Zabuza Mamachi for quite some time now. She then bowed to him, you have my most profound thanks. It would have been very difficult to kill him by myself, she then picked up Zabuza's body in Kubikarabj, an impressive feat, considering her size. Now, I must dispose of the body and return this sword to Kiri she bowed again, thank you once again. And, with that, she leapt into the woods and disappeared. Naruto stared after her for several moments before turning and walking towards Kakashi. The silver-haired man had been so shocked by the fight, he had yet to get up. Naruto held out his hand to him. Kakashi took it and allowed his student to help him up. Naruto he began, that was. How did you? Naruto smirked, it's a long story, he explained, but let's just say that, just because I've been dead the last few years, doesn't mean I've started slacking off. Kakashi stared at him for a moment before giving him an eye smile. Only you could die and become stronger for it. Naruto smiled again, but then became serious, sensei, that hunter nin. I know Kakashi said, let's get someplace safe, then we'll discuss it he told his student. Naruto nodded. The two then approached the rest of the team plus Tazuna. Naruto Sakura said, that was. Awesome. She told him, also a little scary, but mostly awesome. Naruto chuckled, thank Sakura. Sasuke just fumed. Azuna remained quiet, but was still in awe. Kakashi cleared his throat, well then he began, now that that's done, I think we should get to Tazuna's house before anyone else shows up. The group nodded and continued on their way. Great job Kit Kurama congratulated, I love it when you cut loose. Naruto inwardly smirked, you do? Does it get you all hot and bothered? He asked suggestively. Kurama blushed and decided to play his game, you know me Naruto-kun she said, putting a seductive emphasis on the suffix, I like it rough. The two had grown even closer over the past few weeks, and this sort of thing was common for them. They enjoyed flirting playfully with each other, and each always sought to make the other flustered. You know Naruto continued, there are other, more productive ways to work up a sweat he told her. Oh really? She asked, maybe you'd like to show me sometime? Anytime, anywhere Kuraheim he told her, I just hope you can handle the intense workout. And so this continued for quite some time. Both wanted desperately to act on their words, but feared the other would reject them. Still, moments of levity like this were important. In the days to come, they would need it. Chapter 6. Preparations and an ideal worth dying for. There it is, Tazuna told Team 7, proudly. The day had passed since the encounter with Zabuza Mamachi, and the team was almost to the town Tazuna and his family called home. Before they could reach it, however, they had to covertly cross a large river. Gato's thugs carefully monitored the river so that no one could sneak in or, more importantly, out, ensuring no one could escape and inform the outside world of what was happening in Wave. In order to get across, a friend of Tazuna's had to ferry them across in his boat, as silently as his motor could. The fog was useful in this regard. It was also how the old architect had escaped to acquire help in the first place. Speaking of Tazuna, he was referring to his pride and joy, the bridge he was building to free Wave Country. The fog had cleared enough so that they could see it. It was a beautiful work of art. It was compassed of countless tons of concrete, stretching a few miles across the river to freedom, tall arches every mile or so. From what they could see, it was nearly finished. The team could see why Tazuna was so proud of his creation, once it was complete, judging from the materials used to construct it, it would take an incredible amount of force to bring it down. Naruto found himself impressed. While it paled in comparison to the Palace of Decay, angelic, or even demonic, architecture, it was still impressive, especially by human standards. Wow, Sakura whispered, I've never seen a bridge like this before. And you never will, Tazuna told her. After a few more minutes, the group had arrived on the other side. Tazuna turned to his friend after they disembarked, thank you Yashiro. Just make a count the boatman told him, I can't risk any more trips like this. Gato found out that you escaped and increased security on the border. Tazuna nodded, it'll be worth it, my friend, he promised. Yashiro nodded and took his boat further down the river, hiding it from sight. After he had disappeared from view, Tazuna turned to his protectors, my house is only a few more minutes from here, come on. Sure enough, after a few more minutes of walking, the group came upon a small two-story house by the river. Tazuna knocked on the door, Tsunami. He called out, it's me, open up. After a few moments, the door opened, revealing a beautiful young woman with long, dark blue hair, wearing a short-sleeved pink shirt with the end of the sleeves and the collar being red in color. Her hopeful look became one of joy when she saw Tazuna. Add. She cried as she pulled him into a hug, thank God. I was so worried. Azuna hugged his daughter back, it's okay honey he assured her, I'm fine. The two separated and the tsunami welcomed them inside. You must be the ninja my father hired to protect him, she noted. Kakashi gave her a reassuring eye smile. I'm Kakashi Hadaki introduced himself before moving to his students, this is Sakura Haruno, Sasuke Chiha, and Naruto Uzumaki, at your service my lady Naruto interrupted, taking the woman's hand and kissing the back of it gently. 
Tsunami blushed at the handsome teen, while Tazuna suddenly became protective. Careful, brat. Add. Tsunami scolded. Naruto then noticed someone standing near the staircase and saw that it was a young boy. He had spiky black hair and dark colored eyes. He was wearing a green jumpsuit with a yellow shirt and a simple pair of sandals. He also wore a blue and white striped bucket hat. He was currently glaring at Team 7. Tsunami noticed his presence, oh, this is my son, Inari she introduced him, sweetie, come say hello to the brave ninja who protected your grandfather. Instead of complying with his mother's request, his glare intensified before he ran back up the stairs, the sound of a door slamming soon following him. Tsunami sighed, I'm sorry she told them, Inari hasn't been the same since. Her face showed pain, for a long time now she finished. Naruto nodded in understanding. Tsunami then cheered up, please, make yourselves comfortable she told them, I was just about to make dinner, if you would like to join us. Bakashi smiled politely, we would love to, he told her. The group was led to the dining room, where they sat down, while Tazuna headed to take a shower and clean up. I'll be ready with dinner soon she told them, before returning to the kitchen. Bakashi looked at his team and became serious. We have a problem, he told them. Sakura and Sasuke were confused. What kind of problem? The female member of the team asked. Zabuza is probably still alive, Naruto told her. Both Sakura and Sasuke's eyes widened in shock and fear. W what? They asked. You heard me. How? Sasuke asked, we saw that hunter Nin kill him. Using Kakashi said, an unusual method of execution. Naruto intervened, if you stick a couple of needles into the right place in the human body, like certain places in the neck, you can force the victim into a state of unresponsiveness, the effects of which can mimic death he explained. If that's the case Kakashi continued, then the hunter Nin we encountered is likely an accomplice of Zabuza's. The other two genin let this sink in for a moment. So Sakura began, Zabuza might still be alive. She asked. Naruto nodded, with an ally at his back and a chip on his shoulder he told her, and people like Zabuza don't accept defeat gracefully. Meaning he'll come back for revenge Sasuke said, excited for a chance to show up Naruto. Naruto nodded, and to finish the job he was hired for. But. But you beat him. Sakura told her blonde teammate, can't you just do it again? She asked, hopeful. Perhaps Naruto told her, but he'll be prepared next time and probably have a few new tricks up his sleeve. Along with his partner, Kakashi finished. Sakura became even more nervous at the idea of an angry, mass-murdering missing Nin out for revenge against them. The good news Kakashi continued is that, because of his injuries, Zabuza will have to take it easy until he recovers he told his students. So we have time until he returns Sasuke said, how long? Judging from the beating I gave him, he'll need at least a week to recover Naruto said, less, if he can get access to a medical nin. So we have a week to prepare for the return of a psychotic mass murderer who wants to kill us, Sakura surmised, terrified, but intent on not showing it. Both her blonde teammate and sensei nodded. We'll have to up your training regimen Kakashi said, a week isn't a long time to prepare, but we don't have much of a choice. When do we start? Sasuke asked, eager to get started. Tomorrow morning Kakashi told him, we'll take the rest of the night off and get to work at first light, understood. The team nodded. Dinner's ready. Tsunami called to them. Team 7 was overjoyed to hear that and dug in as soon as the food was served to them. Still. Naruto could not help but wonder how Zabuza was taking his loss. Zabuza's hideout, unknown location, you blew it. The sound of an angry man voicing his disappointment echoed throughout the hideout. The owner of the hideout, Zabuza Mamachi, was lying in a bed, bandaged in various places, with a beautiful young woman by his side. She was the hunter nin that had saved him and was still wearing her usual attire, without her mask. Her face was angelic and pale, with dark eyes that bored angrily into the man who was shouting. The man was short, with puffy brown hair and a thin mustache. He wore a pair of small sunglasses with a black business suit and purple tie. This was Gato, her master's employer. Please lower your voice, Gato Sanchi warned him, Zabuza Sama is resting. Since his defeat, Zabuza had been unusually quiet. Not since his failure to kill the Yande Mizukage had she seen him so sullen. He spent the past day since he awoke staring into space, deep in thought, or at his blade. She was worried that something was wrong with him, but he had assured her that he was fine. Currently, he wasn't paying Gato any mind. I don't give a flying fuck if he's resting. The small tyrant shouted, I paid him good money, in advance, to kill that ancient bridge builder, and he promised that he would do it. He looked at the swordsman, you hear me you piece of shit. You promised me. He told him, I should have the two of you flayed and strung up right now. He then looked at the false hunter Nin and gave her a lecherous grin, which made her inwardly shiver with disgust. Unless he began, you make it up to me by offering this. Exquisite specimen to me as recompense he told the missing Nin. The young woman frowned and narrowed her eyes. This got a response from Zabuza, who glared at the midget. Haku's off limits, Gato he growled. 
Beto's grin widened and he approached the dark-haired beauty. Oh come now, Zabuza he said, reaching out to caress Haku's lovely face. You need to learn to shaarg. A-H-H. Beto cried out in pain when Haku grabbed Gato's arm when he tried to touch her and twisted it, before forcing him to his knees. The businessman's bodyguards, Zori and Wiraji who were standing nearby, saw this and were about to draw their swords. When they were stopped by Haku, who threw them at them. It didn't pierce their skin, but through their clothes, pinning them to the wall they were leaning against. While Gato was on the verge of tears from the pain, Zabuza spoke again. Listen and listen well, run he began, what happened yesterday was only a minor setback. I will complete our contract. In time has glare intensified, but I expect to be paid double our original fee for. Let's call it a business expense, got it? Beto's eyes widened behind his shades, double. He asked, are you out of your me ahhh? He cried out when Haku twisted his arm even more, okay, okay. Double. You got it. Zabuza nodded, good. I'm so glad you could see the reason he then looked towards his apprentice, let the nice man go, Haku. The girl nodded and looked down at her victim. If you ever try to touch me again she threatened, I'll break the other one. Beto was confused, the other yhhh. He cried out in agony as Haku twisted his arm enough to break it before releasing him. The little fool got to his feet, cradled his arm, and ran for the door, his bodyguards, who had just managed to free themselves, following him. Well done Haku's Zabuza complimented. Haku turned to her master and bowed, smiling from the praise, thank you, Zabuza sama The swordsman tried to stand up, but hissed in pain and fell back. Haku's eyes became filled with worry, Zabuza sama she rushed to his side and began using medical ninjutsu on him, you need to relax, you're still hurt. I'm fine, he grunted. Aku shook her head, with respect, no you're not she told him, that blonde shinobi hurt you pretty badly. Zabuza inwardly flinched when his defeat was brought up. He still couldn't believe that he had been beaten so easily. He looked at his blade and saw the crack in it. How long do I have to stay in this bed? He asked, eager to finish the contract. Three more days, at least Haku told him, and you'll need to spend a few days afterward training to regain your strength. So, about a week then. Haku nodded, yes, then you can take your revenge on the one who beat you. Oh, it won't be me who fights him, Zabuza told her, when the time comes, that job falls to you. Haku looked up at her master in surprise. Zabuza sama, I I don't understand she told him. He's strong, the swordsman told her, very strong. Stronger than me. His tojutsu skills completely eclipse mine, and he can absorb and match mine in jutsu. He'll be expecting me he then smirked at her, but he won't be expecting you. Me? Zabuza nodded, your speed can outmaneuver him and, combined with your bloodline, you have the best chance of bringing him down. While you do that, I'll handle the copycat. Once those two fall, the rest will be easy pickings. Haku bowed, I won't fail you, Zabuza sama she vowed. You never have, he replied. The two would spend the next week recovering and going over stratagems that would allow them to win the inevitable confrontation with the enemy team. The next morning, Team 7 awoke the next day, eager to begin training for their confrontation with Zabuza and his partner. After eating breakfast, the three genin followed their sensei outside and into the forest that was nearby. Alright then Kakashi began after they stopped at a very tall tree, today, I'm going to show you how to improve your chakra control, an invaluable skill to learn. Sasuke wasn't happy with this, but was just smart enough not to argue. How do we do that? He asked. By climbing trees, of course the silver-haired told him, as if it were the simplest thing in the world. Sakura was confused, but Kakashi-sensei, we already know how to climb trees. She told him. Ah, but do you know how to do it without using your hands? He asked. Two of the three genin were now extremely confused. Kakashi noted this and walked towards the tree, observe he told them. He then placed one foot on the side of the tree and then the other and then began walking up the side of the tree as easily as he would walk on the floor. Sasuke and Sakura were shocked as their sensei scaled a vertical surface with ease, stopping upside down on a thick branch. You see? He asked, an eye smile on his face. He let them soak it in for a moment before he spoke up. Now you try he told them, it's not as easy as it looks he warned, you have to apply the correct amount of chakra and distribute it properly. If you apply too much, you'll be blasted off the tree. Too little, and you'll slip right off. Like this another voice told them. They looked up and saw Naruto sitting on a branch a few levels higher than Kakashi, shocking the others. You know how to do this already? Kakashi asked. Naruto nodded, I learned this years ago he told his mentor, along with water walking he explained. Kakashi's shock rose. It was one thing for someone to already have mastered tree climbing before graduating from the academy, but it was another for that person to also know water walking as well. So Kakashi began, you've already mastered this? He asked. The blonde nodded. Looks like I have to. The rest of the team looked and saw Sakura on the branch of another tree, a look of pride on her face. The team was surprised, none more than Sasuke, who was fuming. 
It was bad enough that the dead last had surpassed him, but now Sakura was ahead of him too. Nice job Sakura, Naruto told her, giving her a thumbs up. The young woman blushed, I've always been good at chakra control, she told him. Still, you did well Kakashi told her, now climb down and do it again he ordered her. They became confused, why? She asked. The reason you have such good chakra control is because you have a limited chakra capacity Kakashi explained, the best way to increase your capacity is to keep doing chakra exercises. The more you climb, the more you'll stress your chakra coils and the higher your capacity will increase. The end result being you last longer in a fight. Sakura was a little hurt at having her weakness laid out for all to see, but understood and started to climb back down so that she could climb up again. Akashi then turned to Sasuke. Sasuke told the dark-haired clan heir, you'll try to scale this tree using your chakra to stick to the side he told him, before tossing a kunai at his feet, use this to mark the highest point you can reach, and then try to surpass it. He then leapt down, Naruto following him. Naruto, since you have already mastered this exercise, I'll have to come up with some other training regimen for you, he explained. Do you know any water jutsus? The blonde reaper asked. Akashi was confused, why water? He asked, I thought your affinities were wind and fire. Naruto nodded, those are the affinities I was born with he answered, but my genkai allows me to absorb the chakra of my foes and copy their elemental affinities, allowing me to use them. Akashi's eyes widened, so, in theory he began, you could learn to use all of the elements. He asked. Naruto nodded again, yes, but I can't use the combination elements like wood or lava he told his mentor, that requires the ability to fuse them together in a way one must be born with. Akashi nodded, understanding, in that case, yes, I do know a few water jutsus he told his blonde student, follow me to the river, and I'll show you. He then turned back to his remaining genin, if you two need anything, we'll be close by he told them before leaving with their teammate. Sasuke looked up at the tree and smirked. If the dog could master it, then it would be simple for him. He then charged at the tree, planted one foot on it. And then slipped right off. He fumed, feeling humiliated, while ignoring Sakura's call asking him if he was alright. Meanwhile, inner Sakura was laughing her ass off. Elsewhere, two days later, in a dark place, where all light seemed non-existent, a presence awoke. It felt the presence of something it hoped would not reveal itself. The meddler. Is here it said in a demonic voice. This would not do. There was too much at stake for one of them to screw it up now. Too many years worth of planning that it could not afford to have undone. Minions, it is called, softly. Five figures then appeared before the entity, kneeling. Find the servant of death it ordered, bring me its head, and hang the body high for all who would defy us to see. The five nodded and vanished. Soon, this problem would be solved. Outside Tazuna's house, that night, over two days had passed since Team 7 had arrived in Wave. They spent most of the day training, while one of them kept an eye on Tazuna while he and his crew worked, alternating between who did so each day. Naruto was returning from training when he passed his teammates. He saw Sasu charge up the tree once more, managing to make it a half an inch higher than his current record. He was progressing quickly, already more than a quarter of the way up the tree. The blonde remembered how he had been taught to climb using chakra, with his mentors lighting a fire beneath him to motivate him not to fall. He also remembered how they taught him to walk on water by boiling it, causing nasty burns if he fell in. Needless to say, he mastered both exercises very quickly. He thought about telling Kakashi to try it, but doubted he would. He then saw Sakura, on her knees and gasping for air, clearly worn out. The blonde decided to approach her. You okay Sakura? She looked up at him, sweating greatly, I'm. Fine she panted, just. Need to. Catch. My. Breath. You shouldn't push yourself too hard, he told her, you don't want to pass out. Sakura shook her head, I need. To get. Stronger she told him, don't. Want to. Let. You guys. Down. You're not letting anyone down, Naruto assured her, you're progressing well. I can still. Keep going they argued. Naruto sighed. He was proud of her, but knew she was too stubborn to stop. He then grabbed her by one of her shoulders and made a hand sign with his free hand. Arc release. Contribution, he whispered. Sakura suddenly felt a surge of energy flow through her body. After a few seconds, to her surprise, she felt as though she had received a full night's sleep. Whoa. She cried out, what did you do to me? She asked. I used my dark release on you, only I gave you some of my chakra, instead of taking some of yours, he explained. Sakura jumped to her feet and was nearly shaking with energy. I feel incredible. She told him, like I could take on the world with my bare hands. His hyperactiveness when they were younger now totally made sense. Naruto chuckled, yeah, my chakras are a little on the extra strength side. Sha. Bring it on. I'll take on anyone. She shouted, then realized what she just did and blushed. Yeah, sorry she told him. Naruto laughed and put a hand on one of her shoulders in a reassuring way. It's okay to cut loose every once in a while he told her, I like the side of you. 
She blushed again, T thank you she mumbled, then went back to training, eager to make the use of this gift. Naruto chuckled and went inside. As Sakura continued training, her inner self spoke up. Hot, strong, and chivalrous. She thought, it's official, I'm in love. Sakura ignored this, adamant that her heart belonged to her Ichiha teammate. Later, after dinner, dinner, as with every meal made by Tsunami, was delicious. While everyone was going to bed, Naruto volunteered to help the young mother clean the dishes. No, I couldn't let you do that, she said. Naruto shook his head, nonsense, after all the perfect meals you've served us, it's only right that I help you he told her. Tsunami blushed, do you really think my cooking is that good? She asked. Naruto nodded, your cooking could bring the devil himself to tears, Tsunami Haim. She blushed even more and let Naruto help her. As they scrubbed the dishes in the sink, Tsunami sighed, bringing up something she had wanted to do ever since he and his team had arrived. I'm sorry about Inari she told him, he's normally a sweet boy, but. But he's still mourning his father he finished. The boy hadn't spoken two words to him or any member of his team. He went out of his way to avoid them, even going so far as to eat all of his meals in his room. Whenever he saw any of them, he merely glared at them. His stepfather Tsunami corrected him, but yes. Naruto raised an eyebrow, the man who died, wasn't Inari's father? He asked. The blue-haired woman shook her head, no, Inari's biological father was a man I met at a bar a few years ago. We both had a few drinks, one thing led to another, and. She didn't bother to finish explaining and continued, when I told him I was pregnant, he left and I never saw him again she told him. I'm sorry Naruto said, bound to kill this man if he ever found him. Only scum could abandon a beautiful and kind woman like Tsunami and their own, unborn child. I'm not Tsunami said, surprising him, he may have abandoned me, but he gave me a wonderful son whom I love with all my heart. So the man Tazuna told us about was Inari's stepfather. He asked, deciding to change the subject, though he admired the woman's love for her son. Tsunami nodded, yes, Kaiza she told him. She then dried her hands and fetched a picture off a nearby table before handing it to him. It was a picture of Tsunami, Tazuna, a happy Inari, and a man that seemed oddly familiar to him. He was handsome and muscular. He had short spiky black hair and black eyes. He had a small white rope tied around his head which was tied on the right side of his head and a small X-shaped scar on his chin. He wore a black t-shirt that had a white outline and a white pair of pants. He also had scars on his arms. He saved Inari from drowning, a few years ago Tsunami continued, that's how we met him. He mostly came around to help Inari but. After a while, we fell in love and married she was nearly on the verge of tears, he was a good husband, a better father, and a true hero. Naruto's eyes suddenly widened. He remembered. He had met this man before, though not under the best of circumstances. Flashback, three years ago, a man was dying. He had been tortured seemingly unendingly. That's not what bothered him, however. It was that his friends and family had to watch it happen. His beloved wife and stepson. He hoped they could forgive him for this, for leaving them. He heard the midget tyrant shout to the crowd about something similar happening to them if they stood up to him. He wasn't listening though. The tyrant then turned and gave him an evil grin. The dying man then performed his last act. He smiled. The monster wanted to show the people a broken man. Instead, he was smiling, proving he was just as whole as he was when he was alive. He proved that the monster had failed, something that infuriated him. And then, he died. Ah, but that wasn't the end of the story. Suddenly, time froze, all the people stopped in mid-cryer wail. Even the drops of rain had frozen, mid-fall. The whole world was covered in an orange light. The only thing that moved was a hooded figure with a massive scythe. He walked up to the executioner's platform and approached the dead man. He then reached out and touched his forehead. Suddenly, the dead man was alive and uninjured, standing next to the hooded figure. He was confused. Until he looked down and saw his body, still bound and bloody. Uh, he said out loud, his voice echoing, that wasn't as painful as I thought it would be he remarked. The chuckle from the hooded figure gained his attention, getting to it might be painful, but death itself is easier than falling asleep. The man looked at the side-wielding figure. Are. Are you the Shinigami? He asked. The hooded figure laughed, no he answered, I just work for him. The Shinigami hires people. In a way the figure answered. After taking a moment to process this, he noticed that everything around them was frozen, including the tyrant that killed him. He was about to step towards him when the man with the scythe stopped him. Don't bother, he said, you're a soul without a body now. You can't interact with or harm him or anyone in any way. The man sighed, damn, he muttered, I just hope he gets what he deserves. As do I the figure told him, but that won't be today. What happens now? The man asked. I will help you move, the figure answered. The man was confused, move. Move where? He asked. On. You mean? To the afterlife? He asked. The figure nodded, yes. I send you to my master and he decides where you will end up, though, judging from your aura, I'd say you're destined for heaven. 
Well, that's a relief, the man said. Any advice for talking to the death god? He asked. Be polite, speak only when spoken to, say yes sir or no sir when asked a yes or no question, call him Death Sama or Shinigami Sama, and, above all, don't grovel. He hates that he advised. The man nodded before looking out at the frozen faces of his people. Will I ever see them again? He asked. The figure nodded, if they are good people. Then yes, you will, one day. The man looked out and saw the agonized looks of his wife and stepson, the people he loved most. After a few minutes of silence, he spoke again. I'm ready. The figure nodded and touched the man again, sending to his meeting with death himself. After he was gone, the figure removed his hood, revealing his spiky blonde hair and whisker-marked cheeks. Naruto Uzumaki sighed, this is never going to get any easier, is it? He asked no one. He then vanished, time resuming afterward. Flashback end, Naruto always had trouble taking good souls away, but it was a job all reapers had to perform. Kaiza's soul, however, had been more difficult than most. At least he felt better knowing that the hero of Wave was in a better place now. Naruto? Tsunami asked, are you alright? Naruto shook himself out of his daze and nodded, I'm fine he told her, I'm sorry for your loss he told the beautiful woman. Thank you. The two then finished cleaning the dishes, bid each other good night, and went to bed, with Naruto thinking of the past all the while. A few days later, at dinner, things were going well for Team 7. Sasuke had mastered tree climbing, Sakura's chakra reserves were much higher, and Naruto had a few new jutsu under his belt. Good thing too, because tomorrow would mark the fifth day since they arrived in Wave, with only two days after that until Zabuza was likely to return. The group was sitting with their hosts, with Inari glaring at them nearby, his mother having forced him to come down and eat with them. Currently, Naruto and Sakura were talking to Tsunami and Tazuna while laughing, while Sasuke brooded and Kakashi read his book, to the annoyance of every female at the table. Their dinner was about to come to an unpleasant close, however. Why are you trying so hard? The sound of Inari speaking surprised them. Ah, he speaks. Naruto said, causing Sakura to give him a look. Inari continued, Gato's just going to kill you all, so why are you even trying? He asked. Inari. Tsunami scolded. The boy ignored his mother and waited for an answer. Naruto responded, I'm trying so hard because no one else will, he explained, because I can't just sit back and watch innocent people die. But, most of all, because it's the right thing to do. So you're a hero then? Inari asked, still glaring. Naruto shrugged, I would never claim to be a hero, he told the boy, but you may think of me as such, if you wish. Heroes don't exist a boy snarled, standing up, they're just people who give you hope and then crush it, two bits he told them. Naruto tried to calm him, I know you've had it hard, Inari, but, and how would you know? He shouted, you don't know anything about suffering. The room suddenly became very quiet, and Naruto began leaking killing intent, causing the room to chill slightly. What did you say? The blonde asked, quietly and menacingly. Inari gulped, afraid, but spoke again, I said you don't know anything about suffering he told him, much quieter than before. Naruto stood up and began to walk towards the boy. I don't know anything about suffering. He said, his voice becoming dark, is that what you said? Naruto, I'm sure he didn't mean it, Kakashi said, trying, in vain, to stop what was coming. Oh, I think he did, Naruto responded, I think he meant every word. He then stood right in front of Inari, who backed up against the wall, trying to get away. Say that again he dared, one more time. Inari fear was now noticeable. Still being stubborn, he gulped again and said it one more time. You don't know anything about suffer. He never got to finish, as he soon found himself lifted off the ground by his shirt and slammed against the wall. How dare you? Naruto snarled. Tsunami tried to protect her son, but Kakashi stopped her, shaking his head. It is you who knows nothing of suffering. The blonde growled out, you have a loving mother and grandfather, well I grew up with nothing. He continued, you have a place to stay in three meals a day. I lived in a rundown apartment and had to fish through garbage cans for any half-rotten food I could find. You can walk down the streets of your hometown without fear of being attacked, I had to spend my entire childhood checking over my shoulder, waiting for the inevitable mob to chase me down and beat, stab, and burn me until I was barely breathing. This caused those who didn't know about Naruto's childhood to gasp in horror. Naruto paused for a moment before lifting his head up, revealing a large ugly scar across his throat, Sakura and Tsunami gasping in horror again. You see this scar? He asked, you want to know how I got it? He didn't wait for answer, four years ago he began, one of those mobs I told you about jazzed me down and began to torture me like they always did. Only this time something different happened. One of the members of the mob, a shinobi, impaled me with his sword to pin me to the ground he ignored more gasps and continued, he ranted on and on and on about his dead wife, somehow believing it was my fault she was dead. He calmed himself, he pulled out a knife and raked it across my throat he finished. This horrified most of those present. How could someone do something like that to a child? Do you know what it's like? 
the blonde asked, choking on your own blood. Feeling your life slip away as you bleed out. It's incredibly unpleasant he then moved his face closer to the terrified child, so don't you tell me I know nothing of suffering he told him, all who know hardship are given a choice, live on their knees or die on their feet. You haven't had to make that choice, you wretched little coward. He then scoffed, though, judging from your attitude, it's clear to me what choice you would make. He then dropped Inari, who ran up to his room as fast as he could. The blonde then turned and walked to the door to the outside, opening it. Don't follow me he told the others before heading outside, slamming the door behind him. After a few moments of silence, Tsunami spoke, was his childhood really like that? She asked. He gave us the heavily sugar-coated version, Kakashi answered sadly. Poor Naruto Sakura thought. She hadn't realized his life had been so hard. And she had made it worse by breaking his heart. She had to fix this, had to try and make him feel better. She stood up but stopped when Kakashi spoke. Don't, Sakura, he told her. What? Why? He needs to be alone right now he said, he'll probably want to blow off steam and you won't want to be there when he does. Sakura wanted to protest but realized that her sensei was right. She sat back down. Dinner was finished in absolute silence. The next morning, the beautiful young woman was humming a happy tune, walking through the forest with a basket in her hands. It was Haku, and she was wearing her civilian disguise. A pink sleeveless kimono with pale red edges and decorated with small plum-colored swirls that went to her ankles. Around her waist was a simple white obi tied in a bow, and she wore a pair of light brown sandals with dark straps. She also wore a dark-colored choker around his neck. Her hair was loose and fell to her lower back. She was currently searching for medicinal herbs to aid her master. While Zabuza was back on his feet, he was still sore from time to time, so she went out to find the herbs to make a soothing remedy. She continued through the forest until she came across a clearing that had been transformed into a warzone. She saw trees with massive scratch marks on them, some of which had been felled completely. Some areas were burned, and some were torn as though from a great windstorm. Haku was surprised by the amount of destruction around her and wondered what could have caused this. Until she saw a handsome, blonde-haired teen around her age slumped against a tree, unconscious. Her eyes widened as she recognized him. This was the man who defeated her master so easily and he was helpless. Now's my chance to remove him so he doesn't get in the way she thought, drawing and silently approaching him. She was close to killing him in his sleep, but hesitated. She had killed before, of course, even though she hated it, but for some reason, she couldn't bring herself to kill this man. She sighed, put her away and shook him awake. Wake up she said, it's not healthy to sleep out here, you might catch a cold. Naruto stirred and awakened, coming face to face with a beautiful, raven-haired goddess. Whoa, he thought. He then stood up and brushed himself off. Thank you for waking me up miss. Haku she told him, Hakuyuki she held out her hand. Instead of shaking it, Naruto grabbed and kissed the back of it tenderly, a pleasure to meet you Haku-chan, I'm Naruto Uzumaki he told her. Haku blushed and withdrew her hand, I I am also p pleased to meet you, Naruto-kun, but I'm actually a boy, she told him. Naruto surprised her by smirking, no, you're not he told her, you pheromones tell me you are a woman his smirk widened, one who is attracted to me. Haku blushed brightly and looked away. Don't be embarrassed he told her, if you had my enhanced senses, you would know that I am also giving off pheromones, indicating that I am attracted to you as well. You are very beautiful, Haku-chan. Haku blushed again and smiled, t thank you, and Naruto Kanshi stuttered out. She was used to men complimenting her and lusting after her, which was why she pretended to be male, but the way Naruto spoke to her was that of a gentleman. She found herself enjoying his praise. The blonde smiled kindly, you are most welcome he then noticed her basket, so, why are you out here? He asked. I'm collecting herbs to make medicine for someone close to me, she answered. Naruto gave her a grin, please don't break my heart and say it's for your boyfriend he said, clutching his heart in mock pain. Haku blushed again, and no she told him, it's for a friend. Naruto chuckled at her, and she responded by giving him an adorable pout. I'm sorry he apologized, let me make it up to you. Do you need any help? He asked. Haku thought for a moment before nodding, yes she told him, I could use help with finding the herbs I need. Naruto nodded, led the way, my dear he told her. Haku blushed once more and led him to a clearing where they began to pick the herbs she needed. So she began, eager to learn more about the man she would soon be fighting, you are a shinobi. She asked. He nodded, I am, he told her, of Kanahagakur. I assume you are here on a mission. Yep, can't talk about it though. Haku nodded and, after a few more moments of silence, she asked him something else. Do you have someone precious to you? She asked. Naruto was surprised by this question, but answered honestly. Yes, he told her, I have several people who are precious to me, he said, smiling as he thought of them, with Hinata and Kurama standing out more than the others. My friend is very precious to me she told him, I would die for him. I believe one can only become truly strong when they protect someone they care about. Would you die for your precious people? 
she asked. Naruto nodded, I would, he told her. She smiled, then I'm certain that you will become a truly great ninja, one day. Thank you, Haku-chan. Haku blushed, you're welcome, she replied. After a few more minutes, they gathered what they needed. Thank you for your help, Naruto-kun, she said, bowing. Naruto grinned and kissed the back of her hand once more, it was a privilege to help a goddess such as yourself, Haku-chan. Th thank you, and Naruto-kun she responded, her blush now atomic. I hope I get to see you again he told her. Haku nodded, I hope so too. Thank you again, and good luck to you on your mission. And, with that, she left, sadness apparent on her face, knowing she would have to fight him soon. Naruto turned and walked back towards the house. She seems. Nice Kurama grumbled, growing jealous of the attention Naruto had showered on the human girl. Naruto smirked, why, Kaiwu chan is that jealousy I hear in your voice? Kurama huffed, as if. She denied, I'm much hotter than she is. You are both gorgeous he told her, do you want me to come in and comfort you, my dear partner? He asked, suggestively. Kurama blushed and grinned, what kind of girl do you think I am? She asked. One who likes to have fun he answered, just remember, if you ever need to talk. Or you need me to do anything with, for, or to you, I'm always available he offered seductively. Kurama blushed brightly and smirked, maybe I'll take you up on that, handsome she told him, then became serious, you know that girl was. Zabuza's partner he interrupted, I know. Her scent and the way she moves are the same. You know you'll have to fight her, right? Naruto nodded sadly, yes and I'm not looking forward to it he told her. Suddenly, he heard movement above him and looked up, but saw nothing. He relaxed and kept walking, not noticing a group of eyes watching him from above. After a few more minutes of walking, he heard someone calling his name. Naruto. He heard Sakura voice shouting, where are you, you idiot. He soon ran into her. There you are. She said, exasperated, you were gone all night. We thought something bad had happened. Don't ever worry us like that again. She scolded. Sorry, Sakura Naruto told her, I just needed to blow off some steam and fell asleep after doing so. It won't happen again he promised. Sakura nodded. Then began to tear up. Now it was Naruto's turn to be worried, Sakura. Are you okay? He asked. Sakura suddenly leapt forward, embracing her surprised teammate. I'm sorry she told him, crying. For what? He asked, confused. You had such a hard life they told him, you were treated so horribly and. And I made it worse for you. I'm so sorry. Naruto understood what she meant and returned her embrace. Sakura, I forgave you a long time ago he assured her, I was angry at first, but I let go of my anger years ago. Besides, what happened to me wasn't your fault. Sakura looked up at him, her cheeks wet from her tears. So. You're not angry with me? She asked, hopeful. Naruto shook his head, of course not. Sakura smiled and embraced him once again, saying thank you. A winner Sakura cooed, that is so sweet. She then grinned in a perverted manner, now cop a feel. She ordered. Damn it, don't ruin this for me. Sakura told herself. Naruto, meanwhile, was enjoying the embrace. They weren't friends yet, but no straight man could press up against a beauty like Sakura and not enjoy it. They separated and smiled at each other. Then, Naruto heard something. Naruto? Sakura asked, noticing his change in mood, are you okay? He wasn't listening. He focused his enhanced hearing and heard what sounded like static. And the sound of something flying through the air. His eyes widened, get down. He shouted, tackling Sakura to the ground, barely avoiding the two, serrated and curved daggers that flew over them and embedded themselves in a nearby tree. Naruto quickly got to his feet and turned to face their attackers, bringing out Harvest. Fuck he cursed, death shrikes. Sakura stood up, also getting a look at the attackers. And they terrified her. There were five of them, one clinging to the side of a tree, another perched on a nearby branch, and the remaining three on the ground in front of them. They were about the size of a grown man, were hunched over, thin, covered in green scales, and reptilian in appearance. They had a prominent jaw and four, glowing red eyes, two on each side of their faces. They wore very little, only a strange kilt-like covering on their waists that left their legs exposed, similar to the kilt's guardian demons wear, and a thin sash around their torsos. They were growling, shrieking, and hissing at them, waving their daggers at them menacingly, except for the one in front, who had thrown his earlier. Imagine the sycophant enemies from Darksiders too, only without the wings and have red eyes instead of green. WWH what the hell are those things Sakura nearly shrieked. That shrikes Naruto told her, stay close to me, they'll pick us off if we split up. W what do they want? Our heads, Naruto answered. The five demons hissed. The one that had thrown its daggers channeled energy into its hands and its weapons reappeared in them. Then, all five of them vanished, with the sound of static following them. Sakura's eyes even more, where did they go? They teleported her blonde teammate told her, they prefer to attack foes with sneak attacks, just keep quiet. The two were silent. Naruto focused on his hearing, waiting for something. Then he heard it, the sound of static. 
he turned and raised his weapon just as Death Shrike appeared in front of him, its weapons raised to strike. Naruto blocked the attack and sent a kick that caught it in the gut, knocking it down and back a few feet. It landed on its back, growled at him, and vanished again. Sakura was amazed, it was as if he knew where it would appear. How did you do that? She asked. Death Shrikes make a distinctive sound when they teleport he told her, it sounds static and, if you focus your hearing, you can hear them a split second before they reappear. Another Death Shrike appeared behind him, targeting Sakura. They had no time to react as the demon prepared to strike. Luckily, Naruto stabbed the glaive end of his weapon behind him, avoiding his teammate and impaling the creature through the chest. The Death Shrike stared at Sakura, shock apparent on its reptilian features, before the glaive was yanked out of it and it fell to the ground, dead. The Kanoichi was surprised when the creature's body turned a crusted lava color before crumbling into dust that gave off the smell of sulfur. One down, Naruto said. Whereas he was fine, his teammate was terrified. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. She thought rapidly to herself, with her other half agreeing with her. Naruto noticed her fear, calm down he told her. Calm down. She whispered, we're fighting monsters that can teleport. How am I supposed to calm down? I told you before, focus on your hearing and you'll hear where they'll reappear. He then heard more static sounds as two more death shrikes appeared, one on each side of him, ready to strike. Naruto shifted Harvest into its arm blade form and pulled out the crucifix with his other hand. He blocked one strike with his blade and stopped another with a blast of holy energy, knocking the creature to the ground and stunning it. He quickly knocked the shrike he blocked with his blade back and impaled it with his arm blade before turning to the stunned one and stomping on its neck, breaking it. Both demons turned to dust soon after. Who left, he said. He then turned to block a dagger that had been thrown and deflected it, before turning to see another shrike, likely the same one that threw the weapon teleporting above him, ready to attack. Naruto thrust the crucifix at it, sending a cross-shaped blast of energy something he had learned to do a few days ago, knocking it out of the air and causing it to hit the ground in front of him. Naruto then focused holy energy on the helpless demon, incinerating it after a few seconds, with it shrieking in agony until then. And then there was one, the blonde said, getting ready for the last one to show itself. Sakura, meanwhile, was trying to calm herself and focused her hearing, pulling out a kunai. Okay she thought, okay, I can do this she told herself. She then heard the static sound and threw the kunai in the direction it came from without thinking. The last death shrike reappeared just in time to catch the kunai in its throat. The demon widened its four eyes, dropping its weapons and clutching its throat, gurgling and gagging on its own blood. Sakura's eyes widened in horror as the creature stumbled around, still gurgling. It fell to the ground in front of her and reached up to her. Before its arm dropped and it became still, dissolving soon afterward. Sakura took a few moments to take in the fact that she just killed someone something. And then collapsed to her hands and knees before vomiting. Naruto patted her back reassuringly, it's alright he told her, let it out. After she caught her breath, she said, I just. I just killed that thing. She said in shock, how? Why? Oh god. She whispered. You killed a demon, the blonde reaper told her, one that would have killed you if you hadn't stopped it. Sakura shook her head in denial. Naruto sighed, the first kill is never easy he told her, but being a ninja will involve taking lives. If you allow this to weigh you down, you'll never recover and grow strong enough to resist it. I can help you, if you let me. He then walked out in front of her and held out his hand. After a moment's hesitation, she took it and was pulled to her feet. Thank you she told him. I wouldn't thank you if I were you, he told her. He became confused, why? Because you just saw that demons are real he explained, looking sad, and I have to erase your memories of that fact he then stepped forward, his eyes glowing white, don't worry he told her, this won't hurt at all. Sakura backed up in worry. Wait, please don't. She begged, not doubting that he could erase her memories, I won't tell anyone, I swear. I can't take that risk, he told her. Please. I swear I won't say a word. I promise. Not even to the Hokage, Kakashi Sensei, or my mom. Her eyes became pleading, please. Please trust me. She begged. Naruto stared at her for several long moments, considering. Then, his eyes returned to normal. All right, he said, but if you break your promise, more powerful beings than I will hunt you down, got it. Sakura nodded heavily, thank you, I swear I won't utter a single syllable she vowed. Good, Naruto said, before putting away his weapons. He then began to collect the daggers before sealing them away in a scroll. Why did you do that? Sakura asked, confused, as Naruto handed her back her kunai. I'm collecting them for a friend he answered cryptically, now, let's head back to the house. They nodded, and the two set off. Tomorrow, they would have to face a vengeful missing nin. And a person Naruto considered a friend, even though he just met her. Still, he couldn't help wondering who sent the death shrikes. One thing was certain, something else was afoot. Chapter 7. The Battle on the Bridge Part 1. The day was the day. The day when Zabuza was expected to return along with his accomplice. 
Three out of the four members of Team 7 were up and eating breakfast. Where's the dope? Sasuke asked. Still sleeping, Kakashi answered, he really wore himself out training yesterday. At least he came back to the house this time, Sakura said, with her sensei nodding in agreement. After a few more moments of silence, Sasuke spoke again. So he began, today's the days of Yuza comes back, right? He asked. Kakashi nodded, possibly he told the Ichiha heir, his injuries could have been worse than we thought. Still, we should all head to the bridge with Tizuna, just in case. After breakfast, the three prepared to head out with their client. What about Naruto? Sakura asked. Let him rest Kakashi said, he'll catch up soon enough. And, so, they headed out, certain that they were ready to face whatever awaited them. How wrong they were. The bridge, shortly afterward, the group arrived at the bridge, only to find that all the workers were unconscious, sticking out of them. What happened to them? Tazuna asked, nervous. Kakashi knelt down, studying the wounds on one of the unconscious men. The same thing that happened to Zabuza he answered. Suddenly, the fog that was present almost every day thickened by a substantial amount. They're here, Sasuke said, trembling with excitement. Well, well the voice of Zabuza Mamachi was heard, coming from within the fog, Kakashi and his brats. We will meet again. Then, the man himself emerged from the mist, his blade ready at the ready. His accomplice followed right behind him, standing by his side, her masked eyes boring into them. Where's Blondie? The swordsman asked, don't tell me we scared him off. He decided to take a break Kakashi told him, he figured you could use the advantage, considering how easily he beat you last time he taunted. Zabuza's eyes narrowed. He then turned to Haku and nodded. The masked Kinoichi nodded back and pulled out some. Kakashi, meanwhile, turned to his team. Sakura, stay close to Tazuna, keep him safe. She nodded and pulled out a kunai, ready to protect the old architect. Sasuke, the silver-haired continued, engage Zabuza's partner, I've got the man himself. The Ichiha gave a cocky smirk, ready to show off his strength, and faced off against Haku. This is it Zabuza said, this is where we decide who is the strongest ninja and who has the better team he then grinned wickedly, my money's on mine. I'm not a betting man, Kakashi responded, revealing his Sharingan, but if I were. I'd take that bet. Zabuza's grin widened, and he and Kakashi charged each other, locking weapons. You should give up, Sasuke told his opponent arrogantly, you're no match for me. Haku narrowed her eyes behind her mask, I saw your team when you fought Zabuza Sama she informed him, I saw how afraid you were. Sasuke growled in anger, that was then, this is now. Then show me how you've changed, she replied. The two were still for a moment, then charged. Back at Tazuna's house, Naruto was having a pleasant dream. The details of which he would never share with anyone, but let's just say that Hinata, Kurama, Ino, Tsunami, Haku, and Sakura were in it. And wearing very little. Now, Naruto was by no means a lecher or a pervert, not to the extent of a certain toad sage, anyway, but no hot-blooded straight male like himself could spend most of his time around several gorgeous women and not have the occasional fantasy. He awoke from this dream when he heard a scream. Downstairs, Tsunami was being cornered by two menacing men. One had light skin with bluish white hair and black eyes. He had lined markings tattooed under his eyes and wore a dark purple hat on his head and a blue jacket with multiple pockets. The second one had a darker skin tone and had an intricate tattoo that seemingly stretched across his entire left side and left right inner thigh, as well as a stitched scar on the left side of his forehead and on the left side of his mouth. He had brown hair which was parted in three, finishing in an elaborate topknot. He wore what seemed to be a loose-fitting kimono, the top half of which fell around his waist, leaving his upper body exposed. He also wore bandages wrapped around his waist, simple sandals, and an eye patch over his right eye. Both men were holding swords. This was Zori and Wiraji, respectively. Gato's bodyguards, the latter of which was holding Inari by the hair. Hum along quietly bitch Zori told the single mother, you don't want us to have to get rough with your boy now, do you? W what do you want? Tsunami demanded. Our boss wants to send your old man a message Wiraji told her, and he needs one of you to do it. We don't care which Sori told her, if one of you refuses, we'll kill that one and drag the other to the boss. Wait. Tsunami cried out, if you kill my son, I'll bite my tongue off and drown in my own blood, then you'll have no one. She threatened, let him go and I'll come quietly. The two thugs shared a glance before nodding. Wiraji then shoved Inari away, the boy falling to the floor. Be thankful you have such a good mom Kitty said, before he grabbed Tsunami and began dragging her outside. Mom? Inari shouted, terrified of what might happen to her. Tsunami gave him as reassuring a smile as she could. Don't worry honey she told him, mommy will be alright. Inari could only watch as his mother was dragged away, outside of the house. He was helpless. Just like with his stepfather. Naruto was right, he was nothing but a coward. At that moment, something inside him welled up, something he didn't think he still had. Courage. No. He shouted, running outside to face the two thugs who had his mother. 
The two thugs turned in surprise when they heard the shout and saw the boy. I won't let you take my mom. Inari yelled, then did what most would consider either brave, suicidal, or both. He charged them. He had no idea what he was going to do once he reached them and knew that he would likely die. He didn't care. He was tired of living a life of fear. He needed to save his mother. Zori scoffed at the boy's attempt and raised his blade to cut him down. Tsunami screamed when she saw him swing his blade downward. The blade never struck its target. Because someone caught the arm that held it, mid-swing. Zori looked to his left and saw one Naruto Uzumaki holding his arm in a vice grip, glaring at him. That's not nice he said, then used his enhanced strength to hurl the man into the nearby woods, hearing the satisfying sound of a body hitting something solid. He then turned his menacing gaze to the other thug. Baraji pulled Tsunami closer to him and held his blade to her throat. Back off. He ordered, afraid, or I'll kill this bitch. Naruto scoffed and then vanished, appearing behind the man and jabbing him at the base of the spine with his elbow. Baraji couldn't even cry out in pain. He dropped his sword and released Tsunami. Before he could recover, Naruto wrapped him in a chokehold. You shouldn't have called Tsunami-chan a bitch he whispered, then continued, when you get to hell, tell them Naruto Uzumaki sent you, you'll make a lot of new friends. He then snapped the thug's neck, killing him. The blonde looked down on the corpse with utter contempt. He then looked up and saw Tsunami and Inari tearfully embracing, happy to be alive and together. Naruto approached them. Tsunami saw him coming and ran to embrace him. Thank you. She cried, thank you so much. She told him. Naruto returned the beautiful woman's embrace. That's what I do, Tsunami-chan, he told her. The two separated and Naruto turned to Inari. The boy looked afraid. But relaxed when Naruto smiled at him. You did well, Inari, he told him. You were ready to die on your feet to save someone you love, rather than live on your knees. You proved me wrong, you're no coward. Inari gave him a smile and said thank you. Naruto then heard a groan of pain with his enhanced hearing, coming from the woods. Wait here, he told them. He then vanished, leaving a confused mother and son behind. Naruto reappeared in front of Zori, who was struggling to crawl away. Clearly, he broke both his legs when he hit the tree. The speed of his crawling increased and his eyes widened in terror when he saw the blonde. The reaper stomped down, hard, on the thug's spine, stopping him and causing him to cry out in agony. Your friend is dead, Naruto told him, I snapped his neck. Your death will be significantly more painful, he promised. Wait, wait. He pleaded, I know things. About Gato. I can tell you, just don't kill me. You'll tell me soon enough, Naruto told him. He then pulled out Harvest and stabbed downward, impaling him through the chest. He then twisted the blade, causing him even more pain before he died. The blonde reaper ripped out his scythe and holstered it. He flipped the corpse over and knelt down next to it. I hate doing this he thought, before channeling reaper energy into one of his hands. He then placed that hand on the body's sternum. A wave of energy flowed through Zori's corpse. Life returned to his eyes. And he gasped. The man once said that dead men tell no tales. But the person who said that clearly never met a reaper. Not only are these elite warriors servants of death, they also have a limited access to the entity's power and, thus, a small amount of control over life and death. Using this power, a reaper can bring the recently deceased back to life, so long as they keep channeling their power into them. The corpse this power is used on can't move, but they can speak. This is useful for when the reaper needs information. Zori's eyes flicked around in shock and fear, trying to make sense of what was happening. His body was twitching. What's? How? The thug gasped out, extending the S in what's he sounded as though he had trouble speaking. Naruto, realizing that his victim was struggling to speak because he was still mostly dead, focused his power more, stabilizing him. Listen to me very carefully the blonde told him, you're dead, but I'm using my powers to keep you on this side of the abyss he explained, and you're going to tell me what I want to know about Gato. I it. Pain. Zori said, becoming more decipherable. You're being torn between life and death Naruto told him, your body and soul find this. Disagreeable he explained, this pain will only get worse the longer I keep it going, so I'd start talking if I were you. Let's start with your name and your place in Gato's organization. I am. Zori the corpse said, having to say each word individually, pain clear in his voice, I serve. As. Gato's. Bodyguard. Naruto could have used his power to ease his pain, but hated thugs like him and decided to let him suffer. Why did you come here? He asked. Beto. Once. To. Send. The. Old. Man. A message he explained, he. Wanted. Us. To. Bring. Him. His. Daughter. Or. Her. Brat. He. Wanted. To. Make. An. Example. Why? Naruto asked, he's already hired Zabuza to kill him. He. Doesn't. Trust. Him. To. Finish. The. Jobs or he told him, he. Wants. A back. Up. Plan. In. Case. 
He. Fails. Again. And how does Ibuza feel about this? He. Doesn't. No. Naruto considered this for a moment before asking another question. Does Gato plan to betray Zabuza? I don't. No. He said, all. I know. Is. That. Zabuza. And. His. Bitch. Plan. To. Attack. The. Old. Man. Today. Naruto growled at hearing him call Haku a bitch, fine he said, enjoy the inferno. He then lifted his hand up, releasing Zori from his state of life death and returned to being an ordinary corpse once more. Naruto knew he had to hurry, his team was in danger. Maybe he could convince Haku not to fight. He quickly formed three shadow clones. Go back to Tazuna's house he ordered, guard Tsunami-chan and Inari. Protect them at all costs. The clones nodded and rushed to complete their orders. Naruto, meanwhile, moved as quickly as he could to the bridge, hoping he wasn't too late. On the bridge, as Kakashi fights Ibuza, he found that the missing nin had learned a few tricks since last they met. The former Seven Swordsman member knew Kakashi Sharingan gave him an advantage, it allowed him to follow his moves and even copy and counter them. But only if he could see his hand signs and kept eye contact. To counter this, Zabuza increased his hiding and miss technique to a substantial degree, ensuring Kakashi could only see him if he was standing right in front of him, ensuring Kakashi couldn't copy his moves since he couldn't see them. To ensure he didn't make eye contact, Zabuza employed a highly advanced and original tactic. He kept his eyes closed. Normally, this would hinder a shinobi or kanoichi, but Zabuza was different. Being a master of silent killing, Zabuza was used to killing targets when visibility was extremely limited. Because of this, the swordsman had learned to adapt to not being able to see his prey and used his other senses. The end result of these two strategies. Kakashi was fighting a foe he couldn't see or copy. Sometimes, he wished Tobito had been a Hyuga instead of an Acha. Still, he had been able to avoid Zabuza's more lethal strikes. Sasuke, on the other hand, was having far less luck. Aku was far faster than he had predicted, avoiding all of his strikes while landing many of her own, using her ability to form out of water. The young woman had used this to turn Sasuke into a living pincushion, and it made him furious. Things briefly changed after he unlocked his Sharingan earlier in the fight. His reflexes increased greatly, and he was actually able to dodge some of her attacks. Until Haku increased her speed. Soon after this, the fight once again turned in her favor. This is impossible. He thought in anger, I have my Sharingan. I should be able to dodge her. This fight should be easy. How is this possible? He winced as he failed to dodge another strike, and a few more embedded themselves in his body. You should surrender, Haku told him calmly, I do not like killing, but I will do so if I have to. Sasuke growled and lunged at her. She dodged and kicked him in the chest, knocking him back a few feet. You cannot defeat me she reasoned, please surrender. I do not wish to kill you she told him. Shut up. Sasuke shouted, the hits to his pride causing him to snap, I won't lose to a worthless whore like you. He stood up shakily, I will beat you and when I do, I'll have you dragged back to Kanoha so that I can use you to restore my clan. Aku's eyes narrowed in anger and disgust. She responded to his threats and insults by throwing more, hitting the spoiled Ichiha in certain places that would paralyze him. He fell to the ground, unable to move. I would sooner slit my own throat than allow a disgusting arrogant, weakling like you to touch me she told him darkly. I would never let him do that to you, a new voice told her. Alu looked up and saw Naruto emerge from the fog, stopping next to his immobile teammate. He summoned a shadow clone and had to take Sasuke to Sakura so that she could help heal him. The blonde then looked up at Haku, sadness visible in his eyes. I hoped it wouldn't come to this. Haku-chan, he told her. The raven-haired girl's eyes widened. You? You knew? She asked. Naruto nodded. When did you find out? The moment we met the blonde told her, I noticed that your scent and the way you move was the same as the hunter nin that helped fake Zabuza's death. The two stared at each other for a few moments before Haku spoke. I, I don't want to fight you, Naruto Kunshi told him, honestly, but I don't have a choice. There is always a choice. Naruto told her, you can come with me back to Kanoha. I'm the last surviving member of my clan, I can offer you sanctuary and protect you. He looked into her masked eyes, pleading, please. Don't make me hurt you, he begged. Haku shook her head, I can't, she told him, her mask hiding her eyes, which were beginning to tear up. I made an oath to Zabuza Sama. I promised to serve and protect him until the day I die she then got into a stance, I'm sorry. Haku hated this. She had only met him once, but she felt as though she had a connection with the handsome blonde. A part of her wanted to accept his offer, to go with him. But Zabuza had saved her life, raised her, and had given her purpose. She couldn't betray him. After a moment of hesitation, Naruto got into a stance of his own. So am I. The two stared each other down. And then attacked. Haku launched at her friend foe, who surprised her by dodging them. He closed the distance between them and threw a punch. 
A young woman dodged it and aimed a kick at his gut, only for him to block it. He threw another punch which she also blocked. The two pushed against each other. Until Naruto headbutted her, cracking her mask and causing her to stumble back. Naruto then followed up with a powerful kick to her chest, which sent her flying back. Haku landed on her back and was completely motionless. Then her body dissolved into water. Water clone Naruto thought. He then sensed something behind him and turned just in time to see Haku throw more at him. He dodged most of them but caught a couple in the shoulder. Naruto grunted in pain and quickly yanked the needles out. He noticed that his wounds were cold and so were the needles. He looked at them and saw them begin to melt in his warm hands. Ice? He asked. The masked beauty nodded, my bloodline she explained. Naruto smiled, beautiful, strong, and full of surprises he said, you continue to amaze, Haku-chan. Haku blushed behind her mask, thank you, Naruto-kun she told him, shall we continue? Naruto nodded, if you wish. The two then vanished, clashing against each other repeatedly at high speeds. Meanwhile, Zabuza and Kakashi were locking blades again when they noticed a new, yet familiar chakra source. Looks like Naruto's here, Kakashi said, pleased. Zabuza grinned, he should have stayed away he told his foe, he doesn't stand a chance against Haku. Kakashi frowned, he beat you, didn't he? The swordsman ignored the jab at his pride, Haku's strong he told him, stronger than me. Kakashi was surprised by this admission. Once she gets going, even I can't stop her he then grinned again, so your boy is as good as dead. Kakashi narrows his eyes, we'll see. They then continued their fight. Back with Naruto and Haku, the young woman managed to knock her opponent back and then made hand signs. Water release. Cold sky water attack. She shouted. She then spat out several large icy projectiles at the blonde, each one moving at high speeds. The projectiles slammed into him and, to her horror, pierced holes through him. She then watched as her opponent vanished in a puff of smoke, indicating that it was a shadow clone she hit. Water release. Wild water wave. Haku turned and saw a wave of water rush towards her. She cried out in surprise as the wave knocked her off her feet and slammed her into the railing of the incomplete bridge. She groaned in pain as she used the railing to pull herself up. Naruto moved over to her, hoping she was alright. She suddenly turned to face him, her hand held out. Water release. Water bowl. She shouted. A continuous jet of water hit him and sent him flying, knocking him down onto his back. She's good, Kurama noted. Naruto nodded, she is he then smiled, I think I'm in love. The redhead rolled her eyes and scoffed. Naruto noticed this, don't worry, Kuraheim he told her, you'll always have a special place in my heart. And my bed, if you wish he said, suggestively. Kurama blushed, tempted, and rolled her eyes, perv. Naruto then saw Haku leap into the air above him, forming a sword made of ice in her hands, ready to impale him with it. He rolled to the side, dodging the blade as it slammed into the ground. He then pulled out Harvest in its armblade form. They each blocked and dodged several of each other's attacks for the next few minutes. Naruto then struck her blade hard enough to shatter it, also landing a scratch on her mask. He then sent out a kick that struck her in the face, damaging her mask more and sending her flying back. Haku struggled for a moment before managing to stand up. Haku-chan, please surrender, Naruto begged. She formed more hand signs. Thousand flying water needles of death. She shouted. Long needles began to form from the water on the ground and in the air. True to her words, there were a thousand of them, at least. The needles then flew straight towards him. Knowing he couldn't dodge or absorb all of them, he formed a different set of hand signs. Dark release. Hunger. The wave of dark release chakra was launched from his hands. Aku watched in shock as the wave disintegrated the needle she launched. Naruto then thrust his hands outward, sending a wave of dark release energy at Haku, blasting her back and causing her to skip across the bridge, painfully, before she stopped. The blonde hated hurting Haku, but was pleased that the technique worked. Dark release. Hunger was created to absorb the chakra of solid jutsu, like earth or ice, instead of energy, like fire and water. Any jutsu of this sort that was hit by this technique was disintegrated, the chakra used in it then absorbed into the user. The user could then use that energy to unleash a blast wave that could send the foe flying, which also absorbed chakra from the foe. He made his way over to Haku, watching her get, shakily, to her feet. Haku-chan. Please he begged again. The raven-haired girl looked up at him. Amazingly, Naruto had been able to counter every move she made. If this continued, the risk of her losing was high. There was only one technique she had left. It would ensure her victory. But could she use it against a friend? She steeled herself. She had no choice. I'm sorry, she told him. She then formed a hand sign. Naruto suddenly found himself surrounded by several large squares made of ice. They were all around him, even above. Haku then stepped towards a mirror and surprised her opponent by walking through it. She then appeared within every square. This is the end she told him sadly, my ultimate technique, demonic mirroring ice crystal she explained, no one has ever been able to escape. Please forgive me. Naruto gasped as he was hit by. 
I didn't see them. He thought in shock, they moved faster than I could see. Naruto launched Harvest outward in its spear form and watched as it collided with a mirror. And bounced off, only cracking it slightly. These mirrors are nearly unbreakable, she said, hitting Naruto with more, causing him to grunt in pain, I can move between them at near light speed, fast enough that I can appear in all of them simultaneously. Naruto made more hand signs, fire release. Phoenix Age Fire Technique. The blonde spewed multiple fireballs that were launched in every direction, exploding against the mirrors. The dust and ash that was kicked up obscured his view, making him wonder if he had succeeded. His answer came in the form of several piercing his body, causing him to cry out in pain and fall to one knee. It's no use Haku told him sadly, my chakra has been infused with the mirrors. You cannot break them. Naruto attempted to strike again, only for him to be forced to his knees by more. Please surrender, Naruto-kun Haku pleaded, I do not wish to hurt you anymore. Her mirrors are unbreakable. How am I supposed to win this? Naruto thought, before then realizing something, wait, if her mirrors are reinforced by her chakra, I could shatter them if I could absorb the chakra from them. He thought, but she'll see any attack I send out and hit me with more before I can get launched. Unless, there was one dark release technique he had learned that could win this for him. He hadn't mastered it yet, but if it worked. He started forming more hand signs, I only have one shot at this he thought, if I mess this up, I'm done for. Dark release. Devouring shroud. Before Haku could react, a pitch black cloud of dark release chakra flooded the small cage she had created, obstructing her view in seconds. Her eyes widened. She launched more, but didn't hear any cry of pain. She missed. Naruto meanwhile, was granted a brief moment of respite. Haku still had her speed advantage, but without the ability to see him, her powers were limited. But he thought, now I just have to hope she doesn't hit me until enough of her chakra is drained. One of the advantages of being in Yuzumaki was not only did they have large chakra capacities, but also had an affinity for sensing chakra. Naruto had inherited this and was able to detect Haku, even through the pitch black cloud, ensuring he could tell when she was going to attack. Now, it was just a matter of dodging those attacks. Not an easy task. Haku, meanwhile, kept launching from multiple directions, but had no idea if she was hitting him or not. She was hitting him occasionally, but he was able to keep quiet to keep her guessing. After several minutes of this the longest of Naruto's life, Haku was starting to panic. Where is he? She thought, am I even hitting him? What is he planning? She tossed more ice and was becoming winded. Wait, winded. She hadn't struggled to keep this technique up this long before. She then concentrated, trying to find out why this was the case. Her eyes then widened behind her mask. My chakra. She thought, it's being absorbed. It wasn't just her chakra that was being absorbed, but also the chakra within her mirrors. If this kept up. She then prepared as many as she could. If she didn't end this soon, he would be able to shatter her mirrors. Naruto sensed what was coming and with a mental oh shit he moved. Aku sent out a storm of ice. Thousands upon thousands of needles rained down from every direction. After almost 30 seconds of this, Haku had to stop. Creating so many of her frozen projectiles was taxing. Did I get him? Unbeknownst to her, she hand. It should have been impossible to dodge them, but Naruto managed to do so by getting as close to the gaps in the mirror as possible, then turning sideways and sucking in as much air as he could to make himself as thin as possible. He ended up scratched, but alive. Holy shit that was close. Naruto thought. He then noted that the chakra in the mirrors had weakened considerably since he launched his cloud of dark chakra. Unfortunately, Haku heard his sigh of relief and launched more at him, hurting him badly. Damn it, I can't afford to take another hit like that. He thought, I can't wait any longer, I need to shatter those mirrors now. Praying that the mirrors were weak enough, he formed the same hand signs he did to try to shatter the mirrors the first time. High release. Phoenix Age Fire Technique. Haku heard this and her eyes widened. No. She thought, if that attack hits, my mirrors will shatter. She launched as much ice as she could at the sound of her opponent's voice. Unfortunately, Naruto had already managed to launch his attack a split second before Haku could throw her. The fireballs were launched just as he had been hit by them, but they did the job he hoped they would do. The fiery projectiles smashed into the ice mirrors, shattering them and blasting Haku away. As this happened, Zabuza heard the explosions and suddenly felt Haku's chakra drop. His eyes widened, impossible he murmured, he couldn't have. Told you he was stronger than you thought Kakashi told him, looks like their battle is finished. And ours will be too, soon enough. Back with Naruto, the blonde was lying on the ground, wounded. He groaned in pain. The last to hit him had made moving difficult. Hirama. He thought, little help. A second later, Naruto felt his partner's chakra flow through him, and, within moments, he was able to move again. Thanks. You're welcome, she told him. The blonde was able to stand up, shakily. Haku's attacks were designed to damage her target's muscular system, inhibiting movement and rendering them helpless. Luckily, this kind of damage was something Kurama was able to fix quickly. 
Hearing a groan of pain, Naruto turned and walked towards it. He moved through the fog and found Haku. She was struggling to stand, panting. She was only able to get to her knees. Her mask had been broken completely. The small bits that remained fell away, exposing her beautiful face. She looked up at him, sadness apparent in her eyes. Naruto stopped when he was standing in front of her. It's over, Haku-chan, he told her. Haku looked downward and was silent. After several more minutes of silence, she spoke. Heal me, she begged. Naruto's eyes widened, what? Heal me, she repeated, looking up at him with devastated eyes, please. The blonde was shocked that she was even considering this. Why? I failed, she told him, I've never failed Zabuza-sama before. I can't live with this shame. End it, please. I can't, Naruto told her, I could never do that to you. You must. She cried, surprising him, I failed. I am Zabuza-sama's tool. His weapon. She told him, he has no use for a broken tool. How can you think that? Naruto asked, horrified, how can you think so little of yourself? It is who I am. Why are you so devoted to him? He asked, what did he do for you to make you so loyal to him? He saved me, she answered, he gave me purpose. Naruto was confused. Haku looked down and decided to tell him. I was born in water country she began after a few moments hesitation, my family didn't have much, but we were happy. My parents were in love and I was a happy little girl. Judging from her pause, something had happened to change this. One day, the Yande Mizukage went mad and had ordered a purge of all people who had Genkai she continued, he blamed them for every war that ever occurred and claimed that, by killing them all, conflict would cease to be. Naruto knew of this purge. The Reaper Corps kept close tabs on every conflict and war that took place on Earth. Such events were good camouflage for demons and other supernatural creatures to wreak havoc on the world. Many in the Corps felt for the Bloodline users and wanted to help them, but couldn't as their oath prevented them from intervening. It didn't seem to matter to my family Haku continued, we were just ordinary people, trying to live a normal life she took a breath, but one day, everything changed. Your ice powers manifested, Naruto guessed. Haku nodded, her eyes beginning to tear up. One day, I found that I could create and control ice, she explained, I used this power to make tiny ice sculptures. When I showed my mother, I thought she would be amazed. But she pulled me away and told me to never use powers again. I didn't understand why she told him, I thought I was special, that my parents would be proud of me. But my mother was terrified she continued, I later realized that my mother also had my bloodline and she was the one I inherited it from. Tears then began to fall from her eyes. I also learned my father was a supporter of the Mizukid she said, and he saw what I did. Naruto's eyes widened in horror. At night he. He gathered some of our neighbors and. And they killed my mother. She wept, she begged him not to. She told him she loved him. And he killed her anyway. Then. Then they turned to me she told him, I saw him raise his weapon, ready to kill me. I saw the tears pour from his eyes and the next thing I knew. They were all dead. My bloodline saved me. My god. Naruto thought, horrified. How could a man kill his own family like that? What monster would put his fanatical devotion before his own wife and child? Hirama was also shocked by this. Even after over a thousand years of life, the depths of human cruelty and depravity still surprised her. Aku continued, I was alone for a while after that. I just moved from place to place, trying to survive her eyes then showed fondness, and that's when Zabuza found me. He saved me. He took me in, fed me, trained me, raised me she told him, he gave me a purpose. I would be his weapon, his tool she explained, all these years, I've never failed him. I always completed whatever mission he gave me. Until now. She looked up at Naruto, I can't live with this, she explained, I can't face him, knowing I failed. Her expression became pleading, please, Naruto-kun, I'm begging you, as a friend. Kill me. Naruto could only stare at her with pity in his eyes. He understood her pain. To be alone, helpless, hopeless. He understood that. That had been his life for years. But that changed the night he died. The Reaper Corps took him in, trained him and made him stronger. They became his family just as his precious people in Kanoha had. Zabuza had been like that for Haku. He had been her Reaper Corps. I can't, Haku-chan he told her, I can't do that. Killing you would haunt me forever. Haku was about to plead again, but Naruto stopped her. But it doesn't have to be this way he told her, maybe. Maybe we could convince Zabuza to join Kanoha he told her, I can ask the Hokage to grant you both sanctuary. Haku's eyes widened. Would you? Would you really do that for us? She asked. I would, the blonde told her, but I don't know if Zabuza would agree. Haku thought for a moment. Zabuza had sometimes told her that he was tired of having to look over his shoulder. That he wished he could settle down somewhere. But this. Would he agree? He might Haku told him, but I'm not sure. If it can end this peacefully, it's worth a shot, he told her. He then held out his hand to her. Haku considered for a moment then took it, allowing him to help her to her feet. 
She stumbled forward and had to hold on to her friend tightly to steady herself. She realized she was very close to him and blushed, pulling away. Naruto, noticing this, grinned and was about to say something cheeky when the two heard something. It was a bizarre sound, like hundreds of birds taking flight at once. Whatever it was, it was giving off an enormous amount of chakra. Focusing his sensory abilities, Naruto was able to determine that it was coming from Kakashi. Clearly, it was some kind of jutsu and a lethal one, judging from the amount of chakra being used in its creation. Despite this, Zabuza wasn't moving. Why would he just stay still for an attack of this scale? The only logical answer was that he was somehow rendered immobile. Then, Kakashi's chakra signature moved towards Zabuza with incredible speed. Knowing what was about to happen, Haku moved as quickly as she could towards her most precious person. And Naruto, knowing what she was about to do, ran after her. Minutes earlier, after gaining and holding an advantage for much of the fight, Zabuza's fortune had finally turned. He was able to wound Kakashi several times during the fight, but this was his plan from the beginning. The copycat ninja proved he had more than just a Sharingan eye at his disposal. He couldn't see Zabuza in the mist, but he had allies who could find him for him. His nin dogs. The summoned canines had used their sense of smell to track Kakashi's blood on Zabuza and had tunneled through the ground beneath him. They had sprung up and bit down with their teeth, pinning him in place. That was when Kakashi coated his arm in electricity. This is the end Zabuza the silver-haired cyclops told him, this is my sole original technique, the Rikiri. He then charged forwards with lightning speed, ready to impale him with his lightning-coated forearm. Damn it. I can't move. I can't dodge it. The missing Nin could only stare in horror and struggle in vain as his foe drew closer. This was it. This is how it would end. He survived the wrath of the mad Mizukage, only to die here. Suddenly, his vision was obstructed by someone appearing in front of him. Someone familiar. Haku no. Kakashi saw the young woman appear in front of him and cursed internally. Damn it, I can't stop. Kakashi thought. Hirakiri was a powerful jutsu, but one with many drawbacks, one of which was that the user couldn't stop once they rushed forward. They didn't want to kill Haku, but knew he couldn't stop. So he did the only thing he could, he moved his arm upward. Instead of impaling her through the heart, he got her through the shoulder. Haku gasped as the attack pierced her shoulder. Naruto appeared just as Kakashi removed his arm. Haku? He cried. The blonde watched in horror as the raven-haired girl fell to the ground, blood pouring from her wound. Naruto rushed to her side and cradled her head. Stay with me, Haku. He told her, stay with me. You're going to be alright. Haku began to gasp quickly, her eyes dilating and her pulse becoming sporadic. She's going into shock Naruto realized, Kurama, any ideas? My chakra could heal her the red-headed woman told him, but I'd need someone to administer medical jutsu while I did so, otherwise it might kill her. Fuck. I don't know any medical jutsu. He swore. He then saw Sakura and Tazuna, with an unconscious, wounded but healing Sasuke nearby, staring at them with shock and confusion. Sakura. Sakura, get over here. He told them. The young woman was shocked, but did as he said. I need your help healing her. He told his teammate, once she was near. Sakura's eyes widened, what? She asked in shock, Naruto I can heal cuts and small punctures, but this. I can't fix a hole in someone's shoulder. Not alone you can't Naruto told her, that's why I'm here. Start using your medical jutsu now, before she bleeds out. But, just do it. Sakura hesitated for a moment, but then placed her hands on Haku's wound. Her hands then began to glow green. The flesh slowly began to stitch back together, but it was clear that the wasn't skilled enough for a wound of this size. That's when Naruto came in. He placed his hands on Haku's wound as well and began channeling a strange red chakra into it. The others aside from Haku saw this chakra and were confused, except for Kakashi. The silver-haired eyes widened in surprise. That chakra he thought, that's the fox's. After several moments, the large wound began to close and, after a few minutes, was completely healed. Haku's breathing began to slow, Kurama's chakra soothing her, stopping her from going into shock. Naruto and Sakura removed their hands, both panting and exhausted. She's okay, Naruto said, relief clear in his voice. He then turned to his teammate, thank Sakura. You're welcome, she responded, panting. You too, Kaiu chan. No problem. You saved her. Everyone looked towards Zabuza when he spoke, amazement clear in his tone. She was your enemy. And you saved her, he said, astonished. The swordsman stared at Haku, who was becoming lucid again, before looking up at Kakashi. Let me go, Haddock, he told him, our fight's over. I concede. This surprised everyone else, to say the least. What? Kakashi asked, unable to form any other words. Your student saved that which I value above all other things he told that, the closest thing I have to family he looked down at Haku, I won't fight someone who saved Haku's life, or their allies. Zabuza sama. Haku whispered, incredibly touched, but. What about Gato? She asked. 
The missing nin shrugged as best he could with his arms weighed down, if Gato wants the old man dead, he can find someone else to do it. I'm done. Several moments passed as the group thought on what was said. Finally, Kakashi signaled his summons to release Abusa. They did so and vanished in puffs of smoke. So Sakura said, it's over. Just like that. Just like that, Zabuza told her. There was a feeling of relief throughout the group. Which was soon shattered by the sound of a slow clap. The group turned and saw none other than the tiny tyrant, Gato at the other end of the bridge clapping, though it was made difficult because of the sling his arm was in. Bravo, bravo he told them, what a truly movie-worthy moment, the demon has a heart after all. Beto Zabuza growled out, what are you doing here, runt? I came to see if you finally grew the balls to finish our contract he explained, then sought Izuna, and since the old bridge builder is still alive, I can see that your reputation is more exaggerated than truth he then smirked, I figured as much. That's why I brought these guys. Emerging from the mist, behind Gato, was an army of mercenaries, none of them ninja, thankfully, but still a large number. All of which looked eager to kill. You see, I never intended to honor our agreement Gato explained, I mean, why spend a fortune on one failure of a ninja, when I could have my men do the same thing for a fraction of the price. You're making a mistake, Runs Abusa warned, do you really think a bunch of worthless mercs can take me down? This angered the mercenaries, but Gato answered. Yeah, I do, he said. He then noticed Haku on the ground and grinned an evil grin, well, well, looks like your little whore is hurt. Don't think I've forgotten that you broke my arm his grin widened, I'll enjoy breaking you. Haku shuddered in disgust. Edo then noticed Sakura, and who's this? He asked, so young. So beautiful. I've never fucked a girl with pink hair before. How? Exotic. Sakura shuddered as well. Naruto and Zabuza, meanwhile, were becoming enraged by what the dwarf was saying. You lay a single hand on either of them, and it'll be the last thing you ever do. Naruto growled. Edo laughed, look at the little blonde brat, thinking he's hot shit. He said, his men also laughing, do you really think you can hurt me you little shit? I do, Naruto told him. He then sent off a wave of his killing intent at the man and his army, causing them to stiffen and tremble in fear. That's it. The blonde asked, a little killing intent and you all back down. Pathetic. He laughed, a sound that sent shivers down their spines. Listen he continued, I'm in a good mood right now, so I'll give you thugs a choice, you can either cut your losses and run. Or you can stay and die a slow, agonizing death that will be the stuff of legend. Beto saw his men start to show signs of backing down and began to panic. What are you waiting for? He asked, kill him. Kill him and I'll double your pay. Naruto let out a dark chuckle, what good is money? He asked, if you aren't alive to spend it. He then held out both of his hands and raised them slowly, a dark horror enveloping them. Reaper art. Undead militia he whispered. The ground began to shake as something burst from underneath it. Those present could only gasp in horror as a small group of zombies emerged from the ground, wearing tattered and rusted armor and welding rusted weapons. They moaned and groaned, standing up, before stumbling forward a few steps. Beto and his army backed away in fear. This is the power I command, Naruto told them, when I call, the dead themselves answer. He then grinned wickedly, these unfortunate sods were created from the bodies of the last fools to challenge me. So please, attack me. I could always use more undead minions. He then increased his killing intent to help sell his threat. He couldn't actually turn people into zombies, but they didn't need to know that. The thugs trembled in absolute terror as they beheld the walking corpses. None wanted to risk becoming. That. Beto was panicking even more, D don't just s stand there, you idiots. He ordered, kill him. Fuck that, I'm outta here. One mercenary said, turning and running the other way. MB2. Another stuttered out. Soon they all began to turn and leave. I ain't turning into one of those. Fuck the money, I'm gone. W wait for me. Beto could only watch in horror as his hired help abandoned him, running away in fear. Wait. Come back. I'll triple your pay. Please. He cried out, but they ignored him. Good help is so hard to find these days. Beto spun around and saw Naruto standing right in front of him, grinning an evil grin. The ninja tyrant tried to run, only for Naruto to grab him and throw him in the other direction several feet. And here we see the tyrant in its natural state. Naruto said, walking menacingly towards the helpless man. Be please. He begged, only for the blonde to kick him in the gut, launching him towards the group. Trembling in fear, Naruto finished. He then picked up the little man by his throat, who was now. So soft, Naruto said, so weak. All tyrants are the same. Take away their power and they all devolve into whimpering weaklings. He don't k kill me. Gato begged, P please. I'll g give you anything. Money. Women. Power. W whatever you want, just don't kill me. Naruto shook his head, don't worry, tiny. I'm not going to kill you. Why you're not? He whimpered. No, the blonde answered, before tossing him towards Abusa, he is. 
Beidou then looked up at the former Seven Swordsman member, soiling himself at the expression on his face. The swordsman grabbed Gato and threw him against the railing of the bridge. Beidou groaned in pain, clearly having broken something. Helmi's abuser began, what exactly were you going to do to Haku, again? He asked, break her. I D didn't them mean it, Gato whimpered. Oh, I think you did, the missing nin told him, before pulling out a kunai. This pathetic excuse for a man didn't deserve to die by Kubikarabj's blade. I am sorry. I know you are, Zabuza assured him, but, just for fun, let's pretend you're not. He then began carving up the dwarf. For the next several minutes, Gato's screaming permeated the air around them. Sakura and Tazuna had to look away, but the others watched with morbid fascination as Zabuza tortured Gato with his knife. Beidou's screams became loudest when Zabuza cut off the things that made the tyrant a man. Finally, Zabuza decided he was done. He knew Gato deserved more, but there was little more he could do without killing him. He held the blade to his victim's throat. Goodbye, run Zabuza told him, it's been educational. And fun. He then slashed Gato's throat open and threw him off the bridge. It's. It's over Tazuna said, amazed, Gato's dead, it's over. Yes, Naruto said, it's over. He then picked up Haku, bridal style, causing her to blush before they made to leave. Akashi then pulled his headband back over his Sharingan eye, then turned to Zabuza after picking up Sasuke. What will you do now? He asked. I'll wait for Haku to heal, and then we'll be off he answered, after that. Don't know. You're welcome to stay with us until you decide, Tazuna told him. Zabuza's and Haku's eyes widened. You would help us? Haku asked, shocked, after we helped Gato oppress you. Azuna nodded, you did help him he said, but you also helped us stop him. I'd be honored to have you stay with us he told them honestly. Zabuza and Haku glanced at each other, before nodding. Thank you, the swordsman said. Before the architect could speak again, they heard a noise. A grunt of pain. The group turned. And their eyes widened in shock. There, pulling himself up from the side of the bridge, was Gato. What the fuck? Zabuza said, shocked. There was no way he could have survived that. Useless. Gato shouted, amazing them that he could still speak, worthless cowardly beasts. The bleeding man's voice had changed, shifting from normal to demonic at times. Naruto's eyes widened. He knew what was happening. Oh shit he muttered. What? Sakura asked. That's not Gato, he told her, not anymore. The wounded man stumbled forward, blood still pouring from him. Must I do everything myself? He asked, rhetorically. At ready, Naruto told the group. Why? Kakashi asked. Before his student could answer, Gato spoke again. So be it. He shouted, his voice now entirely demonic. The dwarf's body began to shake violently, before an arm burst from his right side and then another from his left. Then another arm burst out. Then another. And another. And then another. The group watched in horror as ten arms burst from within Gato's body, until there were ten in total. Then, a tall figure burst from within the dwarf's body. And it was monstrous. It was eight feet tall at least. It was thin and gangly in frame, almost skeletal except for its skin, which was a white as a blizzard in snow country. It had pale, blonde hair on either side of its head that looked more like dead seaweed than hair. Its head was narrow, and it had large, slanted, oval-shaped eyes that glowed red. It had clawed feet and a whip-like tail. The only clothing it wore was two shoulder guards and a red cape. Think the Mazer from DC Comics. The creature stretched its many arms out. Ah, it sighed, it's good to be out, it was getting stuffy in there. W what the hell is that Tazuna asked the question they were all thinking except Naruto. The creature then turned to the old man and grinned, showing off its needle-like teeth. I am the architect of your people's suffering old one it explained, as for what species I am. Its grin widened, you should ask your blonde friend there it told them pointing at Naruto. It's a demon, Naruto told them, figuring there was no point in hiding the truth from them at the moment. Besides, he could always erase their memories of it later. If they survived. Indeed the demon told them, and I've been wearing the small greedy human like a suit, hiding from the rest of the world. Like the coward and your kind truly are Naruto said. The demon growled, coward. It shrieked, I am no coward you worthless fleshy waste of life. It took a breath before continuing, I had hoped that my shrikes would dispose of you before, in case this moment came to pass its side, I should have known they would fail. So you're the one who sent the death shrikes after me, Naruto said. Of course the demon said, you were the greatest threat to the great plan. I needed to get rid of you. The others were confused as to why it only perceived Naruto as a threat when the demon sighed again. But now, once more, I have to do everything myself. The demon held out its arms and a strange object appeared in the hand of each one. Naruto's eyes widened and he made hand signs. Water release. Water formation wall. The wall of water rose from the ground just as the demon pointed its weapons at them. A the massive number of loud bangs were heard as an invisible force cut into the water wall. Firearms Naruto thought in shock, how the hell does that thing have firearms? Naruto knew of firearms. 
they were extremely rare, and humanity had all but forgotten how to create them centuries before the tailed beasts were born. They were fast and difficult to block or dodge. Even his water wall had only just managed to stop them. And now, somehow, a demon had access to ten of them. A demon smirked as it twirled its mostly flintlock pistols. This is the end, it told them, this bridge will never be completed. It will be torn down, and the rubble will serve as a testament to your failure. It fired several more shots, each being blocked by the water wall. I am Suther. The demon shouted, and this country is mine. Chapter 8. The Battle on the Bridge Part 2. The sounds of multiple loud bangs flooded the air around the unfinished bridge. You're getting weaker the demon that emerged from Gato, Zyther, pointed out, you can't keep that barrier up forever. He then fired several more shots. Naruto cringed as he struggled to block the bullets that struck his water barrier. He's right Naruto told the others behind him, I need something more solid to block these shots he turned his head, anyone got a barrier jutsu more solid than this. I've got one, Kakashi told him, standing beside him before forming hand signs, earth release. Earth style wall. The large wall of stone rose from the ground in front of them, blocking their view. Good enough Naruto said, then formed more hand signs, water release. Gunshot. The water wall in front of the barrier of stone shot out several balls of water at high speeds at the demon, before falling apart. Chuther saw the spheres of water approaching him and acrobatically dodged each one, ducking, weaving, and leaping over them. Mist. He taunted. Naruto cursed. Several more shots rang out, striking the stone wall, but thankfully not piercing it. What the hell is he attacking us with? Zabuza asked, intrigued by the strange and noisy weapons. Firearms Naruto answered, weapons that fire small projectiles called bullets at lightning speed towards whatever they are aimed out he explained, they can cut through flesh like paper. Damn, the swordsman muttered, impressed. Yeah, great, how about we talk about the demon that's trying to kill us? Sakura demanded. I don't see why you're so surprised Naruto pointed out, five of them did try to kill the two of us yesterday, remember? What? Kakashi asked, with himself, Haku, Tazuna and Zabuza giving them shocked looks. Five demons tried to kill Sakura, and I yesterday Naruto told him, we handled it, it was no big deal he assured him. No big deal Kakashi repeated, the two of you were in danger and you didn't tell. Several more shots were fired and struck the stone wall in front of them. Perhaps we should discuss this later, Naruto told his sensei. Kakashi nodded reluctantly. Come out and face me cowards. Shuther yelled before firing more shots. Why is he just standing there? Zabuza asked, he has us pinned down, why isn't he pressing his advantage? Higher arms are most effective at long range, Naruto explained, he clearly prefers to fight from a distance. If he gets too close to us, he loses the majority of his advantage. Then we should rush him. Close the gap and gut the bastard. Naruto shook his head, he'd gun us down before we got close. Then what do we do? Sakura asked. Naruto thought for a moment, all while multiple shots struck the wall. Those firearms are most likely supernatural in origin he thought, so they'll likely never run out of ammo. I don't have any barrier jutsu that I can sustain while moving and if he sees us coming, he then got an idea. I've got it. The blonde said, then turned to Zabuza, can you blanket the area in fog again? The swordsman nodded and made the required hand sign. As this was happening, Shuther was growing impatient. He hated waiting for his prey to act. Waiting gave foes time to come up with a plan. He had hoped at least some of the fleshlings would try to charge him, but the reaper ensured they knew what he could do with his weapons. He was tempted to leap over the wall and finish them off, but that would place him in range of their weapons. He was fast and agile, but never took unnecessary risks. He was a hunter and an assassin, not a simple brute like most of his kind. So, he did the only thing he could do. He waited. Suddenly, the fog around him became thicker, obscuring his view. Chuther knew what was happening. He heard something fly through the air and fired two shots, knocking both of the thrown shuriken out of the air. Clever insects he said, but I don't need to see you in order to destroy you. Well, that didn't work, Kakashi pointed out. Naruto grinned at him, I figured, but I'm just getting started. Can you put up a few more walls near him? He asked. Kakashi raised an eyebrow, but did so. In various places near Suther, more stone walls popped up. None of them blocked his view or prevented him from moving. What are they doing? The demon gunslinger wondered. You put up those walls to provide more cover for when you attack, Haku said, realizing what was happening. Naruto nodded. Smart Zabuza said, but how are you going to move close enough to strike without him hearing you? He asked. Naruto grinned, I'll play off the weaknesses all demons have, which is vanity and a short temper, Naruto answered, then spoke loud enough for Shuther to hear. I have to say the blonde reaper began, the amount of hardships you've placed on waves inhabitants seems a bit lax by demon standards. Don't tell me you guys have grown soft. Shuther gave off an evil chuckle, oh, the true suffering of this insignificant speck of land has yet to begin he explained, I wanted them to suffer more, but that would have drawn the attention of the rest of your order. 
So you are afraid of us, Naruto pointed out, then laughed, finally, a demon with sense. Said demon growled, afraid. Of your pathetic kind. He scoffed, of course not. But my master wanted to ensure that your ridiculous little band didn't interfere. Naruto's interest was piqued. And who would your master be? Shuther gave off a wicked grin, though none could see it, the mightiest of hell's lords he told him, Azazel. Naruto's eyes widened, Azazel. The demon lord of violence and destruction. What interest does he have in Wave? Conflict Shuther told him, you see, this worthless land is a major trade center. You humans rely so much on material things and you become restless when you don't get them. And how exactly does an occupation cause conflict? Simple, I slowly reduce the amount of goods that can leave from this desolate country Shuther explained, the more I do so, the more anxious and desperate your kind becomes. Then, when all trade is stopped, humanity will become so desperate to acquire the food and wetnet they need that they will lash out at each other and chaos will ensue. Pretty convoluted plan Naruto said, are you sure Azazel is the one behind it? He mocked, though he knew better. Just because Azazel thrived on chaos and war didn't mean he was simple-minded in how he went about causing it. Shuther snarled, Lord Azazel is more cunning than any human that has or ever will exist. He yelled, and when I deliver unto him the war he so craves, my rewards will be endless. And how long have you possessed Gato's soul? The demon chuckled darkly, most of his pathetic life he answered, he was born into poverty, always wanting more, but never able to acquire it. All I had to do was offer him money and he leapt at the opportunity. I've let him retain control for all these years, simply pushing his darkest desires to the surface and manipulating him from the shadows. He didn't even remember ever meeting me or selling his soul. He then twirled his weapons, now, enough talk. He shouted, once you're out of the way, the plan can continue unhindered. Your plan ends here, Halspin. Shuther barely had time to turn and dodge, as the blonde reaper appeared behind him and swung down with his scythe. The gunslinging demon turned and fired a shot, piercing through Naruto's chest. Only for the reaper's body to vanish in a puff of smoke. Shuther was struck from behind by a blast of holy energy, causing him to cry out in agony and fly forward a few feet. Getting to his knees, he rolled quickly to prevent himself from being speared from above. Naruto's weapon had speared into the ground, becoming embedded there. He had no time to remove it, however, as he quickly moved behind a stone wall to prevent several bullets from perforating him. That relic the demon growled, that accursed symbol of light. How do you have it? He demanded, referring to the crucifix. You're not the only one with connections, Naruto answered cryptically. Shuther was distracted enough for another shadow clone to attack him from behind. The demon avoided the attack and fired a shot, destroying the clone. Three more clones emerged from behind cover and attacked from three different directions. Surrounded, Shuther leapt into the air and fired downward, destroying the three clones. While the demon was still in the air, the real Naruto grabbed Harvest and leapt upwards, managing to sever the arm on Mother's back. The demon cried out in pain as one of his arms fell to the ground, the weapon in a clattering on the ground. He fell to the ground and fought through his pain. He was able to dodge a slash from his foe's side and fired several wild shots, managing to hit the blonde. Only for him to vanish in a puff of smoke, a log in his place. One down, Naruto said, nine to go. Chuther growled, managing to get to his feet. You will pay for that. He vowed, all of you will. We'll see. Shuther dodged a blast of holy energy and fired several more shots in the direction it came from, but hit nothing. Nearby, Mother's severed arm lay on the ground, still. Then the hand twitched. It began to shake violently. Before several claw-like appendages burst from between the fingers. The claws then turned and began cutting into the arm they were attached to. After a few minutes, the claws severed the hand from the arm and it began to scuttle around like a deformed spider. It then turned and moved as quickly as it could towards the first stone wall. Sounds like your boy managed to hurt him Zabuza said, as they all heart Shuther's scream of pain. Bakashi nodded, sounds like it, but that thing is still going he told him, hearing more gunshots. Why are we just standing here? Haku asked, sitting and leaning against the wall, we should be helping Naruto-kun. Naruto-kun? Zabuza asked, raising an eyebrow. Haku blushed and looked away. She's right, though Sakura said, why aren't we helping? Naruto told us what those weapons are capable of, Kakashi told her, we'd have to get close in order to strike him, giving him plenty of time to take us all down. Since most of us are wounded and low on chakra, it's best not to risk it. My attacks are fast and can hit him from a distance, Haku said. She then tried to stand, I can help. She gasped in pain and fell back into a sitting position, clutching her healed wound. She was in no danger of dying from that wound, but it still hurt. You're not going anywhere Zabuza told her, you're still hurt. I can fight. She argued, trying to get to her feet, only for her mentor to push her back down. No, you can't, he said, you need to rest. Blondie's got this, he assured her. Aku was about to argue when she sensed something. She looked up just in time to see something fall from the top of the wall onto her master's back. 
Tabuza cried out in pain as whatever it was began clawing at his back. Bakashi quickly stood up and tried to help him. Hold still. He shouted. Get this fucking thing off me. After a few seconds of struggling, Kakashi managed to grab the creature and pull it off. The clawed. Thing tried to tear at Kakashi, but they held it back. After a few seconds of struggling with it, he threw it away from him. The group was now able to see it clearly. It looked like a cross between a hand and a spider. The bizarre creature then ran towards them again, eager to claw them again. Before it got too close, it was pinned to the ground by Haku. As the creature tried to free itself, Zabuza moved towards it and stomped on it repeatedly. Die. You. Peace. Of. Shit. He said, each word added to each stomp. After a few more stomps, the creature was only twitching. After a few more futile twitches, it became still and dissolved into dust and smoke that reeked of sulfur. What the hell was that thing? Tazuna nearly yelled, it looked like some kind of deformed hand. Like a demon's hand. Kakashi noted, thinking. You think it was one of those monster hands? Sakura asked. It might be Kakashi told her, which means Naruto was able to sever it. So the bastard's missing an arm Zabuza said, good. Yeah, but it still has a lot more the silver hair told him. Zabuza nodded and then winced. Ah. He gasped out, little shit scratched me up pretty good. Are you okay Zabuza-sama? Haku asked, worried. I'm fine he assured her, I can take it worse than that in my sleep. Sakura Kakashi said, help Zabuza. They nodded and began healing him once he sat down. The irony of her healing a man that tried to kill them until only a short while ago was not lost on her. Meanwhile, back with Naruto, the blonde cursed as he moved behind another stone wall. He hissed in pain and looked at his right arm. One of the shots from Shuther had managed to graze him there. The bullet didn't embed itself in his flesh, but it still stung quite a bit. You can't keep this up forever Shuther told him, your second death approaches. I'm not dying to a scrawny bootlicker like you. The gunslinger growled, hold your tongue fleshling. Scale the wall and make me hellborn trash. Naruto dared him, stop fighting like a coward and finish this. Shuther snarled and leapt up to the top of the fall his foe was hiding behind. He aimed down. And his eyes widened when he saw the numerous explosive tags attached to the wall. The demonic gunslinger attempted to move, but it was too late. Boom. The entire unfinished bridge shook as the tags went off. Shuther went flying while the section of the bridge the explosion happened on collapsed and fell. Azuna would be unhappy, but the damage was confined to a small area and was repairable. Naruto then moved in the direction his foe was launched in, eager to finish this. He arrived at the location. Only to find it empty. Before Naruto could investigate further another loud bang rang out. The blonde cried out in pain as he felt something pierce his side and he fell to the ground. He rolled over onto his back and saw his foe, badly burned, the arm on his chest dangling uselessly. His cape had been burned away and his shoulder guards had fallen off, but he was still alive. I'll give you this shooter began, even though I thought I was dead at that time. He then raised his remaining arms, aiming his weapons at the helpless reaper, who was trying to pull himself to his feet with the bridge's railing. But now he said, I get to add another reaper to the list of useless creatures I've slain. A few minutes earlier, the group was waiting, unsure as to what to do, listening to the battle occurring just beyond the stone wall they were taking cover behind. Suddenly, they all heard a groan and saw Sasuke finally awaken. What? What happened? He muttered. Sasuke-kun. Sakura cried out in joy, before embracing him, you're okay. The Ichiha clan heir cried out in pain, still sore from his defeat by Haku. Sorry. Sakura said, releasing him. Sasuke looked around and saw, to his shock, Zabuza and a girl he had never seen before. He didn't recognize her face, but he saw her clothes were familiar and quickly put the pieces together. He tried to stand and prepare to fight, but was unable to do so. Why are they here? Sasuke demanded. Calm down, Sasuke Kakashi told him, we've made peace with Zabuza and his apprentice, Haku he explained, we're no longer enemies. The black-haired teen was surprised by this. After taking a few moments to process this, he noticed his male teammate was missing. Where's the dope? He asked. He's busy, Kakashi told him, after searching for the right word. And he's not a dope, Haku told him, he's strong. Strong enough to defeat me. Sasuke's eyes widened. Naruto defeated Zabuza's partner. But. How? He had unlocked his Sharingan, the ultimate bloodline, and was still easily defeated. But the dead last managed to beat her. Sasuke began to shake with fury. Once again, Naruto had proven himself the stronger of the two of them. He then snapped out of it when he heard several loud bangs. What was that? He asked. Naruto's off fighting another foe, Kakashi explained, we'd help, but his weapons put us at a disadvantage. Disadvantage? Sasuke repeated. The weapons he uses fire some kind of small projectiles at lightning speeds the silver-haired explained, Naruto is familiar with them, while well, we are not. So he's fighting while we protect Azuna. Sasuke was intrigued and angered by this. 
These weapons sounded useful, which interested him and Naruto was facing off against a foe his sensei was reluctant to face, proving himself to be brave as well as powerful, which angered him. Before he could speak again, they heard a large explosion. What was that? Tazuna asked, is someone using bombs on my bridge? He demanded, worried. I didn't see any explosives on Suthers Abusa said, then grinned behind his mask, must have been Blondie. Does. Does that mean it's over? Haku asked. Her answer came in the form of another loud bang, followed by a cry of pain from Naruto Uzumaki. Did you hear that? Sakura asked the others, back behind the wall, Naruto's hurt. We have to do something. Haku said, trying to stand once again. As the others wondered what to do, Zabuza was thinking. Over a week ago, he had tried to kill these people. Then, the blonde had stopped him. Not since he attempted to assassinate the mad Mizukage had he been overpowered so easily. So, for the following week, he spent time with Haku coming up with a plan to get rid of him. But that failed when Haku was defeated. He still remembered the horror he felt when Haku had leapt out in front of him, ready to take the brunt of Kakashi's Rikiri. Luckily, Kakashi had managed to avoid delivering a lethal strike, but Haku had still nearly died from shock. That was when the blonde surprised him a third time by saving Haku's life. Zabuza was the type of person who avoided personal connections. People around him tended to die in a tremendously bloody fashion quite often. But Haku was different. When he found her, she was so weak, helpless, and broken. He had seen people like her before, of course. Refugees fleeing from the Agura's purge, people who had lost everything. He paid them no mind, but something about Haku was different. Something made him ignore his instincts about surviving alone and seeing helpless kids like her as weak. After he spoke to her and learned of her bloodline, he had offered to give her a purpose, as his weapon and tool. Haku was so desperate, she agreed. In all the years as since, the swordsman told himself that he only kept Haku around because she was useful. He did all he could to avoid smiling when she smiled after completing a milestone in her training or when he complimented her. He suppressed his pride when she performed a mission flawlessly. He tried to ignore her when she told him how happy she was to serve him. He once thought such things were for weaklings. But now, seeing Haku almost die allowed him to finally accept the truth. She was family, the daughter he'd never had. He knew that if the no, if Naruto, failed, then Haku would likely die as well. For years, he had been known as a monster, a demon, a ruthless killer. But somewhere deep down, he was still Zabuza Mamachi, the man. And that hidden piece of humanity had finally been freed. He steeled himself, he knew what he had to do. He moved over to Haku and gave her a look she had never seen before. Pride. Zabuza Sama. She said, wondering what was happening. He then moved forward and embraced her, surprising her greatly. I love you Haku he told her, you were the daughter I never knew I wanted. Before she could respond, he let her go and stood up before looking at Kakashi. Don't let her follow me, he said simply. They understood what he was about to do and nodded. The swordsman then gave Haku one last sad glance. Goodbye. He then rushed forward, moving to help his unexpected ally. Zabuza Sama. Haku cried, come back. She tried to go after him, but her wounds and Kakashi stopped her. You can't go. Kakashi told her, you'll be killed. She ignored him and kept calling after her master father figure. Sakura watched, meanwhile, wondering what was happening. She then noticed something that troubled her. Wait, where's Sasuke? Kakashi heard her and his eyes widened. Oh no. The present, Shuther limped towards his helpless foe, who was desperately trying to stand. You have failed, Reaper, the demon told him, I have won. Lord Azazel's wishes will soon be completed. You were only a minor inconvenience. The core will. Stop you Naruto told him, grunting in pain. They will fail as well he said, before grinning wickedly, after all, they are human, and what is more human than failure. He then raised one of his remaining arms and aimed it at the human, cocking the weapon in it. He was about to fire when he sensed something behind him. He moved to the side, attempting to dodge a mortal blow. This action allowed him to survive. But it still cost him. Shuther screamed in absolute agony as all of the arms on his right side were severed by a massive blade. The demon turned and fired wildly, trying to hit his attacker, one Zabuza Mamachi. The pain disoriented Suther, however, allowing the swordsman to leave a large gash on the monster's torso before severing another arm on the left side. Shuther cried out in pain as yet another limb was severed. He fired even more wildly. This time, unfortunately, he hit his mark. Naruto could only stare in horror as Abusa was struck by several bullets in his chest and stomach. No. He shouted and lunged at the demon. Shuther had managed to gain his bearings, firing another shot at the blonde reaper, hitting him in the left shoulder and knocking him over the side of the bridge where he plummeted to the water below. Shuther painted, trying to suppress his pain. That had been too close. If he hadn't moved to the side. He freed his mind from such thoughts. He won. The only human that could challenge him was dead, and the others would soon be as well. The gunslinger then heard something moving towards him in the fog. He turned and aimed his three remaining weapons. 
only to find a dark-haired human male emerging from the fog, limping towards him. The human's eyes widened when he saw the inhuman creature in front of him. Shuther started for a moment. And then started laughing. This is it. He asked incredulously, this is my next challenge. This pitiful creature can barely stand. What the hell are you? Sasuke asked, his fear and curiosity overpowering his wounded pride at being called a pitiful creature. Shuther grinned, showing his teeth, I am a demon. The most powerful species in creation. He declared. Where's Naruto? Sasuke asked. He had entered the fray in order to prove himself his male teammate superior. Only to find himself face to face with a demon and the blonde nowhere to be seen. Who? The demon asked, then realized what he was talking about, oh, you mean the blonde reaper. He's dead. Sasuke's eyes widened. What? You heard me Shuther said, knocked him right off the side of the bridge and into the river he explained. He then pointed his weapons at the Achiha, but don't worry, you'll be joining him soon enough. Sasuke was afraid. He was too weak to fight now, this thing would slaughter him. Perhaps this hadn't been such a good idea after all. No. He thought, I can't die now. I won't. I will kill Itachi and restore my clan. He vowed, then closed his eyes, I will win. He opened his eyes, revealing his Sharingan. Shuther saw the eyes, and his own red pupilless ones widened in surprise. That's unexpected he said quietly, before grinning again, but not unwelcome. He lowered his weapons. The possessor of Indra's eyes. He said in surprise, your kind is quite a rarity these days. Sasuke was confused, who's Indra? He asked. You don't know. Shuther asked, Indra was your ancestor, the one whose eyes you've inherited he explained, tell me, are you a purebred Achiha? Purebred? Were both of your parents born into the clan? Sasuke wondered where this was going, but nodded. Author's grin widened, oh this is kismet. He said, I had heard that some had managed to survive the purge of your clan, but to encounter a purebred member of Indra's bloodline. Such fortune I have. What the hell are you talking about? Sasuke asked, becoming equal parts creeped out and annoyed. My dear boy, you don't realize how valuable you are the demon answered, you think you're worth a lot up here. Where I come from, your soul would be priceless. Sasuke was becoming nervous, but didn't show it, my soul. Shuther nodded, oh yes he said, in my realm, human souls are a valuable commodity, and the soul of a member of a clan that is almost extinct is even more valuable his grin widened even more, I think we could do business. Sasuke tensed and entered a fighting stance. You won't take my soul. He vowed. Shuther laughed and shook his head, take. He asked, of course I can't take your soul, child. I couldn't take your soul no matter how hard I tried. No, I'm talking about striking a bargain. You have nothing I want, Sasuke told him. Are you so certain? The wounded demon asked, is there truly nothing you wouldn't give up anything for? Sasuke was still in a stance, but he was pondering what the demon said. Shuther noticed this and knew he had the human's interest, tell me he began, what is it you want most in all of creation? What is it you would give anything and everything to have? He asked. Sasuke stared at the demon. He suddenly felt as if he could tell it anything. I want power so that I can kill my brother he answered, to avenge my clan. Ah Shuther said, revenge. Truly the strongest of motivations he then continued, but I don't think that's what you truly want more than anything else as Sasuke was about to argue, Shuther stopped him, don't mistake my meaning he said, I believe you want revenge, but not that you want it more than anything else. He then moved forward, closer to the human. No he continued, I sense there is a deeper desire within you. Something you want even more than revenge he grinned knowingly, what you want most in all of creation. Is what your brother stole from you. You want your family back. Ichiha heir's eyes widened. Oh yes Shuther continued, seeing the shocked look in his eyes, you desperately want what was taken from you returned. You replace this desire with revenge because you believe the return of your clan is impossible, and, by human standards, it is he then smirked, but I'm not human. Sasuke's eyes widened even more. You. You can bring them back. He asked, hope and disbelief mixed into his tone. He stood up as straight as he could, getting out of his stance. The demon grinned, but of course he told the teen, anything is possible for me and my kind. All I need is something to, as you humans might say, get the magic going. My soul, Sasuke realized. Indeed, Shuther said. He then saw Sasuke's reluctance, I know what you're thinking, that you don't want to give up your soul. That it's a part of you. But let me ask you this, is one soul really worth more than an entire clan? He asked, is this one small sacrifice not worth a chance to be with your family again? Sasuke was conflicted. Did he want this? Yes, he did. More than anything else. More than Itachi's life. But was it worth losing his soul? Shuther, meanwhile, knew the boy was close to breaking. His own desires mixed with a little charm magic would ensure he would give in. Can you really restore them? Sasuke asked, after a few moments of thought. I can Shuther assured him, all you have to do is say. 
of my own free will, do I offer you my soul, and when you return home, you will find your mother, father, and all the others that died that night, waiting for you, arms eager to embrace you and aid you in avenging their unfortunate and untimely deaths, he explained. Sasuke thought about this for several more minutes. Finally he decided. All I have to do. Is say the words. He asked. Chuther nodded. Sasuke took a deep breath. He needed to do this, it was for his clan. Of my own free will. Shuther grinned. This was it. Soon, he'd not only complete his master's plan, but he'd soon have the soul of one of the last wielders of Indra's bloodline and a new, stronger body to inhabit. Do I offer you? My s. Bang. The loud shot rang out, interrupting the Acha. Shuther froze for a moment, then gasped and spat up a bit of blood, a sharp pain in his back. He slowly turned. And saw Naruto Uzumaki standing behind him, holding one of his firearms in his hand, which was smoking from just being fired. Before the demon could raise his remaining weapons in defense, Naruto fired again, the bullet hitting him between the eyes. Shuther Twitch dropped his weapons and then fell onto his back. Sasuke saw the look of shock on the demon's face and then watched as he dissolved into ash along with his severed limbs. No. Sasuke thought. He moved over to where Shuther had been, desperately trying to find a way to bring back his only hope of restoring his family. The Ichiha suddenly felt woozy. No. He thought again before falling into unconsciousness. Shuther's magic had been keeping him conscious so that he could make a deal. With him gone, Sasuke's wounds forced him to pass out once more. Naruto sighed in relief. It's over. He shouted, you can come out now. A few moments later, the rest of the group arrived. Is. Is he dead? Sakura asked, nervous yet hopeful. Naruto nodded, he's dead. He then grunted in pain. Sakura saw the wounds on his side and shoulder. You're hurt. She pointed out. Bastard got me a couple of times he told her, my wounds aren't fatal, I'll be fine. Sakura was about to protest when they heard a cough. They turned and saw Zabuza, still alive, lying on his back. Zabuza-sama. Haku cried out, rushing to his side. Naruto limped over as quickly as he could, also kneeling down beside the wounded missing nin. Said nin looked up at Haku and smiled behind his bandages. Hey. Haku he said weakly. Don't talk, Zabuza-sama. Haku told him, trying to use her medical jutsu to heal him. Don't. Call me that he told her, I'm not. Your master. Anymore. Haku ignored him and kept trying, but she couldn't heal him, no matter how hard she tried. It's no use, Naruto said sadly, his wounds are mortal. He's dying. Haku's eyes began to tear up and she shook her head rapidly, no she denied, no. He's going to be fine. He always survives. Haku's abusa said, interrupting her, it's okay. Tears now poured from the raven-haired girl's eyes. It's not okay. She told him, I can't lose you. I need you. No he told her, you don't. Need me. Not anymore. Tears began to form in his eyes. Thank you. Haku, he told her. For what? She asked, still crying. For being here he said, for making my life. Worth living the dying swordsman smiled, I always. Tried to deny. How important you are. To me. But I can't. Anymore. You. Were the light. In the blood-soaked darkness. Of my life. He reached up with one of his hands and caressed one of her tear-stained cheeks. Can you do me? One last favor? He asked. Haku nodded. Call me. Dad. Or father. Please. Haku's eyes widened and her tears increased. Father she said, please don't go she whispered begged. I wish. I didn't have to Zabuza said, but. It's too late. For me. He wiped away some of her tears. Promise me he began, promise me. That you'll find happiness. Promise me. You'll live a full and. Happy life he told her, promise me. Haku nodded, unable to speak. Thank you he told his adopted daughter, I love you. Haku then started sobbing, I love you too, father. She told him. Zabuza's smile grew wider before he then turned to Naruto. Look out. For her he told the blonde, keep. Her safe. Naruto nodded, I will he vowed. Zabuza coughed up a bit of blood, which was obstructed by his bandages. Naruto removed the cloth, allowing him to breathe easier. Thanks, he said. He then thought of something. Hey he began, was that thing. Really? A demon? He asked. Naruto nodded. Does that mean? Hell is. Real. He nodded again. For what I've done. Will I he let the question go unfinished. Naruto nodded sadly, I'm afraid so he told him, your last act was a noble one. But it can't undo a life of wickedness. Zabuza nodded, I thought so he said, oh well he then grinned, showing his shark-like teeth, bring it on then. He said, I'll show them. What a real demon. Looks like. Naruto smiled slightly at Zabuza's attitude, but still dreaded Zabuza having to spend eternity in that horrible realm. He deserved better. His eyes widened. Of course. How could he have forgotten? He won't have to, Naruto told the mortally winded man. Zabuza was confused, but. You said. 
The blonde reaper ignored him and pulled out the crucifix. Zabuza Mamachi, I absolve you of all your sins. The relic enveloped Zabuza in a holy light. His eyes became filled with wonder. There is. A light. The light then faded. And Zabuza became still. His eyes were lifeless, yet his expression was peaceful. Zabuza Mamachi, the demon of the hidden mist, was dead. Father. Haku whispered, Father. Please. He's gone Haku Naruto said sadly, though he knew and was grateful his absolving of the man's soul had worked. The girl wept, embracing her adopted father's body. Naruto moved to her side and held her. Tears were flowing down Sakura's cheeks. Azuna simply watched, sadness clear in his features. Takashi lowered his head in sadness. He then felt something land softly on his head. Brushing it off, he was surprised by what he saw. Snow. The group aside from Haku then looked around and saw that it had started snowing. Snow. Kakashi said in wonder, this time of year. Naruto held out a hand, allowing a few snowflakes to land there. It seems the heavens themselves weep on this day, he said. He then held Haku tighter, allowing the young woman to mourn, while the others looked on. The next morning, there, all done, Naruto said. Team 7 minus Asuk, who was still unconscious, Tazuna, Tsunami, and Inari were standing on a hill not far from Tazuna's home, under a lone tree. There, underneath that tree, Naruto and Haku had just finished burying Zabuza's body. The blonde had been more than willing to do all the work, but Haku had insisted on helping him. The young woman nodded, it just needs one last thing. Naruto nodded and walked over to the tree, where Kubikurumj was leaning against it. Grabbing the blade, he planted the blade into the ground in front of the grave. It served as a fine headstone. Perfect. Everyone present then began to pay their respects, including Tsunami and Inari. Even though they had not been there to witness his sacrifice, they were still grateful for what he had done for them and their home. After half an hour of silence, everyone began to depart until only Naruto and Haku remained. Several minutes of silence passed before Naruto spoke. I was right. Haku looked at her friend, confused, about what? When we fraught, I told Zabuza wasn't a demon, he smiled slightly, I was right. Demons have no goodness in them and they can't be redeemed. But he was. Haku nodded, agreeing. I'm sorry Naruto told her, after another few minutes of silence. The young woman turned to him, an eyebrow raised, for what? She asked. He died because of me he told her, if I hadn't been so careless and gotten shot, he wouldn't have tried to save me. I'm sorry he repeated. Haku shook her head, no, he died because he wanted to protect me she told him, it's my fault. It was Naruto's turn to shake his head. It wasn't your fault. Of course it was. Haku said, beginning to tear up, he died because of me. The blonde quickly moved and embraced her, soothing her. After several minutes, Haku calmed down and they separated. Thank you she told him, sniffing, I'm sorry. You have nothing to be sorry about. It's just. What am I going to do without him? She asked, serving him was the reason I existed for so long. Honor his wishes he told her, he wanted you to live a full and happy life, he placed a comforting hand on her shoulder, it will be difficult. But I'll help you any way I can. Aku gave him a soft smile. Thank you she told him. After over an hour of standing at Zabuza's grave, the two then decided to head back to the house. They were walking side by side when Haku surprised her blonde friend by leaning into him, resting her head on his shoulder. Overcoming his surprise, Naruto responded by wrapping his arm around her waist. Happy and full life Haku thought, maybe I can. With him she blushed at the thought. Oh yes, Haku was developing feelings for the blonde, and soon, those feelings would evolve into something more. Two days later, in a spare room of Tazuna's house, one Sasuke Chiha woke with a groan. Where? Where am I? He thought groggily. He slowly sat up, groaning in slight pain. Looking around, he saw he was in Tazuna's house. Wait he thought, what happened? He thought back. He remembered heading to the bridge with his team minus Naruto and finding Zabuza and his partner waiting for them. He remembered fighting against the masked girl, awakening his Sharingan, but ultimately being defeated and passing out. He then remembered waking up and learning that Naruto had beaten the girl who beat him. He remembered hearing about Naruto fighting another foe and entering the fray himself, eager to prove himself the stronger of the two. He then remembered the demon. His eyes widened, remembering what had happened when the two spoke. The demon had noticed his bloodline and had offered him the return of his clan, of the people who died at his brother's hands, in exchange for his soul. He was going to agree. But the dead last had ruined it. He managed to stand up and make his way to the door. In the nearby forest, bang, bang, bang. These sounds perforated the quiet early afternoon air. The conscious members of Team 7 were training in a clearing near Tazuna's house. Haku was with Tazuna, acting as a guard even though the danger had passed while the team trained. Well. Naruto was training, the loud sounds of the firearm he was using on a makeshift practice range made it difficult for Kakashi to train Sakura. So they simply decided to watch. Naruto aimed at a wooden target board and fired again, narrowly missing the bullseye. He sighed and looked down at his new weapon. 
Unlike the rest of Arthur's firearms, which were flintlock, this one was a wheelock pistol. It was beautifully crafted, with ornate carvings and a skull symbol on either side of it, and an onyx pommel stone at the bottom of the grip. It was far too elaborately constructed to be a weapon forged by demons. And that's because it wasn't. It was a reaper weapon. Naruto thought back to the conversation he had with Hephaestus yesterday. Flashback, for the first time since returning to Earth, Naruto was back at the Palace of Decay. He needed to speak with a certain former smith god. He could have contacted him on Earth, but he needed to see the large blacksmith in person for this. As he made his way to the smith's forge, the attendants he passed bowed in respect before resuming their duties, while the other members of the corps nodded in greeting. According to Death, who he had checked in with before arriving, the members of the corps the blonde was closest to were out on assignment. He would have liked to have seen them, but he was here on business. After sidestepping Vulgrim, Naruto found himself in the forge, blasted by the intense heat of it. He made his way through the forges and foundries until he found Hephaestus, who was giving out orders to another member of the smiths. The giant former god saw him approach and grinned, before waving off the smith he was speaking to. Hey blondie. He called out, welcome home. Naruto smiled, it's good to be back, old man. Give me a chance to thank you in person for those shrike daggers he told him, gave me some new material to work with. Plus, the blades had some new kind of poison on them. Gave it to the lads and lasses in the makers. Eos already found a way to replicate it for ourselves and made an antidote for it. Naruto grinned, old man might be off his rocker, but the creator is brilliant. The forge master nodded in agreement. I take it Yah didn't come down here just to talk he pointed out. Naruto nodded, becoming serious, you're right, I didn't. Hephaestus nodded, let's talk at my forge he told the blonde reaper. Naruto nodded again and followed the former god. After a few moments of navigating the massive room, they arrived at the center of the room, where Hephaestus's personal forge was. The giant sat down. So laddie began, what can I do for ya? You can tell me what this is, he said, pulling out the wheelock pistol and laying it down on the table in front of him. Hephaestus's eyes widened as he picked up the weapon and held it in his palm. I'll be buggered he said quietly, never thought I'd see this again. I had it figured out for a reaper weapon Naruto told him, and since you remember every weapon that's ever come out of this foundry, I figured you would know it. Judging from your reaction, I was right. You were, the forge master told him, this weapon here is called Eternal Rest. I made this little thing over a century ago he explained. Naruto raised an eyebrow, I thought you hated making firearms he said, knowing the forge master thought of them as dainty. I do, the former god told him, but the reaper who had this wanted a gun, so I made him a gun. He then looked up at the reaper, the reaper who carried this died on a mission. But we never recovered it or found out what killed him. Where did you find this? He asked. I took it off a demon, probably the one who killed its previous owner, since he said he killed a reaper before the blonde answered, before pulling out a scroll, he also had these. Naruto unsealed the contents of the scroll and saw the giant's eyes widen at the nine other firearms that emerged from it. Bloody fuck he gasped, I've heard of keeping a spare, but this. They weren't spares, Naruto told him, he had ten arms and had one weapon in each hand. Ten arms? Hephaestus repeated, never heard of demon species like that before. I don't think he was a member of a particular species the blonde told him, at least, I hope not he then focused, anyway, I just thought you'd like this back, plus a few more for material he then bowed, it was good to see you again, but I have to get back to earth. As he turned to leave, he sensed something. He turned just in time to catch eternal rest in his hand. He gave Hephaestus a look. Don't look at me. He said, bloody thing moved on its own he grinned, looks like it's chosen ya as its new master. Is it sentient? The blonde asked. The forge master shook his head, no, but it can choose its master and bond with him. Naruto raised an eyebrow, and it's chosen me? He asked, skeptical. The former god nodded. But. But I can't use it, he said, I already have harvest. The reaper can use more than one weapon Hephaestus reminded him, after all, you're using the crucifix, ain't ya? That's different, Naruto said. How? The forge master asked, before continuing, look lad, that little bugger has chosen you. Like it or not, you're stuck with it. Naruto considered this for a moment. The weapon was powerful and useful, without a doubt. It would also be useful in taking foes by surprise, as few knew what a firearm was or what they could do. But could he use it? He looked over his shoulder at his side. Well, buddy he said to her, what do you think? The weapon was silent for a moment before sending a wave of reassurance through its master, letting him know it was okay. Naruto smiled, okay then, I'll take it. Hephaestus nodded, Goody said, now, eternal rest ain't no ordinary pistol he began, as you probably know, it never needs to be loaded, can fire endlessly, and can grow a bayonet for close quarters. It also has a variety of different ammo types it can use. Regular, oh course, incendiary, salt, to deal with spirits, silver, for werewolves, and, cause overkill is underrated, explosive. Naruto's eyes widened, how do I switch between them? He asked. 
Thus thing code the ammo type ya want and the gun will do the rest he answered, before continuing, oh, Anna can do this. He waved his hand, and the wheelock pistol suddenly became a rifle in his hands, having exerted his control over the weapon, as he could with all the others he had made. Whoa. The blonde said, examining the transformed weapon. The rifle form has a lower rate of fire, but it has a longer range. A scope appeared on the weapon, and Naruto peered through it, impressed by the clarity and range it had. He willed his new weapon to return to its pistol form. Thanks old man he told the former god. Hephaestus nodded, yeah welcome, laddie then stood up, now, I think I've got a holster here somewhere. After a few moments, he found one and gave it to the blonde reaper, who strapped to his side, beneath his coat in order to hide it from view, before he placed eternal rest in it. Well, I've got more work to do the forge master told his friend, good luck to you blondie. Naruto bowed and bid him farewell before he left. He still needed to discuss a certain demon lord's involvement in the occupation of wave country with his master. Flashback end, Naruto had spoken with death and notified him of Azazel's plot in wave. The Lord of Bones had been troubled by this and assured him that the core would keep a close eye on the country, though they both knew the demon lord wouldn't try anything else there for at least a few generations. He was evil, not stupid. Unfortunately, because there was no proof that Azazel was behind the occupation of Wave Country, they couldn't confront Lucifer about it. The Blonde Reaper was upset, but understood. After this, Naruto had returned to Earth and had been practicing using Eternal Rest. He was proving to be quite the marksman when he held it with both hands, but the blonde wanted to be able to use it in one hand while wielding Harvester the crucifix in the other. He was progressing well, but still had a little ways to go. He aimed once more and fired, hitting the bull's eye this time. He grinned. The powerful weapon Kakashi said, pulling the blonde out of his thoughts, but not very subtle. Naruto nodded, yeah, it's not meant for stealth or assassination. Unless you're at a great distance. He aimed once more and fired several more shots in rapid succession. Why is it so loud? Sakura asked, after she stopped covering her eyes. The typical bullet consists of three main parts. The primer, propellant, and the actual projectile that is launched when fired or blonde teammate explained, when I pull the trigger, a spring mechanism causes a metal firing pin to hit the back end of the bullet, which in turn ignites a small explosive charge in the primer. This ignites the propellant and the chemicals in it burn, rapidly producing a lot of gas. This gas drastically increases the pressure behind the bullet, causing the bullet to leave the barrel, the tube looking part, at incredibly high speeds to hit the target. But where does the bang come from? They asked. Like I said before, a bullet is powered by a tremendous amount of pressure at its back, which propels it forward. After the bullet exits, that pressure is suddenly released, which creates the loud noise you hear when it fires. It's kind of like what happens when you uncork a bottle of champagne Naruto explained. So, it's basically a small explosion, Kakashi pointed out. Naruto nodded, basically. Sounds dangerous, Sakura said. The blonde nodded, oh yes. It took several generations to perfect the process and stop the whole weapon from exploding in the user's hands. Before more questions could be asked, the team was surprised when one Sasuke Chiha entered the clearing. Sasuke-kun. You're awake. Sakura said, elated at seeing her crush conscious once more. She had been taking care of him since the battle at the bridge. A few weeks ago, they would rather have died than leave the Ichiha's side, but Sakura, knowing she could do nothing more for him, had decided to resume training with the rest of her team. Sasuke, meanwhile, ignored her and focused on Naruto. He narrowed his eyes and something in him snapped. He rushed well, stumbled, given his condition at the blonde, and threw a punch aimed at his jaw. Reacting quickly, Naruto deflected the blow. Growling, Sasuke tried again, only for his blonde teammate to catch the blow. Before he knew it, Sasuke was pinned to the ground, his arm twisted behind his back. What the hell are you doing? Naruto demanded. Do you have any idea what you did? Sasuke yelled, you ruined everything. What are you talking about? Kakashi asked, confused as to why Sasuke was angry. He killed him. The Achiha growled, he was going to bring back my clan, and the dope killed him. Naruto quickly realized what was happening, I heard what he offered you. Then why did you kill him? To stop you from making a foolish mistake. What's going on? Kakashi demanded to know. Shuther tried to make a deal with Sasuke, Naruto explained, he told him he would resurrect the Ichiha clan. In exchange for his soul. I killed him to stop Sasuke from making a mistake. The mistake Sasuke cried out in anger, how is getting my family back a mistake? Because he was lying to you, Dumbus. Stop it. Sakura pleaded, stop fighting. Enough. Kakashi's shout silenced all three of them. Naruto, let Sasuke up Kakashi ordered, Sasuke, if you attack Naruto again, I'll be the one who knocks you down, got it. After a moment's hesitation, Naruto released Sasuke and stood up. The Achiha was about to try and attack his male teammate again when Kakashi gripped his shoulder painfully, causing him to think twice. Now Kakashi began, Naruto, explain why you said you were stopping Sasuke from making a mistake. 
Naruto leaned against a tree and explained, giving your soul to a demon is a one-way ticket to hell, no matter how good a person is. I would have gotten my clan back. Sasuke argued, it would have been worth it. And what makes you think he would have honored his end of the bargain? The blonde asked, what makes you think that he wouldn't have just taken your soul and left you with nothing? Sasuke opened his mouth to argue, then closed it. The demon never promised him anything. He only said he could do it, not that he would. I know his kind Naruto told him, and I know what they are capable of. How? Kakashi asked, he only seemed to regard you as a threat while he ignored the rest of us. What made him single you out? Naruto looked at his team, seeing their curious eyes. Could he tell them? He wasn't supposed to. But if they never told a soul what they had seen. He had already erased Azuna's memory of the author and his involvement with Wave's suffering and replaced it with a false one. In it, a nameless ninja hired by Gato had been the one who killed Zabuza. Sakura already knew about humankind before the battle on the bridge. Would it really be so harmful for Kakashi and Sasuke to know, too? Well, Sasuke maybe, but the core could and would silence him if he tried to tell anyone. Naruto decided, sighed, and began to tell them what had happened to him four years ago. He told them about his death, his slaying of Omen, his recruitment into the Reaper Corps, what the Corps was and what it did, his training, and, finally, his return to Konoha. Needless to say, they were left speechless. By that's. Wow. Kakashi said, stunned. Sakura nodded dumbly in agreement. Sasuke surprised the others by scoffing. What a load of bullshit he said, what makes you think you can fool me with a fairy tale? Naruto raised an eyebrow, you were about to sell your soul to a demon, a being that, until that moment, you thought only existed in stories, and you think my story is bullshit? He asked. Sasuke frowned. If you don't believe me, ask Sakura, the blonde said, she and I encountered five demons the day before we fought Zabuza and Haku. They nodded, it's true, she told them. So when you said you liked your job during the introductions, you meant fighting demons for a living? Kakashi asked, incredulously. Among other supernatural beings, yes. Like what? Sakura asked. Ghosts, vampires, werewolves, zombies Naruto explained nonchalantly, pretty much everything we were told as children wasn't real. Wait a minute Sakura said, if all those things are real, why hasn't anyone ever seen them? People see them all the time Naruto answered her, we just wipe their memories of the whole event so they won't tell anyone. Sakura remembered when Naruto was going to wipe her memory after they fought those five lizard-looking demons and how his eyes glowed white for a moment. If you're an expert on demons, maybe you can explain how one got inside Gato Kakashi said, eager to learn more, but intent on not showing it. Demons are the dominant force in hell, Naruto explained, but they are also prisoners there. The only surefire hope of escape for them is to possess a human host. In order to possess someone, the demon needs to have ownership over that person's soul. So, demons steal souls then, Kakashi said, troubled by this information. Naruto shook his head, they can't steal souls. No one can. They can only take a person's soul if it is given to them willingly. Why would someone give their soul away? Sakura asked, horrified. Because demons promise people power and wealth, among other things, in exchange for them he replied, I'm sure you heard Suther when he said he gave Gato money. So Gato got his wealth from that demon? Kakashi asked. Naruto nodded and then was manipulated into establishing a force large enough to hold Wave hostage. So the demon did give him what he was promised Sasuke said, before narrowing his eyes, like he would have done for me. He might have, Naruto said, but with demons, they always ensure that every bargain ends badly. So maybe he would have restored your clan. But he would have screwed you over. How? Naruto stood up and walked over to him, speaking as he went. Off the top of my head? He asked, rhetorically, maybe he would have resurrected them. Inside their coffins, six feet underground, where they would have suffocated to death while desperately trying to claw their way out. Sasuke paled in this scenario. The blonde reaper continued, or maybe he would have brought them back as mindless flesh-eating undead that would have tried to devour you the moment they saw you. Or perhaps they would have been restored alive and well. Only for them to die in an unforeseen accident a few days later he then gave the Ichiha look, shall I continue? Because I have plenty more ideas of what would have happened. Sasuke gulped and shook his head. Good, Naruto said, before turning to the others, any more questions? After a moment of thought, Kakashi spoke. He said he was serving someone he said, someone called, as Azul Naruto interrupted. You know him? Kakashi asked, raising an eyebrow. I know of him Naruto corrected, he's a demon lord. One of the worst and definitely the most powerful. He's also the core biggest pain in the ass. Demon lord? Sakura asked, what's that? The most powerful beings in hell the answered, they rule over that infernal realm and answer only to Lucifer himself. Each one has a specific sphere of influence, and Azazel's is violence and destruction. Meaning. Sasuke said. He likes to cause wars and mass slaughters, Naruto said simply. Like my clan, Ichiha whispered. The blonde heard him, I don't know, he said, maybe he manipulated your brother into doing it, but I doubt it. Seems a bit low-key for him. 
Sasuke looked up at him and growled, low-key. He snarled. Azazel likes to cause conflicts that result in the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands, not dozens, Naruto said, trying to calm him, I know for a fact that he caused the first shinobi world war. The eyes of all of Team 7 widened in shock at these words. What? Kakashi said. You heard me, Naruto told him. What about the second? Or the third? He asked, horrified by the possibility that so many people he knew died because of a demon's machinations. People like Abito or Rin. I don't know Naruto answered him, maybe. He's surprisingly subtle in causing chaos, like so many other demon lords. I'm sure he enjoyed the war and exploited it, but I have no idea whether he caused it or not. Why would he do this? Sakura asked. For the same reason that oppressed the people of this country. He hates humanity, Naruto explained, all demons do. Why? Because they're told to the blonde answered, because their creator and master, Lucifer, hates us more than anything else, including the creator himself. He ensures that all demons are born with a burning hatred of humankind. Why does he hate us? Kakashi asked. That's a long story Naruto told his sensei, I'd rather not share it right now. He then began to move back towards the practice range, now, can I get back to training or do you have something else to ask me? I have one more question the silver-haired said, why did Shuther's body disappear? Demons and angels aren't made of solid mass like we are, Naruto explained, they're made of a type of energy called soul energy, which condenses into a solid shape and form. When demons or angels die, that energy is released and the body dissolves. It's why they call us things like fleshling or meat sack. He then turned back towards the practice range, pulling out eternal rest, now, if you'll excuse me. The blonde reaper began firing his weapon again, giving the others time to process what they had heard. Weeks later, it was time. After over a month in wave country, Tazuna's bridge was finally complete. During the battle at the bridge, the majority of Gato's army of thugs abandoned him and fled wave. The few that didn't accompany their boss and were chased out by the citizens of the country they had oppressed. Surprisingly, it was Inari who rallied the people against the mercenaries. Thanks to Naruto, the boy had recovered his courage and, after he heard what had happened on the bridge, he had spread the word about how Gato's army had abandoned him and the tyrant was dead. After this, the few remaining mercs had fled before the mob of angry citizens could lynch them. But the threat gone, Tazuna and his crew had been free to finish the bridge at their own pace. Now that the bridge was complete, Team 7's mission was over and it was time to return home. But they weren't going alone. They were going to be joined by one Haku Mamachi who took her adopted father's name after his death. After speaking with Naruto, Haku had agreed to come with them to Konoha and become a citizen and, possibly, a Kanoichi as well. She had told him she had decided to join because she wanted a safe place to settle down in and knew Konoha had the opposite opinion of bloodlines that Kiri did. Well that was a reason, it wasn't the reason she agreed. The truth was, Haku had fallen in love with her blonde friend and wanted to be with him, even if it meant joining a hidden village. At first, she was worried this was happening too fast, but she soon calmed down. This felt too right to be wrong. The whole town had come to see the group off. Thank you so much for everything you've done for us Tazuna told them, I promise, as soon as we're back on our feet, we'll pay you for an air rank mission. The Kashi nodded, thank you. It was no problem. Naruto looked at Inari and saw that the boy was desperately trying not to cry. The blonde smiled kindly and kneeled down. It's okay to cry, Inari, he assured him. Inari shook his head rapidly, H heroes don't cry he argued. Everyone cries sometimes Naruto told him, sometimes, it takes strength to not hold in our feelings. Sometimes, it takes strength to cry. At these words, Inari broke down and embraced his hero, sobbing. Naruto returned his embrace. I am miss why you, big brother he wept. Naruto was surprised by what Inari called him, but also happy. I miss you too, little brother the blonde told him, but this goodbye isn't forever, we'll see each other again one day he assured him. Inari looked up at him, hoping with tears in his eyes, are really? He asked, you p promise. I promise, he told the boy. The two then embraced again, before parting, with Inari feeling much better. Naruto was then surprised by Tsunami, who walked up to the blonde before kissing him on the cheek and then embracing him. She ignored Inari saying gross. All were oblivious to Haku, Inner Sakura, and Kurama's jealousy. Thank you she said, for avenging my husband and giving my son hope again. Naruto recovered from his surprise and returned her embrace. You're welcome. After this, the group bid farewell and began the journey back home. Hey Tsunami said, I just realized, we never gave the bridge a name. Azuna's eyes widened slightly, hey, you're right. He thought for a moment, how about? The super great bridge that Tazuna built. Tsunami smacked him on the back of the head, rolling her eyes. How about the Great Zabuza Bridge Inari said. Tsunami nodded, I agree. The Great Zabuza Bridge in honor of the man who was redeemed and helped save us from Gato. Azuna grinned at his family. The Great Zabuza Bridge is then. The crowd cheered in agreement. Finally, after years of darkness, the light of hope fell upon wave country once more. 
unknown location, in a dark room, where only the light of torches allowed any form of illumination, a massive being sat on an equally large throne. The being was contemplating the future and its own schemes when another being entered the room. It was a guardian demon, and it immediately knelt before the giant. By Lord Azazel he began, destroyer of nations, breaker of souls, bringer of war, lord of the circle of violence, and most powerful and favored of demon lords. I bring grave news. The being, now identified as Azazel, opened his eerie yellow eyes and looked down on his servant. The guardian gulped in fear and continued, it appears your servant in the human nation of Wave. Has been slain. This brought a modicum of surprise to the hulking demon lord. It appears that he was killed by. By an agent of our most persistent and reviled of enemies, the Reaper Corps the Guardian told his master. Azazel was silent, contemplating what he had heard. Approach me he commanded. His voice was dark, demonic, and it echoed within and shook the very room they occupied imagine Amon's voice from StarCraft II. The Guardian demon was terrified but didn't hesitate and slowly began to move towards his master. After a few moments, he was now kneeling directly in front of his lord. Azazel stared down at the lesser demon and then wrapped one of his hands around the creature's horn skull. The guardian began to struggle under the demon lord's vice grip. But stopped when his head exploded, crushed under the lord's strong grip. The lord of violence watched as the headless body fell to the floor, dissolving a few seconds later. Oh, how he hated bad news. Azazel stood up, ignoring the blood on the inside of his hand, and began to walk forward. So, Shuther had been slain. Unexpected. But not unprepared for. Wave Country was now no longer viable as a place to plan conflict, but there were many others. When one scheme fails, ten more will take its place. The Demon Lord made his way to a large pair of doors, shoved them open with his massive strength. He stepped out onto a balcony, which gave him a view of a large portion of the circle he ruled. The desert of the abominable sand stretched as far as the eye could see. The sounds of clashing blades, explosions, roars, screams both in anguish and from battle cries echoed throughout, with a glow of flames caused by magic or explosions lighting up the land, smoke rising towards the dark endless sky. Azazel closed his eyes, reveling in the sounds and smells of battle his servants engaged in. Some were waged for his amusement. Others, for attempts at power or to settle a score. It mattered not to the Lord of Violence. Conflict was conflict. Still. The wretched core had ruined yet another of his schemes. He had not expected further to fall in battle or even to be discovered. The Lord opened his eyes and held up his blood-covered hand. The blood on it then began to twist and shift, taking a shape. It was that of a human male, with spiked hair, a large scythe, and strange marks on either side of his face. The Reaper that had foiled his plan. Azazel's yellow eyes narrowed and he willed the construct to burst into flame and evaporate. This Reaper had his attention now. And that meant he was dead. Elsewhere, shortly after the Battle of the Bridge, Zabuza Mamachi opened his eyes to unfamiliar surroundings. The last thing he remembered, he was dying. He had said goodbye to Haku, had seen and felt the most beautiful and warm light in his life, before a strange hooded man showed up and touched his forehead. And now he was here. Wherever the hell here was. Welcome Zabuza Mamachi. The sound of a soft, rasping voice caused a former Seven Swordsman member to turn. And his eyes widened greatly. There, sitting on an ornate throne, was the Shinigami himself. I have a proposition for you. Chapter 9. The exams begin. A few months had passed since Team 7 had returned from their mission in Wave Country, and things were going well all around. For Naruto, there were a few differences, the biggest being that Haku Mamachi now lived with him. Thanks to Naruto's good word, the Sand Aim had made Haku a citizen of Kanahagakur, but would have to go through a six-month probationary period before she could be inducted into the Shinobi ranks. Until this time, Haku would remain a civilian, though she could still train and become stronger. Pirazin then offered to set her up in an apartment, but Naruto stopped him by requesting that Haku live in his home. Because of her friendship with him, combined with her not being a born citizen and having a bloodline, Naruto knew the risk of Haku being ostracized and exploited were high, so he had insisted that the raven-haired goddess live in his manor so that he could keep an eye on her and keep her safe, not that she couldn't defend herself. Haku had tried to turn him down, but the blonde had insisted. In the end, the opportunity to live with a man she had fallen in love with had proved too tempting, and she relented. Naruto's worry for her safety proved to be well-founded when the village council learned of her gift. The clan heads had been intrigued, but the advisor and civilian sides had been practically foaming at the mouth to add another powerful bloodline to the village. Things had gotten worse when Sasuke had demanded she be placed in his care so that he could use her to restore his clan. The thought of the Sharingan mixing with Haku's ice bloodline was even more ideal. The Sandame stopped this line of thought by reminding them that Haku was not a prisoner, but a citizen of their village, so she couldn't be treated as property, and the only way she would help Sasuke is if she agreed to it. Needless to say, that was never going to happen. When the Ichiha tried to press the issue, Naruto nearly killed him. Since then, he had stopped trying to force Haku to be with him. 
He had, however, tried to flatter and charm her into becoming his. This had failed in a most astounding manner, as Sasuke and Charm went together like salt and slugs. Sakura had been upset with her crush's obsession with Haku, but had bowed to prove herself the better choice for him. Speaking of Sakura, she had been training even more since the mission to wave. She felt as though she had been almost useless during the battles there, simply healing others. While this was important, she still felt like she could do more, so she had increased her training regimen. She had learned the Chakra Scalpel's Jutsu which, combined with her use of, would allow her to get close and eviscerate her foes. On a more personal issue, Sakura had taken Naruto's advice about her mother and had been informing her that, while her career as a Kinoichi was dangerous and possibly life-threatening, it was her choice. She informed her that she was happy and felt that, if her life ended prematurely, she would die happy at the very least. Her mother was still being stubborn but was beginning to come around. Sasuke, on the other hand, had become more distant from his teammates. Despite being told what would have happened if he had agreed to Shuther's deal on the bridge, Naruto knew Sasuke resented him for stopping him by killing the demonic gunslinger. He also resented his blonde teammate for denying him Haku and for being considerably more powerful than he was. He had been pushing himself to the breaking point every day trying to become stronger, but it seemed that, no matter how hard he pushed himself or how strong he became, Naruto was still the stronger of the two. Speaking of Naruto, he had just finished doing a mission with his team and was heading home to continue training and spend more time with Beatrice. The Asterian Beast had been very upset with him for disappearing for over a month. She had given him the silent treatment when he came home and had done her best to try and ignore him. Naruto had broken through this barrier easily, however, and things soon went back to normal with them. The Blonde Reaper had also thanked Kiba and Akamaru for keeping her company while he was gone. The presence of one of her friends and her best friend had kept her from rampaging through the village. Returning to the present, Naruto stopped walking when he heard a voice behind him. Hey boss. Naruto turned and smiled when he saw the grinning face of Konohamaru Sirotobi, along with his friends Mogi and Yudin, running towards him, they're all wearing their part 1 outfits. Hey Kono Naruto said after the three had caught up to him, how have you guys been? Are you behaving for Aruka sensei He asked, knowing that the three were enrolled in the ninja academy. The three shook their heads, looks of pride on their faces. Nope. Konohamaru told him proudly, we're pranking people and driving everyone crazy. Naruto grinned, that's what I thought. The blonde had met Konohamaru a few months ago while speaking with the Hokage. They were interrupted when the boy barged in, claiming he was finally going to defeat the old man and take his title. He rushed forward. Only to trip on his scarf and fall, hitting his head on the floor. He quickly got up, looked around, saw Naruto, and blamed him for his fall, rather than admit he had tripped. The blonde had scoffed and pointed out what had happened. This caused Konohamaru to start mouthing off to him, insulting him and all things associated with that. When he saw the blonde was unfazed, the boy took a swing at him. Naruto quickly caught the punch and pinned him to the ground, rendering him helpless but leaving him otherwise unharmed. He had advised the boy to think before acting and let him up. Konohamaru's tutor Abisu, who had followed him to the Hokage's office, had berated him for that but had been ignored. The next day, while Naruto had been heading home after a team meeting, he noticed he was being followed by a poorly disguised fake rock. When he pointed out that rocks didn't have perfectly squared edges, Konohamaru revealed himself. He had demanded though not in an arrogant or entitled manner that Naruto train him. The boy had begged him for hours getting a no each time when Naruto had finally asked why he wanted to be his student. Konohamaru told him that he was Sandame's grandson and had been treated like royalty his whole life. He hated being treated that way and longed to step out from under his grandfather's shadow and be seen as a person rather than by his being related to his grandfather. So far, Mogi, Yudin, and Naruto were the only people who treated him like a normal person. Seeing how strong the blonde was, Konohamaru had hoped that Naruto would train him to help him achieve his goal. When Naruto asked why he couldn't just settle for his tutor, the boy had explained that Abisu coddled him like everyone else. It was at that point that said tutor showed up and demanded that the blonde reaper step away from the honorable grandson, a title that made Konohamaru frown. When Naruto refused to do so, Ibisu tried to force him. Only to find himself easily defeated. Naruto then told Konohamaru that he would consider training him one day, after he had finished the academy. Until then, he told the boy he was happy to be his friend. Since then, the two had grown close, with the boy introducing him to his friends, who had also come to admire him, and the three sought to emulate him by wearing goggles similar to his own when he was younger, and by behaving the same way he did when he was around their age, pulling pranks and generally driving everyone crazy. Naruto encouraged this. He still had a mischievous eye, but knew he would one day have to pass the torch onto the younger generation. Besides, pulling pranks required stealth, patience and speed to run away and avoid being punished and served as good practice for the two boys and one girl. I'm glad you are all having fun Naruto told them, but I take it you came to see for another reason. 
The three nodded and gave him their most adorable pleading looks. Will you play ninja with us? They all asked at the same time. Naruto laughed, sure, why not? He told them, causing their eyes to brighten and smiles to appear on their faces. A ninja playing ninja, huh? The four turned and saw Sakura standing nearby, having heard everything they said. That's a bit redundant, isn't it? She asked. She was smiling, indicating that she was only teasing. They're kids, Sakura, Naruto told her, besides, you're never told to be a kid again. The Konohamaru Corps, the name they gave themselves, stared at the pink-haired young woman. Who's she? Kono asked. Oh, right Naruto said, realizing he had yet to introduce them, guys, this is Sakura Haruno, one of my teammates. Sakura, this is Konohamaru, Mogi, and Yudin he said, gesturing to each one. It's very nice to meet you, Yudin said, politely. Sakura smiled at him. Konohamaru, meanwhile, was glancing back and forth at Naruto and Sakura. Wait a minute he said, I know what's going on. The rest of the group was confused by this. Kono gave his boss a wide grin, she's your girlfriend, right? The two teens blushed at the thought. Then no Naruto said, she's just my teammate. Why yeah Sakura said, w we're just teammates. For now. Inner Sakura told herself. Shut up. Why not? Mogi asked, disappointed, she's so pretty. Yudin nodded in agreement, she's a very attractive lady he pointed out, before sniffing up his usual snot drip. The two teammates were trying to think of a way to explain this, but were stopped when Kono spoke up. I don't know he said, looking up and down, she's got a nice butt, I guess, but her chest is a little flat, he then looked up at his role model, you could do better, boss. Suddenly, the air around the group grew thicker. Kono turned his head slowly and saw Sakura, her eyes glowing red. She seemed to exude an aura of rage and death. Kono. Naruto began. The boy gulped, why ya? Yeah. Run. The boy with the scarf did so, turning and fleeing as quickly as he could, Sakura right behind him. At back here you little shit. Help. A flat-chested monster is trying to kill me. Sakura's response was to screech in fury. Naruto chuckled a bit. Alright he said, fun's over. Better stop this before she kills him. He then took off after them, Mogi and Yudin right behind him. They followed the trail of the pursuit and, after a few moments, heard Kono's voice. Oof. He grunted out, with the sound of a collision accompanying this. Hey, watch it you little brat. Let me go. Kono's panicked voice caused Naruto to turn down the street where he saw the boy, Sakura, and two strangers. The first wore a strange black baggy full bodysuit with a red and yellow circle on the front. He also wore a black hood which covered his head completely and had cat-like ears on it. He sported face paint and had a large object wrapped in bandages strapped to his back. The second was an extremely attractive young woman. She had blue eyes and blonde hair wrapped in four ponytails. She wore a light purple-colored off-the-shoulders garment that extended halfway down her thighs, with a scarlet sash tied around her waist. She wore fishnet over her shoulders and legs, specifically on her right calf and her left thigh. She had a massive folded war fan on her back. Both wore Sun Agakur headbands and looked to be a year or two older than him. The young man was holding up Konohamaru by his shirt. Put me down. Kono told him. Snot-nosed little punk the male Sunanin said, you should have watched where you were going. The Kinoichi rolled her eyes. Oh for God's sake she sighed, put the kid down Kankuro. You know he won't like it if you cause a scene. He's not here the one identified as Kankuro replied, besides, I have to teach this runt some manners. Please Akura said, trying to intervene, it was my fault, he was running from me. Stay out of this, Kankuro growled. Put the boy down, Naruto ordered him. The pair looked up and saw the blonde newcomer. The Kinoichi couldn't help but blush at his appearance. Hubba hubba. Kankuro, meanwhile, scoffed. Or what? He asked, you gonna. Before he could finish his sentence, he felt cold steel touch his throat. Put. The boy. Down Naruto threatened, having appeared behind the strangely dressed shinobi in a burst of speed. The two Sunanin were shocked by this. Ankuro, fearing for his life, dropped Konohamaru, who rushed over to his friends. Thank you, Naruto said, before holstering Harvest. He then noticed the blushing Kinoichi. He smirked and walked over to her. Hello beautiful he said, before taking her hand and kissing the back of it, my name is Naruto. What's yours? The Kinoichi blushed. He Tamari she stuttered out, blushing bright red. The pleasure to meet you Tamari Chan Naruto said, giving her a seductive grin, making her blush brighter. Meanwhile, Kankuro was growing angry at being ignored. Hey. Don't you ignore me. Why? The blonde asked, I'd much rather spend time with your lovely companion than a boy who wears his sister's makeup. Tamari blushed further, while Kankuro grew even more furious. It's war paint. He yelled, ignoring Tamari's laughter. Of course it is, Naruto said in a condescending tone. Kankuro growled and pulled out the wrapped object from behind his back. Tamari's eyes widened slightly. Kankuro, you're really not thinking of using crow, are you? She asked. Bet your ass I am. He told her. Oh, I wouldn't do that if I were you, Naruto told him. Yeah. 
And why's that? He asked. Aside from ensuring you live past today. The blonde asked, rhetorically, your friend up in the tree wouldn't be too happy. Asuna Nin looked up. Only for all the blood to leave their faces. There, standing on a nearby branch, was a boy around Naruto's age. He had pale skin and short, spiky red hair. His eyes were a pale blue-green, and he had black rings around them. He had a strange tattoo, the kanji for love, on the left side of his forehead, with his forelocks parted to make it more visible. He wore a black full bodysuit with t-shirt-like sleeves, 3D four-length legs, and an open neck. With this, he wore a white cloth over his right shoulder and the left side of his hips, and a wide leather band system over the left shoulder and right side of his hips. Strapped to this band was a large gourd on his back. He also had his headband attached to this band. Ankuro, the redhead said in a soft, yet still menacing, tone, you're a disgrace to our village. Gigara. Kankuro said in surprise, I I was just. I I mean I. Shut up the younger nin, now known as Gara, interrupted, or I'll kill you. Ankuro wisely became silent and averted his eyes. Gara then disappeared in a swirl of sand, only to reappear right in front of Naruto. I apologize for my teammate's stupidity, he told the blonde. It's no problem, Naruto told him, I'm just glad the matter was settled before he harmed the Hokage's grandson. Ankuro's eyes widened, clearly nervous about what he almost did. Naruto continued, I'm Naruto Uzumaki, he introduced himself. I am Gara. the redhead told him, and these are my teammates, Kankuro and Tamari. The pleasure the blonde said, bang, I take it the three of you are here for the Chunin exams. He asked, referring to the exam that would be happening the following week. Gara nodded, we are. Then I wish you the best. Gara looked the blonde up and down for a moment. You are a strange one, he said, I hope to see you in the exams. As do I. Gara stared at him for a moment before turning and walking away, Kankuro, Tamari, we're leaving he told them. The two followed their teammate, with Kankuro sparing one last glare and Tamari one last wandering gaze and blush. There's something different about that one. Naruto thought, referring to Gara. That's because he's the container of my youngest sibling, the Ichibi no Shukaku Kurama told him. The blonde container's eyes widened, are you sure? It's been a long time, but that presence is unmistakable, his partner informed him. Naruto thought about this. So, I was competing in the exams. Even if the tanuki was the weakest of the tailed beasts, it was still quite powerful. Assuming Gara had control over his tailed beast, it would take tremendous effort to bring him down. He was brought out of his thoughts by Konohimaru. Thanks boss he told the blonde, but I could have handled him. Naruto chuckled and patted the boy's head. Oh, I don't doubt it he then turned to the others, anyone up for some Raymond? My treat, of course. The Konohimaru core eagerly agreed, while Sakura simply nodded. As the group prepared to depart, Naruto made one last remark. Get out of tree Sasuke he said, you're not fooling anyone. The Ichiha heir jumped down, annoyed that he had been detected, since he thought he was doing well. Frowning, he left for his home, eager to train more and ultimately prove himself the superior shinobi. He was unaware of the three pairs of eyes watching him. The following morning, the genin of Team 7 waited on a bridge overlooking a small stream. They had shown up two hours after their sensei told them to and, as usual, the silver-haired man was nowhere to be seen. The three knew he would be here soon, though. Three, two, one Naruto thought. At the exact moment his countdown ended, Kakashi arrived. Late again, sensei, Naruto said, what was it this time? Did you get lost on the road of life? Or did you have to help an old lady cross the street? Kakashi gave him an eye smile, nope. A black cat crossed my path so I had to take the long way around. Few eye rolls from all three teens. Anyway Kakashi continued, I have good news for you all. You decided to stop reading Icha Icha every second of the day. His blonde student asked. Kakashi ignored that and continued, I signed the three of you up for the Chunin exams he told them. This surprised them, with Naruto being confused, Sakura becoming nervous, and Sasuke showing eagerness. Why? Naruto asked, we've been a team for less than a year. Why enroll us so soon? True, we haven't been a team for too long Kakashi acquiesced, but I have faith in you. I think you three will do well and, even if you don't, the exams will still prove to be an invaluable learning experience. But then gave each of them a piece of paper, these are your admission slips he told them, present these at the academy at 7am, 6 days from now if you want to enter. If you don't, stay home he then gave them another eye smile, I'm giving you all the week off to train and prepare. Ciao. He then vanished in a swirl of leaves. After a moment of silence, Sakura spoke. Well. What do we do now? She asked. We prepare, Naruto told her, we can only enter the exams as a team. If even one of us decides not to enter, we can't compete. Sakura's nervousness increased, but I, I don't know if I can do this. She told him. You can, he told her, placing a hand on her shoulder in a comforting way, and we'll be right there with you, every step of the way. Sakura gave him a thankful look. With that, the team separated, eager to prepare for the exams to come. 
the academy, the day of the exams, Naruto was waiting outside the academy entrance when both of his teammates arrived. Good, you're all here he said, I assume you are ready. Sasuke scoffed, of course I am. Sakura nodded, I'm a little nervous she admitted, but I won't hold you guys back. I'll do my best. Naruto nodded, I know you will. This caused them to blush. The trio then entered the academy. The admission forms dictated that they all make their way to room 303, which was on the third floor. After they made their way upstairs, they saw a large crowd of genin trying to get into the room, only to be blocked by two other genin who were telling them not to bother, explaining that they had taken the exam several times, only to fail each time. They reasoned that if they couldn't do it, the group before them had no chance. Naruto quickly saw through the deception. The two genin were clearly higher rank shinobi in disguise, trying to weed out the weaker teams. That, and the group was still on the second floor. Good, that meant less competition for them. He was about to inform his team of this when Sasuke, who also noticed the deception, decided to open his big arrogant mouth. Drop the already he said, smirking, we're still on the second floor, you're not fooling me. Naruto palmed his face. You colossal idiot. Sasuke turned to face him, confused. What? That was designed to weed out the weaker teams. Thanks to you, we have more competition in the exams. He told the spoiled heir. Sasuke thought about this and quickly realized his mistake. Unwilling to own up to it, he scoffed, whatever. I'm not afraid of these weaklings. Idiot, inner Sakura muttered. Don't call him that. Sakura told herself, though, deep down, she knew he had messed up big time. The two genin meanwhile glanced at each other before turning to face the Ichiha. Not bad one said, but let's see how you deal with a more physical confrontation. He then rushed forward, ready to strike Sasuke. As the Ichiha readied himself, a green blur intercepted the disguised nin and knocked him aside. The blur was then revealed to be a teenage boy around their age. Naruto was a man who had seen strange and horrifying things, but this young man surpassed them all by far. He was wearing the most hideous green jumpsuit the blonde had ever seen, even worse than his old orange one. With this monstrosity, he wore orange leg warmers and his red Konoha headband as a belt. He had black hair and wore it in a bowl-cut style. His dark eyes were large, round, and full of life. And his eyebrows, dear god, were huge, thick, and so creepy looking. Creepiness aside, he's fast Naruto thought. Even he had trouble keeping up with the strange boy's speed. The boy's bright eyes bore into the team in front of him, lingering on Sakura and Sasuke the most. You're Sasuke Ichiha, yes? He asked. The Ichiha eyed the creepy teen and nodded. And you are Sakura Haruno? He asked. They nodded. He then surprised her by grabbing both of her hands. Will you go out with me? He asked. I promise I will protect you with my life. Sakura could only stare at the strange boy. After a few seconds, she answered him. Uh. No, she said simply. The teen was then gone, crouching in a corner, a rain cloud over his head. Oh for God's sake, Lee another voice said, can't you go five minutes without bothering someone? The voice came from an attractive young woman who looked to be a year or so older than Naruto. Her eyes were dark brown, as was her hair, which she wore in two buns. She had short fringe bangs framing her lovely face. She wore a pink sleeveless blouse with red sleeve trimmings and yellow fastening buttons and dark green pants. The pouch attached to her thigh and her headband and sandals were both blue. Her eyes held a certain fire in them. An eagerness to prove herself. Behind her was another male teen. He had pale skin and long dark brown hair, which was tied in a ponytail a few inches above the end. He wore a khaki shirt, a dull blue shirt beneath that, and mesh armor beneath that. He wore dark brown shorts, blue shinobi sandals, and wrapped bandages around his right arm, chest, and right leg. His white pupilless eyes revealed him to be a Hayuga, one Naruto had seen before. Niji, he believed his name was. Those eyes also held contempt for all things around him and a hidden inner rage. The girl then looked up at Naruto, blushing slightly at his appearance. Sorry about him she told him, I'm Tenten, this is Niji Hayuga, and the whimpering man-child over there is Rock Lee. Naruto then grabbed her hand and tenderly kissed the back of it, I'm Naruto Uzumaki, and this is Sasuke Chiha and Sakura Hirono. Tenten blushed at his greeting and then widened her eyes slightly at hearing his name. So, he's the one that, she shook her head free of this train of thought, not wanting to think of the memories it was connected to, and noticed the scythe on his back. Almost found Harvest intimidating, to Tenten, it was the most beautiful thing she had ever seen in her life. Awesome scythe. She remarked, jumping behind him to examine it. Thank you Naruto told her, surprised by her reaction, it's called Harvest. Tenten held out a trembling hand. Can I can I touch it? She asked, her eyes becoming like a puppy's. Naruto knew he couldn't resist, of course he told her. The upholstered harvest and held it out to her. Denton eagerly tried to grab it. Only to be surprised when the part of the hilt she reached for bent backwards, away from her hands. Harvest, be nice the blonde reaper told his weapon, before looking up at the beautiful weapons expert, sorry about that. 
Harvest is sentient and is very particular about who holds it. Denton's eyes widened in surprise. She had heard of sentient weapons, but knew, but they were incredibly rare. To see one now, in the flesh. Naruto then held out his scythe again, try it now he said. Denton carefully reached for the weapon again, and this time was able to grasp it. As she held it, she marveled at how light it was. The weapon was huge, but it felt almost weightless. As she studied its design, she quickly realized it was crafted by a blacksmith who had incredible skill, far beyond anything she could ever hope to achieve. She suddenly felt a surge of energy flow through her, the weapon's desire to go back to its owner apparent. Okay, okay she said, before handing it back to Naruto, thanks she said. Naruto nodded and holstered the side. We don't have time for this, Tenten Niji told her, we have an exam to take. The Hayuga had been glaring at the blonde since he had heard his name. This is the one Hinata-sama is close to he thought, clenching his fists at the thought of his cousin. Tenten nodded, I'm coming Niji she told him, before turning back to Naruto, it was nice meeting you. Naruto kissed her hand once more, the pleasure was all mine Tenten-chan. The girl blushed and quickly left with her teammates. Sakura ignored the jealous grumbling from her inner self. Well then the blonde said, turning to face his teammates, shall we go? Sasuke and Sakura nodded, and the three made their way upstairs. Only to find Rock Lee, alone, waiting for them. Shouldn't you be with your team? Naruto asked. Lee ignored him and pointed at Sasuke, Sasuke Achiha, I challenge you to a spar. He declared. This got raised eyebrows from all three members of Team 7. Really? Now? Naruto asked, you couldn't wait until the exam starts. Lee shook his head. Why? Lee was silent for a moment before speaking again. Tell me, what do you think is better? To be born with talent or to earn your skill through rigorous training. The latter, obviously, Naruto said, confused as to where this was going. Lee gave him a thumbs up, Yash. Your attitude is most youthful. Youthful? Naruto thought. That is why I am challenging you, Sasuke, Lee continued, returning his focus to the Achiha. I've heard that you're a prodigy in the shinobi ways, and I am eager to prove that hard work trumps natural talent any day of the week. Sasuke smirked arrogantly. This freak had no idea who he was dealing with. I accept your challenge he told the energetic genin. Both got into a fighting stance, only to be stopped by Naruto. No, he told them. What? They both asked, confused. We have an exam to take, he reminded them, so we don't have time to determine which of you is strongest. Save it for the exams. With respect, this isn't your decision to make, Lee told the blonde, whose name he still didn't know. Back off dobe, this is my fight Sasuke told his teammate. Naruto stared at both of them for a moment before sighing. Fine, he relented, you have five minutes. If a winner isn't declared by then, I'm stopping the fight. The two were about to argue, but stopped when the blonde sent a withering glare at each of them. A few seconds later, the fight started. It turned out, five minutes was two minutes too long. Sasu thought this fight would be easy, especially with his Sharingan, only to find this wasn't the case. Lee's speed was inhuman. He ran circles around the Achiha, getting through his guard and dodging any blow sent at him. Even Sasuke Sharingan couldn't keep up with him. After three minutes of this, Lee delivered a powerful, swift upper kick that launched the dark-haired teen into the air. It was clearly meant to move him into a vulnerable aerial position, the beginning of some kind of technique Lee seemed confident would end the fight. What that technique was, however, was never revealed, as the fight was stopped by a talking tortoise. Yes, you read that correctly. A talking tortoise. The tortoise was only the second strangest being that appeared. It was swiftly followed by a man who was clearly Lee's sensei. If they thought Lee was creepy, they hadn't seen anything yet. This man looked exactly like Lee, only a decade or so older, and could have passed for his father. He sported the same green jumpsuit and bowl haircut. His eyebrows. The horror. They looked like giant woolly caterpillars, ready to crawl off his face at any moment. The strange man introduced himself as Might Guy and spent the next few moments berating Lee for almost using a technique that he had forbidden him to use, never mentioning what that technique was. After this, it looked as though Guy was going to strike his mini-me. He didn't. Instead, he did something much worse. He hugged him while crying what he would call manly tears, with Lee soon following his example. To make matters worse, as the two weeping men embraced, what could only be described as the most horrifying ever created appeared before them. A sunset on a beach with crashing waves. The genin of Team 7 tried desperately to dispel the horrid illusion. Even Naruto, who was mostly immune thanks to his partnership with Kurama, was unable to break it. Fortunately, this soon ended and Guy and Lee departed, though not before giving them their nicest nice guy grins. This only served to make them shudder. I've witnessed horrors beyond imagining Naruto said, I've fought demons, werewolves, ghosts, zombies, and things that would drive most men mad he took a deep breath, but never have I ever witnessed something as eye-gouging horrifying as that. He told his teammates. Sakura placed a comforting hand on his shoulder. 
I'm fine he told her, after taking a moment to shake it off, we should keep going, he then glared at Sasuk, unless, of course, you wish to prove how much of an alpha male you are to someone else. Sasuk glared back but said nothing. No. Great, let's go. After a few more minutes of walking, the three arrived at the entrance of room 303. After giving each other glances to see if they all wanted this, the trio entered the classroom. Only to be bombarded by a wave of killing intent coming from a horde of Chunin helpfuls in the room. Despite the killing intent coming from dozens of people, it was nowhere near as bad as what Zabuza had used against them. Still, it made Sakura nervous and Sasu clenched his fists. After a few moments of this, Naruto was fed up. Alright, enough of this. He then blasted them with his one killing intent. Those who aimed their killing intent at Team 7 soon found themselves frozen in fear as the cold energy enveloped the room, causing frost to form on the windows. Is there a problem here? Naruto asked, quietly. The teams that had tried to intimidate them averted their eyes and stopped using their killing intent. That's what I thought. Before the team could move any further, they heard a cry of joy. Naruto-kun. They turned and saw Ino Yamanaka run over to Naruto and jump into his arms, embracing him. There you are. I was worried you wouldn't come. She told me, happy that he returned her embrace, did you miss me? She asked, giving him her most seductive smile. Naruto smiled back, of course, Ino-chan. Your beautiful face always brightens my day. He told his fellow blonde. Ino's smile widened and she held him tighter. Since she and her team had arrived, several of the other male and a couple of female genin had hit on her, but she ignored them. Only one man held her attention now and he was holding her in his arms. That off my teammate Ino Pig. Sakura demanded, ignoring her inner self screeching at her to kill the blonde girl. Ino gave Sakura a bored look, oh. Hey forehead she greeted, you're here too, I see. Of course I'm here Sakura growled out, we're on the same team. Good for you her former friend told her, now go away. I'm spending time with Neru-kun. As much as I enjoy holding a goddess like yourself, Naruto began, interrupting them, I'm going to have to put you down. Ino gave him her most adorable pout, oh she whined, do you have to? I'm afraid so, my dear he told her, then surprised her by pulling her closer so that he could whisper in her ear. But I'll make it up to you later he told her in a seductive tone, causing her to shudder in pleasure, how about I take you out to dinner this weekend? He offered, rubbing her sides and savoring the softness of her flawless skin. Ino pulled back. Ah really? She asked. Naruto nodded. Ino squealed and hugged him tight before releasing him, allowing herself to be set down. Must you be so troublesome, Ino? The voice of her teammate, Shikamaranara, told her. The blonde girl turned and glared at her teammate, who was accompanied by Choji. Back off lazy. She growled. Shikamaru held up his hands in a placating gesture, sighing and saying troublesome again. Shikamaru, Choji Naruto greeted, good to you again. You too, Naruto Choji said, his mouth full of chips that came from a bag he was eating out of. Don't talk with your mouth full. Ino scolded. But I'm hungry. Looks like all us rookies are here a new voice said. The group saw Hinata, Shino, and Kiba who had spoken approach them. Hey guys Naruto greeted, giving Kiba a brotherly embrace and scratching Akamaru behind the ears before turning to Hinata. It's good to see you, Naruto-kun, Hinata greeted. Naruto gave her a foxy grin, you too, Hinata-chan. The two childhood friends embraced. Hinata blushed, enjoying herself greatly. Naruto was also enjoying himself. Hinata was perfect in every possible way. He breathed in her scent a mixture of lavender and vanilla and found it to be as intoxicating as ever. Oh god he thought, I've got it bad, don't I? It had taken weeks, but recently the blonde reaper had admitted to himself a truth he tried so desperately to ignore. He was in love with Hinata Hayuga. Naruto didn't want this to happen. He knew it was impossible for her to return his feelings. She was perfect and the heiress to the most influential clan in Konoha, while he was the village pariah with years of mental and emotional baggage. It would never work. Naruto was so certain of this that she was the only woman aside from Sakura he didn't try to flirt with. He had hoped that his feelings for her would fade. That he would move on and hope that Hinata would find a good man to be with and love, like Kiba. But this didn't happen. His feelings had only intensified, and now, he was in love with his oldest friend. To make matters worse, he found himself falling for Kurama, Ino, and Haku as well. His feelings were a mess. He decided to push this train of thought aside and focus on what was to come. After a very long hug, the two separated. Ino was trying her best to hide her jealousy. Inner Sakura wasn't and Kurama was gritting her teeth in anger at the attention the two human females had showered on her love. You kids should keep it down a new, unfamiliar voice told the rookie nine. The group turned and saw a young man several years older than themselves. He had ash gray hair, which was kept in a ponytail that extended to his upper back, with bangs framing either side of his forehead. His eyes were onyx in color, and he wore a pair of black-rimmed circular glasses around them. 
He was wearing a dark purple shirt with a high collar, a white undershirt, dark purple fingerless gloves with armored plates on the back of the hands, a white cloth waistband worn at an angle, dark purple pants, blue sandals, and a shuriken holster on his right leg. His headband signified as being a Kanoha shinobi. A lot of the teams here are eager for blood, the newcomer told them, they're really on edge. You keep talking and they might lash out. Naruto raised an eyebrow, I'm sorry, and you are. The man rubbed the back of his head sheepishly. Right, sorry he told them, I'm Kabuto Yakushi, and I just thought I'd give you all some friendly advice. I'm something of a veteran of these exams. So this is your second time taking the exam, Kabuto-san? Sakura asked. My seventh, actually, he told her. This caused the group's eyes to widen. Wakiba said, you must really suck. Kabuto shrugged. Naruto, meanwhile, had a bad feeling about this guy. Probably Kabuto said, answering Kiba's accusation, but taking this exam so many times has allowed me to collect information about the various teams and countries taking part in them, he then knelt down and pulled out a deck of cards. My ninja info cards he explained, I infuse them with chakra and they show me information on whatever I want to know. Provided the information is available he then looked up at the group and smiled, anyone you guys want to know about in particular? He asked. Naruto raised an eyebrow again, you'd give out your information to us for free. He asked, skeptical, just like that. Well, I won't tell you anything about myself or my teammates he explained, but I see no harm in letting you know about the others in the exam he smiled, who knows. Maybe you'll use the info to reduce the competition so I can finally pass this time. Naruto's bad feeling was only growing worse. I have some people I'd like to know about, Sasuke told the older man. Great. Kabuto told him, who did you have in mind? Rock Lee and soon an in named Gara. he then spared his male teammate a glance, and Naruto Uzumaki. The blonde rolled his eyes, subtle he told the Achiha sarcastically. Nearby, a Kinoichi with glasses, red hair, and a Sun Agakur headband heard this name, causing her eyes to widen. Then Yuzumaki? She thought, but. But that's impossible. Mom said we were the only ones left. Back with the rookies and Kabuto, the Ashen haired man scoffed. You know their names? He asked, that takes all the fun out of it. He then placed three cards face down on the floor, channeled Chakra into it, and flipped one over, revealing an image of Rock Lee with a bunch of statistics beside it. Okay Kabuto began, first up is Rock Lee. He's a Kanoha Genin, like us, on Team 9. His teammates are Tenton no last name and Niji Hayuga, and his sensei is one Mike guy. Mission records show he has completed 20 D rank missions and 11 C ranks. Not bad. No info on his ninjutsu and skills, but his tojutsu is off the charts. He said, slightly surprised. To put it lightly, Naruto said quietly. Moving along, Kabuto continued, Gara. No known surname. Like you said before, he's a Sunajenin. His teammates are Kankuro and Tamari his eyes then widened slightly, who are also his siblings. That's quite a coincidence. Unlikely Naruto thought. His sensei is a man called Baki Kabuto said, no D ranks, but he has completed 8 C ranks and a B rank. The spectacled man told them in surprise before moving on, no info on his skills, but it says here that he's returned from every mission he's been on without a single scratch. This worried the group. Not only was this guy a complete enigma, he also seemed to be untouchable. Naruto, meanwhile, had expected this. And finally, Naruto Uzumaki, Kabuto said, Kanoha Genin, obviously, assigned to Team 7 under Kakashi Haddock. His teammates are Sasuke Chiha and Sakura Haruno he looked up, though I'm sure you already knew that before anyone could speak, he continued, let's see. He's completed 28 D ranks, 4 C ranks. And an A rank. His eyes widened at this. They widened further when he saw his skill stats. Ninjutsu is off the charts, with Tajutsu also ranking very high. Jinjutsu is unknown, but he's also highly skilled as well. He then went into even further detail. Wields a sentient scythe called Harvest, which can transform into a spear or an arm blade. Has a bloodline called Dark Release his eyes then widened, and he's the son of the Yandame Hokage. He was interrupted when he felt a blade at his throat. I don't think you want to finish that sentence, Naruto growled. The Buto gulped and shook his head, no, I, I don't think I do he told him. How did he get behind me so quickly? Naruto holstered his weapon and backed away. His bad feeling was now being confirmed. This guy claimed to be a genin, but had access to restricted information about him only the Hokage and his teammates would know, his weapon and his bloodline. The blonde then felt someone approaching him and inwardly cursed when he saw a team of muscular Wagaker Genin approach him. Did that guy just say you're the son of Minato Namikas? The leader demanded. Naruto nodded. The older boy looked him up and down, you are his son, aren't you? He asked, you look just like him. I can practically smell his stench on you. Good for you. Is this going somewhere? The blonde asked, bored. The Iwa Genin snarled, that bastard you call dad murdered a lot of good Iwa shinobi he told him, we never got a chance to pay him back for that. 
Enjoy your last few days of breathing, because when the exams start, you're dead. He threatened. How cute, Naruto said, rolling his eyes at the pathetic threats. The genin growled and was moved to attack. Only to find the blonde side at his throat. The Iwanin's teammates were about to intercede, but stopped when they, too, felt blades at their throats, courtesy of two shadow clones. Everyone in the room widened their eyes. They hadn't even seen him make hand signs. Where did those clones come from? Why don't you Neanderthals go find something else to do before I hang you with your own entrails? He told them in an all to calm voice, I'd rather not get blood all over my coat. Yet. The blonde lowered his blade and willed his clones to vanish in puffs of smoke. D this ain't over. The lead Iwa Genin told him as he and his teammates moved away from him as quickly as they could. Dude, that was awesome. Kiba complimented. Naruto grinned, you haven't seen anything yet. Habuto then cleared his throat, so, anyone else you guys would like to know about? He asked. The group shook their heads. All right then he said, putting his cards away and standing up, I have to say, this is the largest and most diverse Chuanin exam I've ever seen he told them, people from all five of the great villages are here. Even smaller villages like Omegakur or the newcomers from Atagakur have sent teams to compete, he adjusted his glasses, though Odo only sent one team he noted, before shrugging, not surprising, considering how small and insignificant they are. I don't think you should have said that, Naruto told him. The Buto looked at him, confused, why? His answer came when a figure quickly darted through the crowd and threw a punch at the Ashen haired man. The blow was fast, but Kabuto was able to dodge it. If just barely. The room froze for a moment. Before Kabuto suddenly had a look of pain on his face. He fell to his knees and vomited. What the buddy dodged it? Sakura thought, with the others thinking along the same lines. Naruto, Kiba, and Akamaru meanwhile, winced as they heard a sharp ringing noise after the punch was thrown. The former had just enough glibness to lean down and whisper, because they heard you to Kabuto. The figure who threw the punch stood up, revealing himself to be one of the genin from the Odo team. His face was covered in bandages, with only his left eye being uncovered. He wore a large poncho with long sleeves, a grey patterned scarf around his neck, a straw raincoat protruding from the back of his scarf, and a large gauntlet on the arm he had attacked with. His posture was hunched, hiding his height from the others. Behind him were his teammates, another shinobi and a kinoichi. The shinobi had spiky, dark hair and dark eyes. He wore a beige shirt with two black stripes and three prints of the kanji for death down the front. His headband had an attached tapuri under the cloth, rather than connected to the metal plate. He also wore a patterned scarf around his neck. A cocky, yet sadistic smirk was visible on his face. The kinoichi caught Naruto's eye the most. She had very long black hair, which reached down to her ankles and was tied by a violet ribbon right near the end. She had striking black eyes and wore a pale green vest somewhat similar to a flak jacket and grey patterned pants. Like her teammates, she also wore a patterned scarf. She was beautiful, a complete knockout. The Odo girl noticed the blonde checking her out and blushed, averting her eyes. Put this on your cards the bandage Genin told them, the Atagakur team will be winning this year's exam. That's a fact. Before anyone could speak, numerous whirls of leaves filled the room, several adult ninja emerging from them. The most prominent was the man in front. He was tall and imposing, complemented by his scarred face. He wore a bandana on his head and a black overcoat. The man looked around, surveying the genin in the room. All right you little shits, sit down and shut up. He commanded. He then noticed the Odo genin. You. Odo team. Unless you want to be kicked out before we get started, settle the fuck down and get to your seats. The bandaged one bowed. My apologies he told the imposing man, we just got a little excited, that's all. The man scoffed, keep your excitement to yourselves he told the genin. The team from Odo then went to their seats, though not before the bandaged one sent one last glance at Sasuke, and the Kinoichi looked Naruto up and down and blushed. A few moments later, the remaining genin had sat down. Naruto and Hinata were delighted to find they were sitting next to each other. Listen up. The rugged man told them, my name is Ibiki Moreno, and I'll be in charge of this first exam. I'm also head of the torture and interrogation department of this village he then gave them a dark grin, so don't fuck with me. Meanwhile, with the senseis. So, they've got Ibiki as their first proctor Asuma Siratobi said, I don't envy them. Who? Kuranayu he asked, unfamiliar with the name. Ibiki Moreno. He's the head of T and I Kakashi had a cancer her, not looking up from his orange novel, which infuriated the Kinoichi. They put a guy who tortures people for a living in charge of the first exam? The raven-haired woman asked, shocked. He's not just another interrogator Asuma told her, he's an expert in mental torture. He can make cages spill their guts without lifting a finger. Kurunai shuddered inwardly at the thought. She decided to change the subject. How do you all think your genin will do? She asked them. Asuma lit another cigarette and drew from it, I think mine will be fine he answered her, they started out a little rocky at first, but they work well together, just like their parents did he told them honestly, what about you Kurunai? 
you think yours have what it takes. The beauty nodded, I do she told him, they've been good together since the day I met them she smiled, thinking about how well her team got along, even getting Shino to come out of his shell more, though you would have looked closely to even notice. My guy then decided to voice his own opinion, my team perfectly embodies the spirit of youth. He told them, they will emerge victorious from this exam. He then turned to Kakashi, don't you agree, my youthful rival? Um? You say something guy. The silver-haired asked, looking up from his novel. I retreated into a corner, damn your coolness Kakashi. He mumbled. What about your team, Kakashi? Asuma asked. The Cyclops looked up at him, I'll think they'll do well he told them, Sasuke has trouble working with the others, but he'll pull through. Sakura may not be as strong as the boys, but her skill in medical ninjutsu will prove quite useful. What about Naruto? Kurinai asked. Kakashi gave her a serious look. I'll tell you the exact same thing I told Aruka when he confronted me about allowing my team to take the exams. Which is. I pity whoever is unlucky or dumb enough to go up against Naruto Uzumaki he told them. His serious tone piqued their curiosity. Just how powerful was the blonde. Back at the academy, so here's how this exam is going to go, Ibiki continued, this is a written test with 10 questions. When I tell you to start, you will have one hour, and not a second more, to complete the test he then smirked, but there's more he told them, each of you will start out with 100 points. For every answer you get wrong, 10 points will be taken off your score. If your score becomes zero, you and your team fail. There was a roar of complaints from some of the genin. Silence. Ibiki ordered, quickly silencing them. He then continued, it goes without saying that cheating will not be tolerated. If you are caught cheating, 20 points will be removed from your score. Basically, if you get caught cheating five times, you and your team fail, he then gestured to the shinobi that had arrived with him, these guys will be positioned throughout the room, keeping an eye on you he then remembered something, oh, and one last thing. You'll soon notice the tenth question on the exam is blank he informed them, when the hour mark is over, the tenth question will be asked to the remaining teams. Any questions? None were asked, and so, after the tests were handed out, Ibiki nodded and shouted begin. And so, the first exam began, the sound of pencil scratching being the only sound in the room. Naruto looked down at his test. The first thing he did was check the last question to make sure it didn't say, please ignore all other questions on this test during his reaper training, one of his mentors had given him a written test with 200 questions on it. It took him hours to write out all the answers, but when he got to the last question, it told him to ignore the 199 previous questions. His mentor had told him the test wasn't about intellect, but observation, patience, and a willingness to prepare rather than rush forward. This is something my English teacher in high school did to us at the beginning of every school year. She'd give us a bunch of questions, only for the last one to tell us to leave the previous ones blank. She fooled me with this three times. Seeing that this wasn't the case, the blonde quickly read over the other questions. His eyes widened slightly. What the? These questions were highly advanced. They required calculations and critical thinking skills beyond the abilities of most genin. In fact, he reasoned that only Sakura and Shikamaru had the intellect needed to answer these questions. Something about this whole test bothered him. Why would they give genin a test even if they would have trouble completing it? And why would they give them five strikes for cheating instead of failing them outright? Unless, of course, he thought, we're supposed to cheat. They're testing our information gathering skills. I knew you'd figure it out, Kurama told him. Naruto smirked, and I've got just the tool to do it. He placed his hand under the desk and sent out his oculus. The eye-shaped organism then turned invisible and began to float around the room. Now Naruto thought, let's find someone who knows the answers. He considered using Sakura or Shikamaru, but it felt wrong to use his friend and teammate for this. Besides, Shikamaru might be too lazy to even fill them in. So he kept searching. Eventually, he found a genin who appeared to be doing well. The oculus merged with the genin, and he began to listen to his thoughts. While doing so, Naruto quickly realized that the man wasn't a genin at all. He was a and had been planted along with several others to be a source to cheat off of. He had all the answers memorized, so all Naruto had to do was copy what he wrote down. After a few more minutes, Naruto was done. He then leaned back and closed his eyes before sending out the oculus to observe the other genin. As he did, he noticed that several others were also cheating in unique ways. Anada and Niji were using their Byakugan to peer through others and see their answers. Sasuke was using his Sharingan to copy the movements of another candidate, and thus, his writing and answers. Akamaru was placing his head on the desk, acting like he was bored, but was secretly looking at the test of the genin next to him. He made low noises that only Kiba could hear, giving his partner the answers. Shino had one of his insects fly over to a genin, look at her answers, and then fly back and inform him of the answers it saw. Ino had used her mental jutsu to take over Sakura's body, memorize her answers, and then copy them before using her jutsu on Shikamaru and Choji, allowing her to write down the answers for them. 
Fenton had used a rather interesting method. She was using nearly invisible wires to move a ceiling lamp, using its reflective surface to spy on another genin. She then moved it so that Lee could copy the answers as well. Ara, using a strange ability to control sand, had blown dust in the eyes of a genin, then formed a strange third eye out of sand to see the answers, while the genin was distracted. It was almost like an oculus, only not invisible. Ankuro had asked to go to the bathroom and was escorted by one of the observing shinobi. Naruto found that odd and had sent the oculus to follow him. It turned out, the shinobi that had escorted him was actually a puppet that the teen had placed and had copied the answers for its wielder. Naruto always found the puppets of Sunagakur fascinating. He had learned of them years ago, as a handful of past Reaper Corps members had employed them, including Monza and Shikamatsu, the inventor of the craft. He had briefly considered trying to learn how to use one, but changed his mind because it required incredible skill and coordination, and because he enjoyed more face-to-face -face confrontations. Back to Kankuro, as he returned, he subtly passed Amari a tiny scroll that had the answers on them. He became briefly worried when Ibiki had smirked at him and asked if was done playing with dolls, he had wondered if he had been discovered, but pushed this thought aside when he wasn't busted. The most interesting cheating method by far was from the bandaged Odo Genin. He had listened to the patterns and sounds of the pencil scratching from another genin and was able to decipher what was being written. Clever Naruto thought. As the minutes passed, a few teams had been disqualified for cheating. Most had denied this, but were ignored. Seeing as how he had nothing else to do, Naruto decided to use his oculus to listen to the thoughts of those who he perceived as being his team's biggest competition. He started with Gara. The redhead's thoughts were tangled and twisted. His mind was filled with images of him killing the others around him, even his siblings. Bloodlust clouded his mind. But there was another, softer presence. It was quiet, but it whispered in the Suna Genin's mind. Soon, my son, you will have all the blood you can handle the voice told him with glee. Yes. Thank you Mother Gara thought. This was odd, to say the least. Kuraheim. That voice, is that. She nodded, that's Shukaku she told him. Why is he calling Gara his son? He asked, and why is Gara calling him mother? Looking into his mind, it looks like Shukaku has been corrupted somehow she told her partner, like he's gone mad. The seal that contains him also appears to be unstable. Can it be fixed? The blonde asked. Possibly she said, but I doubt Gara will let you. Naruto considered this for a moment, we'll deal with it later he told her, for now, I'll need to warn the others to stay away from him. Hirama nodded, agreed. Next, Naruto sent his oculus to Rock Lee. Unsurprisingly, Lee's mind was filled with energetic thoughts of youth and making his sensei proud. This exam is my chance to prove that hard work beats natural talent any day. He thought, I will prove that prodigies like Niji and Sasu can be beaten by the dead last. Naruto was surprised. Lee was the dead last of his year. It certainly explained why Lee was so driven to prove himself. Aside from thoughts of Sakura which weren't indecent in the slightest Naruto heard nothing else worth noting, so he willed his oculus to leave. He then looked around, trying to find someone else worth listening to. He saw the Odo Kanoichi and decided to eavesdrop on her. Okay, I'm done she thought, now I just have to wait for the tenth question her mind drifted to Naruto, surprising him. I have to say, that blonde is so. Hot. No. Stop it kin. You aren't a useless fangirl. You're a Kinoichi of a Togaker. But still. I wouldn't mind a piece of no, stop it. She told herself. Naruto grinned internally. He was pleased that the gorgeous young woman was attracted to him. She wasn't the only foreigner who was attracted to him. He had noticed a bespectacled red-headed girl from Kusa was also eyeing him while blushing. She was beautiful in a quiet librarian sort of way. She covered up much, but he could tell that she was extremely attractive. There was also something in her eyes while she eyed him besides attraction. Shock. She seemed surprised to see him, but he was certain he would have remembered meeting a beauty like her before. Back to the matter at hand, Naruto listened further to the thoughts of the Odo Kinoichi now known as Kin. I need to focus she thought, I need to remember the mission. Intrigued by this, Naruto listened further. Only to find he could hear nothing. He focused but was unable to learn more, even after willing her to think about it. All he saw was a pair of evil, yellow eyes. But he did hear a name. Sasukecha. He tried to learn more from the other Odo Genin, but also heard nothing. This was troubling. Not only was the Odo team up to something that involved his male teammate, but their thoughts about it were being obscured by an unknown power. Before he could ponder more on this matter, Ibiki's voice interrupted him. Time's up. He shouted, pencils down. The remaining genin in the room did as they were told, and Naruto recalled his oculus. Now then the scarred man began, before we move on to the tenth question, there's something you need to know he told them, this question is entirely optional. You can choose not to take it, but doing so will disqualify you and your team. This confused the genin. Then why would we choose to not take it? Tamari asked. Ibiki gave her a sadistic grin that made her shudder. 
I'm glad you asked he told her, the reason you may wish to quit now is simple. If you take the 10th question and get it wrong. You and your team will be banned from ever taking the Chunin exams ever again. The stomachs of nearly everyone in the room dropped. The Jenin began to protest. What? That's not fair. We've known people who have failed the exams and were able to take it again. Ibiki heard that last one and grinned evilly. Well, I wasn't in charge of those exams. He told them. You can't do this. Actually, I can, he said, my test, my rules. As the genin continued to bicker, Naruto rolled his eyes. What a load of shit he thought, this guy doesn't have the authority to ban anyone from taking the exams, especially not those from other countries. He's testing us, he wants to see if we're willing to risk it all for our careers. I'll bet there isn't even a tenth question, Karama commented. The blonde reaper had already figured it out, but others hand, namely Sakura Hirano. If we get the question wrong, we fail. She thought, oh god, if I mess up, not only will I be held back forever, but so will Naruto and Sasuke-kun. So Ibiki continued, if anyone wants to drop out, now's the time. A few minutes passed, and several teams began to raise their hands, dropping out and apologizing to their teammates. Anyone else? For several tense moments, the room was silent. I can't do this. Sakura thought, panicking, I don't care what happens to me, but I won't let my teammates get held back. Slowly, she began to raise her hand. She knew Naruto and Sasuke would probably be angry, but she wasn't going to risk being the weak link again. Naruto saw his female teammate begin to raise her hand and began to panic. He knew what was going through her mind. He knew that she was backing out so as not to hold Sasuke and himself back. Reacting quickly, he sent out his oculus and had it quickly merge with Sakura. Have faith he told her. Sakura froze. What was she doing? She had worked so hard to become stronger, to prove she wasn't useless. And now she was going to throw it all away. She shook her head. She couldn't do it, not after all she had been through. She couldn't quit now. She lowered her hand, knowing that she made the right decision. No one else. Ibiki asked, keep in mind that your future depends on your answer. All was quiet. All right then. To those of you who stayed. The room was silent, tense and waiting for the question they believed would decide their fates. Congratulations. You passed the first exam. He told them. Wait, what? Many in the room were silent, frozen in shock. Others meanwhile wanted to know what the hell was going on. Wait, what about the tenth question? Kiba yelled. There isn't one, Ibiki told him, the purpose of the tenth question is to determine whether or not you punks were willing to risk everything to succeed. That is what being a ninja is about. Succeeding, no matter how high the price. He then pulled off his bandana, causing many to gasp at what was underneath it. On Ibiki's bald head were multiple scars. Scratches, slashes, burns, and even puncture holes were visible. As you can see he told them, I know a thing or two about paying that price. Naruto looked over the scars and quickly determined whoever made them was an amateur. Physical torture is useless, as the subject will eventually admit to anything to make the pain stop. Psychological torture, on the other hand, that was where the true secret to success resided. What was the point of the other questions then? Another genin asked. The test your information gathering skills Ibiki answered, putting on his bandana again, the questions on the test were designed to be impossible for a genin to solve, ensuring you would have to cheat to succeed. The trick was not getting caught. The disguised genin then stood up. These guys aren't really genin, Ibiki continued, they're all are in disguise. They had memorized all the answers, giving you someone to cheat off of. So? That's it. Sakura asked, we passed. That's what I said Ibiki told her, your next exam will start in a few minutes, as soon as the proctor. He was interrupted when something smashed through the windows. It appeared to be a black ball, which unfolded and was pinned to the ceiling, revealing it to be a banner, which read the sexy and single Anko Mitarashi. The woman emerged from the banner as well. She had light brown pupil-less eyes and purple hair which was done in a short spiky fan ponytail. She was wearing a tan overcoat with a purple inseam, which has a pocket on both sides, and complete with a fitted mesh bodysuit that stretches from her neck down to her thighs and a dark orange miniskirt. She appeared to wear little to nothing underneath her outfit. She had a small pendant that looked like a snake fang on a thick cord rather than a chain, probably to prevent it from being easily torn off in combat, a wristwatch, and pale gray shin guards. She also wore a dark blue belt around her waist that connects to her skirt that has an appendage-like sash. Most of the male genin in the room, including Naruto, were stunned by the beauty and sensuality of the woman in front of them. The female genin found themselves jealous. All right you little bastards, listen up. The woman commanded, I'm Anko Mitarashi, and I'll be your proctor for the second exam. You're early again, Anko, Ibiki told her, palming his face. Anko gave him a cheeky grin, that's what she said. Ibiki groaned. He'd walked right into that one. Naruto found himself beginning to like this woman. Anko then turned back to the assembled genin and counted them out in her head. 78 genin. She said, shocked, you passed 26 teams. 
you must be getting soft, Ibiki. Or maybe this batch is a cut above the rest he told her. Banko scoffed, we'll see she told him, by the time I'm done with them, that number will be cut by half. This caused most of the genin to become nervous. Now all of you follow me. She ordered, before leaping out the window. Many had to wonder what they were getting themselves into. Thanks for listening. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want the next part of this video. Turn on that bell notification. Like subscribe and comment down below. And also check out the others videos. I have created and enjoyed it. See you guys next video. Till that take care.